Okay.
Good afternoon. Uh, I am Doug Shipman, uh, City Council President. I'm calling to order this regularly scheduled meeting, the Atlanta City Council, Monday, October 3rd. Uh, at this time, uh, I'd like to welcome everyone and ask the Deputy Clerk to please call the roll. Good afternoon, Council President Shipman, Michael Julian Bond, Council Member Westmore. Here. Council Member Keisha Sean Waits. Council Member Winston? Here. Council Member Amir Faroki? Here. Council Member Byron Amos? Here. Council Member Jason Dozier? Present. Council Member Liliana Bakhtiari? Council Member Alex Wan? Council Member Howard Shook? Council Member Mary Norwood? Council Member Dustin Hillis? Council Member Andrea Boone? Council Member Marcy Collier Overstreet. Present. Council Member Antonio Lewis. Quorum present. Thank you. I just want to note for my colleagues that Council Member Faroki is participating with us um, virtually, so you will hear his voice. Um, I would ask uh, for the adoption of the agenda. I would like to note that there is one additional proclamation um, from Council Member Bakhtiari uh, that came in but did not make the printing of the agenda. Uh, so I would entertain a motion to adopt the agenda with that change. Move, move by Council Member Overstreet, seconded by Council Member Lewis. Any discussion on the adoption of the agenda? Hearing none, we can do this via unanimous consent. Madam Deputy Clerk, would you please sound the count on unanimous consent without objection? Is there any objection? Please sound the count. 
Unanimous consent is eight yeas, zero nays. Was eight yeas, zero um, nays the uh, um, a move to adopt the agenda carries. Uh, next is the portion which typically we have an invocation. Today we uh, are simply um, taking a moment of silence. Uh, but before we do, uh, I would like to ask if there are any reflections or remembrances um, today uh, from my colleagues. I would add uh, one um, Atlanta Police Department, uh, Lieutenant Zachary uh, Krauss, who uh, passed um, recently and whose memorial, I'm sorry, Zachary Kramer, who passed and whose memorial um, happened recently. I'd like to keep his family in our thoughts. Uh, any others? I would ask uh, everyone pl to please join me in a moment of silence. Thank you. Uh, if you please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you. Uh, next up, we'll move to our uh, proclamations and such. Um, actually, uh, looking around, I would ask uh, Council Member Winston uh, to come up first in recognition of the Department of Watershed Management's 20th anniversary. Any of those who are joining us for uh, this uh, commendation for the Department of Watershed Management, please come forward as well. Get everybody in here. Thank you. Thank you. We appreciate it. Hi, everyone. Councilmember Jason Winston, and I'm excited today to commemorate the 20th anniversary of the Department of Watershed Management. I'm happy to have Commissioner Makita Browning here with her wonderful team from the Department of Watershed Management. Um, it has been said that water is life. And so we are happy that the Department of Watershed Management helps the city of Atlanta uh, with, the, with the, the basic need of water and protecting our city every, each and every day. So I'm, I'm excited to, to, to be here and award the wonderful women and men of the Department of Watershed Management for their great work on behalf of the city of Atlanta every day. Um, city of Atlanta has over 8,000 employees, but you know it is the lifeblood and the, and the people who work each and every day that are out in our city um, making sure that our city has the basic services it needs to keep the pe people of Atlanta um, with the basic needs that they need. So I'm, I'm excited today to give this proclamation. Um, first, I want to see if any of my colleagues have anything they'd like to say, and I'll, I'll give them that opportunity. Yes, I would just, I am Andrea Boone, a member of the Atlanta City Council. I am so very happy to honor this spectacular group of city employees. You all have done a magnificent job, a magnificent job. Great, great, great. Thank you. 
Councilmember Lewis. In 20 years, 20 years, when I just seen Mr. Pridgen, he told me he was here when they started. And uh, to, to, to know that 20 years ago, we, Atlanta saw fit to uh, put together this department and to see the growth. Uh, these are the folks that are really taking care of us. They, during the pandemic, to see the uh, flexibility from the, from Ms. Browning, a person we've <laughs> had to fight and have a lot of conversation with, but who's been flexible. Uh, but the person I want to talk about most is Ms. Verna, who anytime I have an issue with Watershed, we're able to just make one phone call and they're able to take care of people. It just shows how the department is just willing to do things for us. And so I want to say thank you to the Department of Watershed for 20 strong years of a service to the city of Atlanta. I want to see y'all keep going, get stronger. I want to see you grow. I want to see you grow to depths you've never been. I want to see your, your, your numbers grow from, if you're at 100, go to 200. That's what I want to see. Thank you. Any other colleagues? Former council member, Mr. Pridgen. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Thank you, councilman, and to uh, the city council and to the members of this team. My name is Greg Pridgen. I served as the chief of staff to Mayor Franklin. So on behalf of the Franklin administration, who set the seeds into the ground or turned the taps on as it may be, we want to thank this uh, city council and the city government and this department for continuing to move forward with this wonderful department of watershed management. Uh, again, I had the pleasure of serving uh, as Mayor Franklin's chief of staff, and I'm sure that she is going to be watching and, and, and like a mama with a baby, uh, happy that this baby has grown up to be a mature adult. Thank you all so much. Mm -hmm. Mr. Brown. Hey, good afternoon. Uh, it is an exciting time as we commemorate and celebrate the Department of Watershed Management's 20th anniversary. On behalf of the over 1,400 DWM employees, I thank Councilmember Winston. Uh, for presenting Team Watershed with his proclamation. I thank council members for honoring the department in such an ideal way. I would be remiss if I did not mention acknowledge former Atlanta Mayor Shirley Franklin and her vision to transform and transition the once privatized water system to the city of Atlanta and for creating a Department of Watershed Management in September 16, 2002. We tirelessly strive to succeed the expectations put forth with our enhanced service delivery, operational efficiency, investments in infrastructure, and the numerous awards for excellence and compliance our water and wastewater treatment facilities have received. Additionally, as commissioner, my heart is full of pride and gratitude for the past and present staff that have worked so hard the past 20 years to ensure that we continuously deliver best in class water quality provide excellent customer service and uphold our fiscal responsibility. Again, Council Member Winston and Council Members, I thank you for this honor and I look forward to many more anniversaries, accomplishments, and honors for the department. Thank you. Council Member Bakhtiari. So um, thank you again, Council Member, for reading this in. Um, the watershed department, under the guidance of Commissioner Makita Browning, has been extraordinary. So I don't think the commissioner sleeps. Doesn't matter if I send her a text, an email, at whether it's 9 in the morning or 2 a.m., she responds in a matter of minutes. Um, by that fact, I don't think her or her team are actually human. So I just wanted to say I can't thank you all enough because I know how many emails we send you and I find that your jobs are far harder than ours because you have an entire city to manage when it comes to our watershed. Um, and I know there's no shortage of projects that you have to work on. So not only do we appreciate you uh, for all of this and I look forward to many more opportunities to celebrate the hardworking Department of Watershed, but I also hope that we find in time other ways to show you our appreciation. So deeply grateful for all that you do. Um, We'd be lost without you, so thank you. I, mu I would be remiss if I did not um, acknowledge the very hard work that you all have done with our float initiative. If you have not looked at what this department has done for the least, the lost, the vulnerable, and our seniors, please take a look at what this department has done. 
thank you all so much and a special thank you to Miss Dorothy Henry, who really, really has the patience to deal with our golden citizens, our seniors. Again, thank you, Commissioner Browning. And I'll just add that onto what Councilmember Bakhtiari said. You know, I, I appreciate each and every one of your responsiveness. Your by the council and whereas the departments work by the council and whereas the department's workforce has evolved into a staff of more than 1,400 that serve 1 1.2 million residents and visitors daily and is responsible for the operation maintenance and capital improvement of over 5 billion in assets and whereas the hemp hill and chattahoochee works treatment plants have had zero violations and remain 100% compliant with the Georgia Environmental Protection Division for a consecutive two-year period. And whereas the city of Atlanta is investing approximately $1 billion in maintaining operational efficiency, reliability, improving water quality, reducing sewer overflows, enhancing public health, and ensuring continued regulatory compliance, and whereas as part of the Clean Water Atlanta program, the city has inspected more than 1,500 miles of sewer pipe, rehabilitated 406 miles of pipe, and achieved capacity relief in 48% of total area, and whereas watershed management has separated 33 miles of combined sewer, decreased combined volume of sewer overflows by 97%, added sewer capacities to support additional development and diverted 1.2 billion gallons of stormwater. And whereas under the guidance of its commissioner and hardworking, devoted employees, the department is recognized as a leading utility of the world in innovation, service, and value. Now, therefore, be it be proclaimed that we, the members of the Atlanta City Council, on behalf of the citizens of Atlanta, do hereby celebrate the 19th day of September 2022 in recognition of the City of Atlanta Department of Watershed Management's 20th anniversary. We honor their outstanding past and look forward to the success of the future. Thank you so much. We'll all come up to take a photo.
Uh, next, I'd like to uh, uh, ask Councilmember Bakhtiari to come forward uh, and all of those associated with the proclamation for National Midwifery Week to come forward as well. So, hey everybody. Um, real quick before I get into uh, celebrating National Midwifery Week, I just wanted real quickly because I was not in here during the moment of silence, I just wanted to take a moment. I, for those who knew Marshall Rancifer, he passed a couple weeks ago and was extraordinary in our community when it came to helping people who are facing addiction or homelessness and mental health. So I wanted us to take a moment to celebrate him and also Eunice Andrews, who passed away earlier this week, who was probably the most involved senior in my entire district. But I just would be remiss if I didn't take a second to say their names for the record. So um, that being said, I wanted to do this proclamation recognition of National Midwifery Week. Um, for those who don't know, we have an incredible uh, midwife community here in the state of Georgia. And given the fact that we have hospitals, as we've seen, shutting down in both city and rural areas alike, and more and more people um, being left without anywhere to safely uh, birth their children, especially in a state with the second highest maternal mortality rate in the country. It is incredibly important to me and to the community that we took the time to have this proclamation um, and to read it today. And we're very lucky to have Ms. Caprice Welch here accepting it. And so I want to take a minute to read this proclamation. Um, in recognition of National Midwifery Week, the Atlanta City Council is pleased to celebrate the week from October 3rd to 9th as part of the national recognition established by the American College of Nurse Midwives and the American College of Nurse Midwives is the official organization for nearly 13,000 certified nurse midwives throughout the U.S. And more than 550 midwives in Georgia working in diverse clinical and community settings are vital and a growing part of the advancement of reproductive health services provided across the lifespan in our state. And midwifery care improves racial and ethnic health disparities and pregnancy outcomes, decreases rates of preterm birth, and lowers neonatal deaths. Midwifery, midwifery care helps to support more successful breastfeeding and higher patient satisfaction, as well as to avoid cesarean birth. And you're going to have to say this word for me. Episiotomy. I'm not smart enough for this. <laughs> Episiotomy. Um, and the week recognizes the important role of midwives, whether assisting a pregnant person as they give birth or providing personalized reproductive health care. This national event is an opportunity for people nationwide to recognize and celebrate midwives and the health care services they provide. Um, before I read what, we, uh, what the city council proclaims, I wanted to give uh, Ms. Welch an opportunity to speak about the importance of this week. Uh, thank you, Councilwoman. I'm just really excited. Um, as she mentioned, that our state uh, is number two for maternal morbidity and mortality, uh, especially for black women, and midwives play an integral role in really creating safe birthing spaces for women to birth in this city. And so we're really honored uh, to be recognized uh, during this week for our incredible work across this state. Do you want to say anything? I'm good. Um, and also, I wanted to talk about how important this is, especially when we see closures like the Atlanta Medical Center, the number of women that are being displaced from that closure who for that were seeking a space for safe pregnancies. It is so important that we celebrate midwives and, and note their importance this week. So without further ado, uh, now therefore be proclaimed that we, the members of the Atlanta City Council on behalf of the citizens of Atlanta, do hereby recognize the week of October 3rd to the 9th. 2022 as National Midwifery Week in Atlanta and celebrate all the midwives in our city and across the country for being dedicated and essential providers and helping to achieve happy and healthy births.
Uh, next, I would invite Councilmember Bond, uh, as well as all of those who are with Frontline to be honored uh, with proclamation. Come on up. I want to say good afternoon to everyone, and thank you, Mr. President. As they make their way forward, it brings me great pleasure today to oh, come on all the way around, all the way around. It gives me great pleasure today to present a proclamation to an organization that has done so much for so many and in such a short, relatively short period of time. Frontline response has been there for those in our community who are the most vulnerable, uh, who are the most needy, most desperate, and they have, they have presented themselves as a bomb in our community to help young people fi find their way. And their ministerial works not only uh, include their direct ministry, but they've also helped us with HelloFresh. We've been out there uh, a, a couple of times to distribute uh, food boxes to those who are in need. They've been there on behalf of the greater Atlanta community. I believe it's 3,200 children have been rescued by frontline response in their time of need. Now that deserves some applause. And so we're gathered here today to honor them for their good works and to present this proclamation on behalf of their esteemed organization. That, oh, my stall worked. <laughs> I will read the proclamation in pertinent part in honor of frontline response, whereas the City of Atlanta Council is pleased to recognize frontline response. Formerly, the Atlanta Dream Center joined uh, together with Out of Darkness to continuously serve the Atlanta metropolitan community for 19 years, addressing the evils of sex trafficking, providing resources and services for the unsheltered, and serving our most vulnerable population, our youth, through youth uh, prevention programming. And whereas Frontline Response believes that everyone should have a life free and unencumbered by trauma reached a milestone of over 3,200 rescues of individuals out of sex trafficking and homelessness in April of 2022, has rescued over 299 individuals just in 22 alone. And whereas Frontline Response expanded into its 1,800 square feet facility uh, this year to serve more citizens, clients, and to become stronger community partners through its response to the call. And whereas Frontline Response exemplifies working in partnership with stakeholders and volunteers to, in successfully joining forces with the City of Atlanta Police Department, Solicitor's Office, and Airport Officials, Fulton County Sheriff's Office, the Cap County Police Department, the GBI, the FBI, and the Governor's Office partners from home and the Jensen Project. Now, therefore, we, the members of the Atlanta City Council, on behalf of the citizens of the city of Atlanta, do hereby proclaim this day in honor of frontline response in the city of Atlanta. I have set my hand and have called the seal of the city of Atlanta to be here into a fixed. Congratulations.
before you speak, are there any council members that would like to say a word? All right, hearing none, come on forward. Well, we just want to first thank you, uh, Councilman Bond, for your service and your time with us and City Council for having us here today. Um, we believe that time is the most valuable thing that you can give away. Uh, you can lose money, but you can find some more. But when you lose your time, you cannot. And each individual that's homeless or those that are caught in sex trafficking deserve a little bit more time because they're valuable. And because of the City Council today and the recognition of frontline response and organizations like ours, we want to say thank you for remembering those that most try to hide away, push away, you're caring today. And you're giving us time representing them as well. And I know you have other organizations, Partners for Home, and so many other organizations are doing it as well. I want to say thank you for your time. The city of Atlanta is an aggressive city. It's working for those who are hurting, who are broken, and need just a little bit of help. And when we say rescue, we don't come in as a hero. We're there when they're ready to make the choice to come out, and we provide the resources to make sure they do get caught up, are able to come out. The average girl, that gets caught in sex trafficking is 13 years old. And we need to make sure that stops by doing prevention work in our high risk areas. The average boy in high risk areas moving dope is 11 years old. We're trying to fight crime, but what we need to do is help individuals. And we can do that by being there in the front lines and being able to respond. And because of the city council and because of the frontline staff and the team that we have here, we are so honored to be a part of this. Thank you so much for all you guys do. Frontline response team, thank you. And Councilman Bond, you're amazing. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Uh, I have the opportunity to serve as the development director for Frontline Response, one of the members of this team. And Councilman Baum, we want to thank you for your continued partnership, your continued support of our organization, and thank you for everything that your team continues to do in the community as well. We appreciate it. I, a round of applause, please. We have, as an organization, worked for the last 19 years with several different departments within the city of Atlanta, from the mayor's office to constituent services, to, as mentioned, the Atlanta Police Department as well. I know that we have some of our partners here today, not just from Partners for Home and other spaces and places, but I wanted to recognize Holla with the Atlanta City uh, Solicitor's Office, one of our partners. I also wanted to recognize Ms. Corliss Davenport out at the Atlanta airport with the Not In My County Human Trafficking Initiative that has helped us, not just from a resource standpoint, but logistically, all the work that we're doing. And so I want to recognize Corliss Davenport and all the people that are on that task force as well. And you know, as I come to a close, as we look forward as an organization, uh, we have our largest fundraiser on November the 3rd. And one of the keynote addresses will come from Mr. Tim Tebow himself. Now, I know we you know, go dogs, right? <laughs> but Mr. Tebow and his team have taken a global approach to anti-trafficking. And it's our pleasure to bring him and his team to the city of Atlanta to launch our Respond to the Call campaign on November 3rd. And all the elected officials here and along with the community are invited as well. And so we are forever grateful. Our team is present here today is forever grateful for the partners and the support and the heroes like all of you that help us do what we do every single day. And so again, we uh, appreciate this proclamation and Councilman Bond and the rest of the city council members. Thank you all so much. All right, well, thank you. And we'll step forward and take our photo. Okay. Because if we don't have a picture, it never happens, right?
and just an announcement for the public. There, there was a reception over in committee room two. Now, it appears to be from Waffle House, but I actually got up this morning and made all that food. So if you're here in the uh, audience or within the sound of my voice, please uh, avail yourself of what we have uh, in committee room two. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, I'd like to ask Council Member Waits to come forward and all of those associated with honoring Duncan Teague to come forward. Is it on? Is it turned on? So it is a pleasure to recognize my friend and colleague, Reverend Duncan Teague. So today we stand, well, before accepting his calling into ministry, Reverend Duncan Teague had established a career in HIV AIDS education, advocacy, research, and coordination. Reverend Teague is employed by Emory University's Rollins School of Public Health assisting with research to inform faith-based global HIV and AIDS anti-stigma work. Thank you. Reverend Duncan T. dreamed and planted the Abundant Love Unitarian Universalist congregation in the West End community of Atlanta in 2018. He has served on the UU Ministers Association Committee on anti-racism, anti-oppression, and multi multiculturalism. He collaborated jointly with Georgia Equality as a faith outreach consultant with the National Freedom to Marry organization in 2015 during Georgia's legislative session. He is a chaplain for the Southeast Summer Institute from 2016 and is a chaplain preacher from 2017. I don't know this particular organization here. Um, it's called SUSI. It's the Southeast UU Summer Institute. Awesome. Terrific. He is also a guest preacher at various congregations and faith traditions throughout the country. Reverend Teague resides in Decatur, Georgia with his husband, David Thurman, a retired researcher, celebrating 28 years together. 29 years together. <laughs> We'll correct that. Now there it be resolved that we, the members of the Atlanta City Council, on behalf of the citizens of Atlanta, hereby recognize Reverend Duncan Teague for his many years of advocacy and leadership here in the city of Atlanta. We salute you and we thank you for your service. I believe Craig Washington will give a few remarks. Well, actually, Mr. President, I think you're going to give remarks as well. Please. Thank you. It is a pleasure to have my friend, Reverend Duncan Teague, standing next to me. Uh, over 15 years ago, uh -oh. when we first began to build the Center for Civil and Human Rights, then activist Duncan Teague called and said, can I come and see you? And immediately his combination, which is so unique, of a deep, fiery passion and a deep empathy was apparent. And throughout the years of building the center and beyond, he has been uh, a voice of wisdom, a voice of care, a person who always was there to offer advice and clarity and honesty, not only for me, but for so many people throughout Atlanta who go from leaders to activists to people who are simply in need. He is simply one of the best that we have in our community. I cannot think of someone who deserves this honor more. Thank you, Reverend Teague, for always being yourself. Mm. 
first of all, I'd like to thank the Atlanta City Council and, of course, Council Member Sean Waits uh, for this bestowing this honor on my colleague and friend, Reverend Duncan Eric Teague. In his poem, For My Protection, Essex Hempel starts, I want to start an organization to save my life. Because then, in his time, as he put it, black men are dying, black men like me are dying every day. We're dying from viruses, bullets, and loneliness. There is a tradition of black queer men who live boldly, fiercely, in opposition to the status quo of homophobia and racism. Duncan Teague is in that lineage. He's proven over the decades that I've known him. Uh, when I first moved to Atlanta, I was told that I started work, working in H, HIV AIDS prevention. And I was told that there was a short list of folks, I'm from New York, that I had to talk to if I was going to be prepared. Duncan was on that list. Duncan was part of the earliest generation of AIDS activists and educators. Uh, he also has served in, with HIV research and prevention work and advocacy. Uh, and in addition to that, he served as a founding member of Adobe Muse, which is a black gay men's writing and performance collective, the self-titled Gay Negro Ensemble. Duncan has been a fierce warrior uh, in this work, in this battle, and he's an inspiration to me as well. Uh, he's also a close personal friend. Um, and so when, I, when he shared with me that he was actually going to pursue his divinity degree and become a minister, I wasn't, pr I wasn't surprised because he's always been ministering. That's what you do. That's what you do. Remember? <laughs> so I think this today I'm, I'm, I'm proud. Um, as someone who's lived with HIV for over 30 years, I feel like I get a T-cell infusion <laughs> in these moments. Uh, I'm very inspired, have always been, as long as I've known you, Duncan. And I'm glad to see that you're getting your flowers while you're here. I love you. Good afternoon. I'm the Reverend Misha Sanders. I serve the Unitarian Universalist Congregation in Sandy Springs, Georgia, and I'm so proud and excited to be here to celebrate my colleague and my friend and my brother, Duncan Teague, Reverend Duncan Teague. Love and courage. If you've ever had a correspondence with Reverend Teague, that is his tagline. That's how he ends his, his conversations, love and courage. And no one, no one that I know of embodies love and courage even close to the way that Reverend Duncan Teague does. If you are a part of the, the queer BIPOC community in Atlanta, you should know if you don't already, and you probably do already, you probably already know that Duncan Teague is not only one of you, he sees you, he loves you, he doesn't tolerate you, he celebrates you. He shows up, and when he shows up, he shows out. And we are just lucky, um, so, so lucky, to be colleagues of his. Reverend, Reverend Rogers and I are here to celebrate that. Um, my friend, you are so deserving of this honor, and you cover us with love and courage every day, and you should know you are covered in prayer every day of your life, even more often than you're covered in glitter, my friend. You're covered in prayer. <laughs> I love you, and I'm proud of you. Uh, Y'all, I'm not dying. Uh, they usually save all this for when you're about to go. Um, my deep respect and honor to President Schiffman, to Councilwoman Waits, to the City Council, to the honored guest here. I am so humbled to be getting this on the day when you honor that we get clean water that we're not worried about. That children children being sex trafficked are being saved by somebody who takes out the time and energy to do it. And y'all decided to honor Reverend Russell Teague and Alice Jean Teague's son. 
because they said they wanted their kids to do something important, and I've tried. I have tried. I have a challenge to the city council. Oh, and I need to thank um, the, some other folks who are standing behind me. My niece almost caused a medical accident. She didn't tell me that she was coming from Grand Prairie, Texas, to be a part of this. And so I got here in the auditorium, and my niece, Nurse Tasia Teague from Grand Prairie, Texas, surprised me in the auditorium. And, um, and all the way from Kenya by way of Buffalo, New York, working on her dissertation is Reverend, um, soon to be Reverend Dr. Jerry Hughes came with me this morning. Um, my challenge to the city council is to remember that you do have responsibilities for the jewel of the South, Atlanta. It's, it's, it's all that we got in the South. I mean, if you don't come to Atlanta, you done missed it. And every day, there is some kid getting off a bus or a plane or a car who thinks that if they come to Atlanta with $60, they're going to make it, and I'm proof that you can. I ask that you remember in your stalwart work and all the good that y'all do that there are kids getting off that bus today, and they're trusting that y'all will take care of what it takes to make this city safe and wonderful for those kids, because I was one of them. And I'm so humbled and grateful, and thank you. Thank you so much. Our final uh, proclamation today, I would uh, ask Councilmember Boone to come forward and all those associated with the recognition of the International Credit Union Day to come forward. In recognition of International Credit Union Day. Good afternoon. I am Andrea Boone, a member of the Atlanta City Council. At this time, I would like to introduce the members of the Credit Union of Atlanta. I will start with Mr. Alfred Berry, who is a longtime member of the City of Atlanta family, serving over 30 years in this very body. Thank you. I want to thank Ms. Boone, and good afternoon to the Atlanta City Council and the city of Atlanta. Uh, today we're celebrating International Credit Union Day. And uh, it would, uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention uh, Council Member C.T. Martin, who was the chairman of that board. And I'm looking out and I see Miss Harriet 
Thomas, her husband Bernard Thomas was also chairman of that board. So we just uh, want to thank them for their service. And today with me, we have our president and CEO, Mr. Alan Upchurch, and our VP of operations, Ms. Deborah Collins. So thank you all once again for allowing us to be here today. Any members of the Atlanta City Council? Mr. Michael Bond? I just want to go on the record again and say that the Atlanta City Employees Credit Union is one of the best organizations, not just for city employees, uh, but for the greater surrounding community in providing loans and help to families, to helping them bridge the gap uh, when it is most needed. And so as someone who's had an account at the credit union since August of 1989, I just want to say thank you. Thank we you. appreciate you. you. We love you. And please keep doing what you're doing. Thank, Thank you, you, sir. Well, I thought I smelled some money. <laughs> <laughs> the Honorable Antonio Lewis, District 12. And, and I just want to say thank you to the Atlanta uh, Credit Union because it sits in District 12. It sits on Metropolitan Parkway uh, when we think about it. So thank you for your service. Thank you for bringing the bank to my district. Uh, you're one of two banks in my district, so uh, thank you for being here. Please come forward, President and members. In recognition of International Credit Union Day, whereas the Atlanta City Council is pleased to recognize the credit union community for its going above and beyond the call of duty in um, progression of the financial welfare of its members and for the impacts credit unions make in the community. And whereas credit unions operate as not-for-profit financial enterprises owned, operated, and founded by people working collectively toward economic advancement. And whereas while embracing a vision of people helping people, philosophy, credit unions combine personal resources and leadership skills to encourage members to enhance their financial futures and unite to service those in need. And whereas credit unions have fostered strong alliances that make financial democracy possible in many countries throughout the world. And whereas credit unions have demonstrated outstanding leadership throughout the communities they have served since being founded more than 150 years ago. Now, therefore, be it proclaimed that we, the members of the Atlanta City Council, on behalf of the citizens of Atlanta, do hereby honor the work of credit unions on this 20th, on this second day of October 2022, as they celebrate International Credit Union Day. We are grateful for all the ways credit unions help people plan and achieve a strong financial future. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for that. that. That warmed my heart. Thank you for all of you that have spoken and talked about the credit union and the credit union movement. International Credit Union Day, we're so excited about the credit union movement. And I just wanted to share a few words with you about the credit union as a whole and how International Credit Union Day came into place. First of all, we are so honored to receive this proclamation and celebration of International Credit Union Day, affectionately known as ICU Day. ICU Day was founded by the Credit Union National Association and World Council of Credit Unions in 1948. And on October 20th, will celebrate its 74th year. Each year offers a theme, and this year's theme is Empower Your Financial Future with a credit union. ICU exists to raise awareness and celebrate what makes credit unions unique. So how are we unique? Credit unions are not for profit and owned by their members, typically offer lower fees, higher savings rates, and competitive loan rates. Anyone can join a credit union as long as you are in their field of membership. Now, City of Atlanta employees and all agencies, authorities, organizations that are affiliated with the City of Atlanta 
are in the field of membership for Credit Union of Atlanta. Just want to make sure you knew that. The Credit Union philosophy is people helping people and financial well-being for all. And most importantly, credit unions offer a more personalized approach to customer service for our members. ICU Day is supported by American Credit Unions and World Council of Credit Unions. There are currently 86,000 credit unions in 118 countries in the world, 4,903 in the USA, with 131 million members, 171 in the state of Georgia, and 22 in the city of Atlanta, providing financial services from 48 branch locations, which of course includes the Credit Union of Atlanta. The Credit Union Board of Directors and staff truly embrace the credit union philosophy people helping people, and financial well-being for all. The Credit Union of Atlanta, formerly known as the City of Atlanta's Employees Credit Union, was founded in 1928, has over 86 million in assets, 14,000 plus members, and is a member of the shared branching network, allowing members access to 4,600 credit unions and 30,000 surcharge-free ATMs nationwide. And on August the 31st of this year, with the help of Mr. Alfred Berry, we were able to install a brand new ATM that's located in the City Hall Tower next to the ethics office, next to the vending machine. I hope I, you can find it. So make sure you get out there and use it. Our vision is to be the financial services provider of choice in our diverse communities, one member at a time. And our mission is to provide financial solutions to meet the needs and improve the quality of life for our members. In celebration of ICU Day, the Credit Union of Atlanta Board of Directors and staff would like to cordially invite you to be a part of our ICU Day celebration and festivities. On this October the 20th, which is ICU Day, we will be hosting a Member Appreciation Day in conjunction with an auto expo. There will be music, grilled hot dogs, drinks and fixings. We'll have raffles and giveaways. We have enterprise car sale solutions there. Auto rates as low as 2.93%. And to really show our appreciation, all loan and membership application fees for that day will be waived. So if you have an account with us and you want to get a loan that day, the loan application fee is waived. If you don't have an account with us and you want to open an account, we'll, only, we'll waive the membership application fee as well as the loan application fee if you decide to apply for a loan. So please mark your calendars, October 20th, 2022, and stop by to visit us at Credit Union of Atlanta in celebration of ICU Day, and allow us to show your appreciation, so show our appreciation for you giving us the opportunity to empower your financial future. Thank you very much. Not much that I can add to that. <laughs> Just want to thank uh, the council. Thank you all, uh, President Shipman. Uh, thank you, Congresswoman Boone. Thank you, Congress, Congress Member Lewis, uh, Council Member Lewis. Uh, and just to let you know that we appreciate the opportunity to be of service, not only to the city of Atlanta, but the community at large. Uh, I'm Alan Upchurch. I'm president and CEO of the Credit Union. Next year, we will celebrate 95 years being in business. We were chartered in 1928, and we're proud of the heritage that we have uh, enjoyed as you've allowed us to serve this community for so many years. I always like to say to people, we've survived the Great Depression, we survived the Great Recession, and now we're surviving COVID and what it looks like headed into uh, another recession era with higher inflation. So uh, we appreciate the opportunity you give us to be of service to the community and invite you to come by anytime at the corner of Metropolitan and Ralph David Abernathy. And we'd love to talk with you and talk to you about anything that you have in the way of needs and help you out any way we can. Thank you very much. Once again, I just want to thank you all so very much for inviting us here. Ms. Boone, um, Council Member Boone, we go back when she wasn't a council member. Uh, she was a 
Martin's office, Mr. Bond, Councilmember Bond, Councilmember Winston, Councilmember uh, is it Lewis. Those gentlemen sit with me now on the uh, investment board and city's uh, pension. So we thank you. And Ms. Overstreet, we miss you. You were, the, you were there last year. And uh, we just want to say thank you also very much once again. And also, too, for those of you that heard, Ms. Collins said that we are, ATM machine is back in City Hall. It is. And uh, it'll save you $3 if you use your, your uh, City of Atlanta uh, account. Right now with the, uh, I believe it's uh, Wells Fargo machine, it costs you money. So we're trying to save you some money. So please use Credit Union of Atlanta's ATM. Thank you so very much. Congratulations. Now it's photo time. All right. All right on up. All right on up. Thank you all so much. We will now move to public comment. Um, just as a reminder and as a clarification, um, per code, elected officials are offered uh, 10 minutes to speak. Um, I have been advised by law that that is only current elected officials, not former elected officials. Um, so uh, everyone will have two minutes to speak except current elected officials who are offered up to 10 minutes to speak. Uh, I know that we have at least two elected officials and I'd like to offer them the opportunity to speak up front given their service to our community. Um, Sheriff uh, Pat Labatt uh, and uh, Commissioner Rob Pitts from Fulton County, Commission Chair. Um, you each have up to 10 minutes to address council. Thank you for being here. Thank you very much, Mr. Is this on? Can you hear me okay? Yes? All right, thank you so much, Mr. President and members of council. I'm Rob Pitts. I chair the Board of Commissioners of Fulton County. I feel like I'm back home here. I spent many, many years in this chamber. But I was authorized by the Board of Commissioners to con convey to you the seriousness of the situation at our jail. It's an emergency situation. I've had a chance to speak with almost all of you about that situation. And to put it in context, I'm joined by the sheriff today who will go into more detail. But we have an emergency at our jail. Uh, most of the folk in our jail are residents of the city of Atlanta. We've had any number of deaths since an agreement was, was approved. So I just want to, 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 to say to you that I'm pleading with you today to give us some relief. And I'll yield to the sheriff at this time. First of all, thank you and good afternoon and thank you, Mr. Chair. I know he has some important hospital business to tend to, so thank you for your leadership. Uh, my name is Patrick Labatt. For those that I have not met, let me uh, introduce myself and those that are new to the council. Uh, congratulations, but let me start here. I'm a native Atlantan from Frederick Douglass High School to Clark Atlanta University. I retired, a retired city employee 31 years with the city of Atlanta's Department of Corrections, the last 10 years 
as its chief. And why do I mention that? Because we were able to do things as a department uh, that no one ever sought to do. We created groundbreaking reentry programs that allowed individuals really to become city employees to this day are still employed instead of doing time. In 2020, I was elected the 28th sheriff of Fulton County. Much like you, drinking from a fire hose coming into the sheriff's office, 640 days ago, I was sworn in and I inherited a mess of a jail. Better known to many of you as 901 Rice Street. And so if you have inherited, whether you uh, ran and won, or whether the seat was vacated and, and, and the mayor won, whatever that looks like, you've taken, you've taken on an oath to do your job, much like I have. And every day, heroes and sheroes go to the Fulton County Jail and serve our community like no other prior to 641 days. As of 6.46 a.m. this morning, we had 3,538 individuals incarcerated, 473 of them sleeping on the floor. Most, if not all of you, have taken an opportunity to come visit. And so I would sit there and say, you've seen the crisis firsthand. You've stepped over bodies like my team does every day. And for those that are young enough or hadn't been on the council long enough, it is an, a situation that we saw to deal with years ago from the old jail, 236 Peachtree Street, where I saved Councilman Bond's life several times, to where we are today with individuals. This is not about mass incarceration. These individuals are incarcerated already. So let me, let me proceed. This crisis, you all have an opportunity or have an opportunity in the future to deal with. A crisis that you have seen firsthand. But let me continue to give you some facts because I don't believe in just conjecture. Each of us, when we're campaigning, ask people to go vote. And don't delay and do it. So why would we delay anything when it comes to people's lives. And so, yeah, it will be said that uh, a study here and there should be done, but I am telling you we can do it simultaneously. I have said from day one, I'm pro-pad, I'm anti-nonsense. I am moving in a space where people's lives are in danger. Since you met last, we had someone openly murdered in our facility. Come by, I'll show you the videotape if you want to see it. Because sometimes you need to see in order to believe. So the question still is, can you sit there in good conscience and do nothing? Because see, what I've been told is that we're not going to even get information back until November 18th. That means we can move bodies. And please understand this. Because I'm sure people will come up and tell you in, in their own way and have their own beliefs. But I will tell you, everybody's entitled to their own opinions. But nobody is entitled to their own set of facts. And the facts are, we have people sleeping on the floor. The facts are, we can do this simultaneously. The facts are, I was excluded from a board to then set up another board, to set up another board, to then study the data. So what we did, because of my history of transparency, is we delivered to you, Mr. President, and thank you for taking your time while you were traveling, all the information in the spirit of the legislation, which was then sent to you. But then I was told that wasn't enough, right? So again, we then went back got the information which is now in your office, Mr. President, I will advise you, right, and maybe the law department can advise better, is that it is sensitive information and individuals' lives are in your hands. But it has every single bond amount of every individual, whether they have a bond 
or no bond. But while I'm here, let me answer the next question that was in the legislation. How do people make bond? How do people get out of jail? A judge sets a bond, an individual makes a bond, or their case is adjudicated, they're released, or they're sent to state prison. Now, to that end, let me tell you, somebody's going to come up here and tell you, oh, there are people in Fulton County Jail that have a $1 bond. And I don't know what y'all did between the Braves game, the Falcons game, and UGA, but let me tell you what I did. I studied that information I gave you, Mr. President. There is one person that has two charges with $1 each, $1 each, and has a third charge that says he's waiting on accountability court to find bed space. Now, that's it. There are four or five other people that have $500 bonds. There's also individual, an individual with a $6.1 million bond. See, we're not talking about misdemeanors. We're talking about crimes and, and, and crimes that affect us, be it state or felony or otherwise. And so to that extent, I did deliver to Mr. President and subsequently to each of you this notion that we have 600 misdemeanors is absolutely false. At the point in time that we did it, it's 261 individuals. And let me break that down for you. 260 individuals, 19 of whom are waiting on a court audit evaluation. 87 of them still have felony charges or habitual violators and don't fall into the misdemeanor category. That's not you all's fault. That's Fulton County's fault in the way that we collect data. And we're working on that piece. An additional 21 cases that have yet to be heard or actually been heard to be released per the judge. And then here's the piece that I want you to take because you have it in your hands. 134 individuals charged with misdemeanors. And it looks something like this when you get a chance to look at it. But they're violent in nature. So right off the bat, you have one right here. Battery, substan substantial physical harm. Each of you have this, please take an opportunity to look at it. So when you hear the conversation around misdemeanors, please be educated as we get ready to move forward. So as, as, as we move, we understand that jails are a microcosm of our society. It doesn't matter what side of the aisle or what lens you look through. See, I don't have a Republican or a Democratic oath. My oath says that I will in fact treat people humanely. And so to that end, I'll give you this last piece. We have 538 individuals that are incarcerated. And if you add up the totals of the crimes that I gave you, it's more than 25,000 crimes. And yes, I get it. Everybody's innocent until proven guilty. But we're talking about felonies and state charges. Again, this is not about mass incarceration. We can do the same thing day after day, or we can really work together to resolve some of this. So the crisis is, is in you all's hands. I appreciate you all listening. And as always, if there's anything that I can do, right, or the sheriff's office can do, we want to make sure that we're here to serve. So if there's any questions, Mr. President, I'll be more than happy to take them. I know you all had a two-hour conversation last we, we put the legislation forth. So if there's anything immediately that I can, I can help, I certainly want to be of, of service. Thank you. I, thank you for coming. I would just advise we would have to move in the Committee of the Whole to have questions. We're in public comment. So um, we'll leave it at that unless my colleagues um, think otherwise. All right. All right. There's a motion to go in the Committee of the Whole. There is a second. Um, just to clarify, we'd want to amend the agenda. The motion is to amend the agenda to move in a committee of a whole. Um, Mr. Bond, can I offer a friendly? It's a motion to amend the agenda to move in the committee of the whole. That's the, it's the motion to amend the agenda to move in committee of the whole. It's technically what we'd need to do. Moved by Mr. Bond, seconded by. Do I have a second? Seconded by Councilmember Norwood. It is. Uh, this can be discussed. Is there any discussion, Councilmember One? 
Um, I, I was, I'm going to not surprise. I don't mind doing it when we're in committee reports and public safety is the first one up. I, I think that may be the most uh, more appropriate thing to do, um, given the subject matter and, and the fact that there are 30 people signed up for public comment that may or may not be here to speak to that. So I, I want to respect them as well. Other discussion on the motion? Councilmember Norwood. I would like to urge that we do go into Committee of the Whole. We have the uh, Chairman of the Fulton County Commission here. We have the Sheriff here. Um, I th and we may have a lot of public comment. I don't know how much we have. But I think it's very important that we get a few questions that my colleagues have for the Sheriff answered right now while he's here and the Chairman of the Commission's here. Other discussion? Councilmember Bond? Just quickly, I don't have questions. I made the motion in deference to my colleague that has questions. But like Councilmember Norwood, this is a rare opportunity that we both had the, the chair of Fulton County Government and the sheriff here. Uh, I know after 30, if it's 30 people for public comment, that's several hours. I don't know if these two individuals with the high demands of their office can remain until public safety comes around. So if we can, I think it's just a couple of people that have questions. If we just go ahead and let them ask their questions, we can move on. Councilmember Waits. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I know that there are a number of individuals who are also here to, to speak to this particular matter. And so I just want to make sure that those comments and thoughts are incorporated into this conversation. And I too thank the chair and the chair for your time in coming today to speak to this. Thank you. Councilmember Bakhtiari. Yes, thank you, Sheriff Labatt and Chairman Pitts, um, and to the rest of the staff for coming. Um, I will say, uh, while I do understand the council members need to, and both of their desires to want to move this into full council, I can assure you that I do not have just a few questions, and that this conversation will be quite long if we were to go into that right now, because I have a packet of questions if we were to enter into that right now. So just know that. Councilmember Lewis. I got a question too, and I think, thank y'all for coming. I think they, they're here to answer them. I think that uh, I appreciate y'all for coming over to, to the building. I, I respect you so much. I appreciate you for delivering the information to us. Uh, I got questions that I, I, I would like to get from the horse's mouth. Uh, I, I haven't seen them in this building to where I can ask these questions. So uh, I don't know if people, I don't know why we don't want to hear uh, directly from the commissioner, the chairman, and the, uh, I don't know why we wouldn't want to hear from them. Other discussion on the motion to amend the agenda move in committee of the whole? Councilor Bakhtiari. Um, I'm sorry, just a quick show of hands from the audience. How many people are here to comment on this issue? And we want to hear from the commissioner and the sheriff. We all here to talk about it, but. You don't speak for everybody. No, Let's, I didn't ask you to speak. I just asked for a quick show of hands to give us an idea. Councilor Bakhtiari, Thank you. you have the floor. Councilmember Lewis. Maybe I'm confused. If we don't, if we hear from the chairman and, and Sheriff Labatt, do we not get to hear from constituents? The, 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 council, the council can allow comments from the floor, so it can yeah, be comments from, from anyone. Yeah, I want to hear from I want to be a dialogue. Uh, we, we never really get this opportunity. And so I, and I know uh, Chairman Pitts is a, a, a strong man who's been around for a long time. I don't think he's scared of none of these questions that could be coming his way. And, um, so, yeah, thank you. Any other discussion on the motion to amend the agenda? Hearing none, we'll move to a vote. I'll just uh, remind my colleagues this is a majority vote to pass, and I is to amend the agenda to move into committee of a whole, and A is against. Madam Deputy Clerk, please open the vote. Wait, the vote aye. is open. The vote is open. Will everyone please vote?
Councilmember, I, I see we have a couple of technical difficulties. Councilmember Lewis, you're uh, an aye. Councilmember Waits, an, an aye. And please reflect Councilmember Lewis and Councilmember Waits as aye. The vote is closed. Mr. President, I voted no. I'm not sure why it says yes. And Ms. Waits voted yes and hers says no. The vote is closed. Seven yeas, six nays. Seven yeas, six nays. Uh, the motion fails. Um, any motion in this chamber takes eight of the membership, a majority of the membership, not of those present. Because we have two absent, it still requires eight to carry. So seven ayes means the motion fails. Um, with that, we will proceed with public comment. I just want to make sure that we're clarifying this vote because I don't understand why we wouldn't want to hear from our chair and our sheriff. We can't, we can't discuss the vote. You can ask a point of order about, about the eight. Thank you. Thank you. You can't explain like your to vote. I'd like to explain my vote. Council Maruva Street. I am voting yes to hear from our chair of Fulton County and our sheriff from Fulton County about something that is important to the city. Not just city of Atlanta, but, but other cities. This is important. I don't understand why we can't ask our questions right now. So I wanted to hear uh, the questions from the council directly to the leadership about what we are doing with the city of Atlanta and our ACDC. So that's why I voted yes. Thank you. Um, Councilmember Wong, would you like to explain your vote? You'd like to make a motion? Yeah. Yes. Um, I'd like to make a motion to amend the agenda to move public safety report of the standing committees to right after public comment, and we can dive into it right then. I just think it's more appropriate to do it under a committee report than interrupting public comment. There's a motion to amend the agenda to move public safety to just after uh, public comment by Councilmember Wan. There is a second by Councilmember Westmoreland. I mean, Councilmember Overstreet, sorry. Sorry, by Councilmember Overstreet. We will now have discussion on the motion to amend the agenda to move public safety committee. Councilmember Bond. Well, I'm going to speak to the motion, but I have another comment about the previous topic. Uh, I would just simply ask our colleagues who voted no, which is unprecedented in this chamber for those who are just coming on to service, that we would not allow uh, the courtesy extended to one, a former member and a former council president, <laughs> the opportunity to, he's not, he's not just a Fulton County Commissioner, 
He is a, a part of the history of this august body. He has presided over this body. It is exceedingly bad form to not allow us to hear from a former member. And it, it is a base. Please, <laughs> for, for those please. of you who don't know, this is a base moment for the Atlanta City Council. Whether you agree with Mr. Pitts or not, whether you agree with the sheriff or not, we should not lose who we are because we're, we're at different ends of an issue. I would just employ, implore our membership to reconsider their votes and allow someone who has served in this chamber as an at-large member has presided over the body, the courtesy of conversation with us. Okay, well, it is, your point. you know, it's disrespectful mm -hmm. to have done that, you know. And, you know, we don't, they, these gentlemen have higher offices than ours. We, we don't know if they can stay uh, until, pu even if public safety is first, uh, we, we, we'd listen to the public. There's only a couple of you that have questions. It can't possibly take that long. So please, I'm, I'm imploring you, please reconsider your votes. And let's allow our former member, because having been on the council, then off the council, then back on the council, when you're, when I was down here, everybody loves Westside Park. When I was down here advocating against uh, BFI turning what is now Westside Park into the largest garbage transfer station in the nation, that body gave me the courtesy to speak. And now we have the beautiful Westside Park. That, that, that is one, that's just one example. So if you would, whether you agree with him or not, please let's extend the courtesy to our distinguished alumni. Oh, no. It's gone? The, um the well, motion on the table is a motion to amend the agenda. To well, at, at least for our sheriff, someone who has given 30 plus years of service. Uh, and he mentioned, he did save my life once, but I saved him from Bobby Brown. <laughs> That's the truth. <laughs> okay, we have, we have to but move along with the agenda. Despite the, the, the levity of my comment, someone who's given 30, 31 years of service to the city of Atlanta, someone who is, was awarded nationally for his progressive leadership of the Atlanta City Detention Center, someone who put in reform programs that gave people who were incarcerated jobs at the city of Atlanta. So when they did were when they were released from prison, they had five, ten, fifteen thousand dollars in the bank. And someone who's been who is who knows the system in and out and has is the holder of the information. <laughs> that everybody wants to hear. If can we please reconsider going into committee of the whole to hear from the sheriff? And of course, for those who don't know, committee of the whole is committee of the whole. So if anybody if anybody has a question, at some point they can ask it. So it's not a privileged thing. But let's not lose who we are as a council because we disagree on an issue. So. I'd like to make a substitute motion to go into committee of the whole. Second. No, we have a motion on the floor already. You have already voted. A lot of public make their comments. Y'all can continue. Y'all can continue. Brother Muhammad, I'm sorry, you don't have the floor, sir. I know, that's why it's discriminatory. I'm sorry, no, you don't have the floor, sir. It's discriminatory. I'm sorry, you don't have the floor. The council's uh, pending the motion. It's just one moment, please. <laughs> insult. It's an insult. That's an insult to this body. Special 
arrogant. Councilmember Bond, your motion was to move into Committee of the Whole. Per the parliamentarian's view, that would be to move into Committee of the Whole, but only for the question of the motion to amend the agenda. You actually can't make the motion over the motion. It's not, it's not taking the place of unless, the, unless Mr. Wan would withdraw his motion. The motion on the floor is the motion to amend the agenda per uh, moving public safety. If we moved into Committee of the Whole, we would actually only have purview over that question. Well, I respectfully disagree. Uh, Mr. Wan has a motion on the floor to amend the agenda. I have the right to make a substitute motion. You do not have a right. That motion does not take precedence. That motion, it, 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 does not, it does not have more standing than the motion to amend the agenda. It simply is then a motion relevant to that. It is not a precedent of motion. So it doesn't take, it doesn't take the place of his motion. It's well, in, and in light of my impassioned plea, I would like to respectfully ask Mr. Juan or his second to withdraw their motion so we can go and committee the whole with the specific purpose of hearing from the sheriff and for the sheriff to ask questions. Because he, like Chairman Pitts, who was forced to Th leave. Th thank you, thank you, Mr. Bond. You made your point. Right. So the, 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 the motion on the floor the is sheriff to- sheriff is the highest elected official to, in the county. Thank you, Mr. Bond. Your, is Mr. Juan. Yeah, I, I appreciate the plea. I respectfully decline. I want my motion to stand. If we could get to the motion and vote, we'd be halfway through public comment already. So the sooner we get to that, the sooner we can go to uh, Public Safety Committee and hear from folks. So let's respect their time and get to it as quickly as we can. So the motion on the floor is to amend the agenda. Mr. Bond, you have made a motion to move in Committee of the Whole. Which you know what? This is what I'll do. I'll withdraw my motion. We can vote to move Public Safety to first. But as soon as this motion is over, I'd like to be recognized because I'd like to make a motion. Okay. Councilmember Bakhtiari. I want to make it very clear, Sheriff, that I appreciate you and the work that y'all are attempting to do. I understand that. Chairman Pitts, if he's still here, I respect him. However, and as much as I respect your impassioned plea, this body voted to have an assessment of data to ensure that the people that were in that jail, that we could streamline and maintain efficiencies. We made a vote. We stand by that vote. I don't appreciate the fact that the Justice Review Board said that they should storm the jail and go ahead and start putting people in there. That's completely inappropriate. In addition, I don't know if she's talking to me. We, I'm saying this to everyone, a 90 day, our body voted to do a 90 day assessment of data review. If that data, if we need that data to ensure better policing, then make sure that they, we, the people that are in the jail need to be in the jail to know the better and operating systems. I need to know how it's staffed. I need to know why they can't fully staff Fulton County. I want to know how they plan on, you can roll your eyes, sir, but this is my right to speak, just as you had yours. My point is that there is data that we need to have to make sure that we are not liable to lawsuits, which Fulton County has endured from the very beginning, from the moment it was built. And there's a lot that we need to know in terms of data. Yes, there is no humane way to jail a person. And in order to ensure that we are doing our job as the city to these people who are in jail, data will always prevail. It gives us the information that we need. It ensures efficient, streamlined policing to make sure that people that are in jail that have not been heard, we need to know everything that's going on. We need to know the data. We need to know how they're going to staff because it puts us at a liability. And because the conditions are so inhumane, we need to understand why people are in there. And I will not, in the blink of an eye, damn people's lives to be in jail without questioning it. These are lives, these are human lives we're talking about. There is data, I have put forth 30 questions that have yet not, that have still not been answered. If, they, if you, you are unable to provide this data, that leaves me a lot of questions to understand why this data is not available, why it has not been provided when it's been approximately two months. There's a lot of questions. And yes, I understand and respect that you've come here today, but the public's been coming here much longer. So we need to give them an opportunity to speak first, and then we can have the opportunity to engage in conversation. I think it's a, I think it's a fair compromise. So I think we should move to vote on Councilmember Wan's piece, but I do wish that we would respect the fact that Atlanta City Council has made a determination on the best path forward for best practices, not just for us, but for the jail. Count. And oh. the data would disagree, sir. So thank you. I'm speaking right now. Yes. Let Councilmember Bakhtiari please address your comments to me. Thank you. Yes, and so we need to oversee the data. Councilmember Dozier. 
Council uh, member, Doc. I move to call the question. We'll hold, we'll hold commentary in the chamber, and if you cannot hold your commentary, I will ask you to leave. I move Council to call the question. Dozier. There's a motion to call the question. Is there a second? First. I've had my hand up halfway through her comments. Council, oh, Council member Dozier has the floor. Is there a second on the motion oh, to call the previous that's question? That's all right. Second? There's been a motion by Council Member Dozier and a second. Sir, if you cannot if you cannot hold yourself, you will be asked to leave. Well, your council is basically marched towards me. Sir. She Sir, please, Council Member Bakhtiari. Another outburst, and I'll ask the folks to be removed. There's a second by Council Member Norwood on the previous question. It's not a debatable question. It takes a two-thirds in order to pass. We'll now move to a vote on the motion to call the previous question. Count, uh, please open the vote. Call the question. The vote is open. Will everyone please vote? For the agenda, which doesn't allow us to share like any questions. Like this because person. even if public safety is moved to the top of the agenda, we will still have to go to the committee of the whole to hear from the chair. So this isn't going to get us what we want or any questions asked. The vote is open. Will everyone please vote? Yes. Never give up. Yeah, it's not working. No word. Mm -hmm. What? No, I, I said I would vote for this, but I want to be recognized when the vote is over. Yeah, I'm an I. We got 12 years. Did that mean it passed? The vote is closed. 13 yeas, 0 nays. 13 yeas, 0 nays. The, call, the motion to call the previous question carries. Therefore, we'll move immediately to a vote on the motion to amend the agenda and to move the Public Safety Committee to immediately following public comment. Madam Deputy Clerk, please open the vote. Uh, again, a reminder is an, an aye would change the agenda, a nay would not. Am I being recognized? Unless you have a point of order, we have a vote pending. I thought we just voted. We vote on the previous question, Councilman Raban. Now we're voting on the oh, motion I itself. See. That's right. That was called. Please open the vote on the motion to amend the agenda. The vote is open. Will everyone please vote? This is open.
The vote is closed. 12 yeas, 1 nay. 12 yeas, 1 nay. The motion to amend the agenda carries. Uh, please reflect that the agenda has been amended for public safety committee report to immediately follow public comment. Councilman Rabon. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, I want to explain my vote and uh, also make a motion. Uh, I voted yes because, you know, it's immaterial whether public safety is first or last. You will still have to go, we as a body would still have to go into Committee of the Whole to hear from the sheriff. The sheriff is a current elected official. He's not a past member of this body. So we still have to go into public, we still have to go into Committee of the Whole. I mean, it, you know, we, we could have done this and it, there's only two people that I'm aware of that have questions. That's Mr. Lewis and uh, Ms. Bakhtiari. And also just to respond to Ms. Bakhtiari, I wasn't rolling my eyes at you. I don't play poker because when I'm thinking of how to respond, sometimes my eyes roll. So I was not uh, rolling my eyes at you. And that's why I don't play poker at all, because I have all kinds of tales uh, about what I'm thinking about. But j just shortly and in brief, you know, the, we should hear from the sheriff. A, a sheriff is the highest elected official in any county. And it, we should not uh, devolve from the high standards and the loftiness of this august body by not allowing us to hear and pay respect to those offices. You know, the Atlanta City Council is a great place, and it is, it, it, I believe, a, a, uh, a high-minded, high-principled body. But we at the level, our mayor, our judges, and ourselves are lower elected officials than the sheriff. And so I would have, I'm going to make a motion uh, to go into Committee of the Whole, which is something that we're going to have to do regardless. And it's unfair uh, for us having the ability to go in, into the Committee of the Whole uh, to tie up the sheriff when he has larger responsibilities. There are, there are 14 other cities that he has responsibilities for safety for, uh, for this debate. And if we can ask our questions quickly, we can be done. And then the public can speak. So I move the motion to, to, the whole. to I believe you want to move to amend the agenda to move into Committee of the Whole. To go into Committee of the Whole with a specific purpose to ask the sheriff questions. And we're gonna have to do it anyway. Second. I got a question. Is there so is there a second? Second. Seconded, sorry, who seconded? Councilmember Overstreet, thank you. We'll now move in discussion of the motion to amend the agenda to move into Committee of the Whole. Councilmember Lewis. Thank you, uh, thank you, uh, President. Uh, once again, uh, Sheriff, uh, thank you for coming in today uh, and spending time with us. I know that your time is very valuable because we got to take care of these folks in our in our jails that we do have in there. So thank you again for coming in here today. Uh, if I go to anybody as a duly elected official, I came and gave my time for the citizens of District 12, I expect to be treated uh, uh, better. I expect to be treated a little bit better. And um, uh, sitting as a city council member and as a black man from the city and understanding that you're a son of the city, uh, I know you deserve a little bit better treatment. Uh, you deserve better treatment than that. And, uh, I'll give it to you from right here. Uh, and we can differ. You know, you know uh, I, I was the one who you know voted against uh, moving this stuff forward, but decorum is decorum and that's the Atlanta way. And so that's why I made sure I brought up your child of the city like I'm a child of the city. Uh, so thank you. Councilmember Dozier. So I just want to, thank you, Mr. President. I just want to uh, just speak to, I guess, my philosophy with my votes today and why uh, I don't support this particular motion. I agree with Councilmember Juan that uh, public safety, that committee and the discussion around that committee's work is the more appropriate time to have this conversation with the sheriff's office and to have us be able to ask those questions. I'm not opposed to our ability or our need to ask the questions that we have. I just feel strongly that public comment or this period that we're in right now is not the appropriate place on the agenda to do that. I think we need to go into committee of the whole during the discussion that we have around public safety. And I recognize that might take a little bit of time, but the amount of debate that we're having on just the procedure and the process and when the agenda or how the agenda gets changed, uh, we could be done with this 
sooner than than we currently are if we were to continue to move forward with the agenda as amended by Council Member Warren. So just want to explain that and why I'm voting the way I am. Council Member Weiss, did you want to speak or was that an accident or no? Did you take yourself out of the queue? I, I just simply wanted to echo the sentiments that have already been made by Council Member Dozier and that I am very appreciative of the sheriff and want to hear your comments today as well. Uh, this is just simply a policy disagreement and no disrespect intended to you or our chairman. Thank you. Council Member Norwood. I just want to say for everyone in the audience and everyone who is watching the tape, um, we have a unique opportunity for each of you who has come down here who have very strong feelings about this issue to hear back and forth between the elected official, the sheriff, and the elected council representatives who will make important decisions. So I actually think it benefits everyone who wishes to speak at public speaking to have heard that exchange before you then give your thoughts. So that's why I'm supporting hearing from the sheriff and having that discussion prior to our usual public comment. Other discussion on the motion to amend the agenda. Councilmember Bond. Just one last appeal. When I was falling in love <laughs> and I was pursuing a young lady, I can say the most beautiful things. I can make the most beautiful and understanding statements. But she looked me square in the eye and said, it's what you do. It's what you do that's going to get you what you want. And so even though we can stand on procedure, uh, but in my humble individual opinion, that is a degradation of the quality of leadership and uh, it is a d diminution of the august nature of this body. You know, the, the Atlanta City Council, it means something more than other jurisdictions. It means something more than just a rule book. It means something more than just a printed agenda. We're the only jurisdiction that allows the kind of public comment that we allow in Fulton County in the 13 county metro area and that's because we're Atlanta. We're the only body that allows and gives the respect to other elected officials from other jurisdictions that they don't give to us when we go where they are. Being here in Atlanta means something and I'm just imploring you particularly because I'm just hearing from the newer members who just, you know, you've only been here about eight months, but don't do this. Don't stand on that, uh, don't stand on the statement that you made. Adhere to the principles that made this chamber great, that made this body great, that made you want to serve on this body. Let's extend the courtesy like we have extended courtesies for the last 150 some odd years to our fellow elected officials to hear from them. And this is a unique opportunity because we'll have to go in committed a whole, as I stated before, and I wasn't challenged on that, uh, will we get, if we were to go uh, to get to public safety. So, you know, this is semantics and it is unworthy of us as members so please, we can resolve this. The activists can get their questions asked. The, the members of the body can get their questions asked from the source. Isn't that what people want? The truth? Makes me wonder if some people don't want to hear the truth. But anyway, I'm appealing to you again as one of the senior members of this body. Please don't engage in this folly any longer. Let's hear from the sheriff and go and commit to the whole. And again, commit to the whole is just like a committee meeting for those who are in the audience. So if there are those within the audience that want to ask a question, you get to ask a question. How often do you have that opportunity? And do you want to wait two hours to have that opportunity? I don't think so. We can do it now. Yeah. Young lady told me, she said, Michael, you want this? I don't want to hear no words. I got to see what you do. So we need to do, we need to take action now. We need to vote now and make it happen. 
I withdraw. Councilmember Lewis. When, when, when I was falling in love, <laughs> I, so, so I didn't go to Doug Heiss uh, like T.I. and Councilmember Bunn, so my words weren't as eloquent, right? I was a little bit more direct. I will say I, I second the stance of Councilmember Norwood. Um, when you just said, I, w I would like for, I know the people here want to see us have an open debate uh, in front of folks. So I second that stand. Uh, I thank you again, Sheriff, for coming down with your team. Thank you for not bringing in the 30, uh, the, the envelopes uh, for us, because uh, we've seen them. Uh, I think that the activist community, I, I'm an activist. I got some real questions for you that I think my people in my district want to see as well. So I, I appreciate you for coming in and standing up in front of us for this. Thank you again. Any other discussion on the motion to amend the agenda to move into Committee of the Whole? Seeing none, we'll move to a vote. Madam Deputy Clerk, please open the vote. Again, just to clarify, an I vote says that you do want to amend the agenda. A nay vote, it says that you do not. It takes eight yeses in order for this motion to pass. The vote is open. Will everyone please vote? Mr. Lewis is a yes. Correct, Mr. Lewis? You're a yes. The vote is closed. Six yeas, seven nays. Six yeas, seven nays. The motion fails. And we're going to move into public comment. Oh, I have. Councilman Bob, do you have a do you have a point of order? We yes, have a I do. clear agenda. I have a point of order. The sheriff mentioned me by name, so when a speaker comes to that podium and mentions me by name, I've got the right to respond to them. Councilman so, Bond, you've had you've had two chances to respond to the commentary today. I think that we've had no, plenty no, of commentary. No, no, sir. I have not. I have not responded to the commentary today. You've the responded sheriff to mentioned the topic. me by name, and I want my right to respond. Please make it brief, sir. What are your questions? I can't see that. When could you have this information that he got to us today? Uh, why couldn't he have gotten it to us on Friday so we could have digested? The first question I have is the information that was provided today, why was it not provided earlier, like on Friday, Sheriff? Unfortunately, per the rules, the, the, we have not moved to committee of a whole. He cannot. He has had his time to speak. I'm sorry, Councilman Bond. We've we've voted this twice. People have re, people have come to this microphone and mentioned me more than any other, and I have asked them questions and they have responded. It's on the record. The sheriff is a citizen of the city of Atlanta. He mentioned my name. I have got the right to ask him a question. All right, Council, Mr. Sheriff, please step forward. You can answer that question. I'll give it a bit of latitude, but we're not going to go on for an hour here, Councilmember Vaughn. Ain't got no parts to this, y'all. What's your name? You don't have so, no question. That's my last. I ain't got no parts in this. Specifically, that information was provided before Friday. It was provided to Mr. President, and if I'm not mistaken, he disseminated it through to the council. So each one of you have what you have in your hand, which is the breakdown of the 261 misdemeanors and the information I stated earlier. As a part of this package, is the bond information on here? It is not. The bond it is not. Is the bond information, as I have explained on a couple occasions outside of this august body, right, as you will put it, uh, was turned over to the president today with some additional s sensitive information, security information on it. And I would ask, as I did earlier, the president to seek the, the advice of the law department before disseminating it. Right? And so to that extent, I'm transparent. There is no need to, but what I did do as part of that is pull out the highest and the lowest bond. And so as we had an opportunity last week to sit with some of our community to talk about 
the lowest bond is one person with a one dollar bond and has an additional charge that's for accountability court that they're waiting to be housed and so to that extent the bond information is in in the hand of mr president and hopefully we can get it redacted get it out and again all right to that very point mr president uh, i'm here and so i will my team will will dissipate as they do need to go back to work but i will be here because whatever those tough questions are they're not that tough you know, I, I, run a, I run a jail. I run the toughest jail in the country, period. And so I want, as you put it earlier, be it activist or city council person, I want you to get your, your questions answered. So thank you. So you, you said that you'll remain until we get to the public safety yeah, section we'll, of we'll the go agenda? I am going to step out and uh, give me something to drink. <laughs> well, so, I'll, so you, I'll will, you will be accessible be in anticipation and understanding that this body would still need to vote to go to the Committee of the Whole to hear from you and so at whatever. that time. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And you, you are not opposed at any time of meeting or talking or having a member of your staff relate the same information to any of these activists? A absolutely not. I mean, that is, you know, I've been transparent for 640 days. That's what I ran on being transparent. My goal is to make sure we, as, as governmental entities, solve these issues. And that, that's what this is about. But it should not be a platform of one way or the other and nothing else in between. And so as I, I trust that we can work together to make this happen. And I certainly want to hear what questions there are so that we can address those questions. And uh, I'll, I'll ask you this. How long does it, the, you've seen the amendment that was put on the the ordinance that passed, how long does it take for your office, which is the ultimate repository of the information that's sought by that amendment, how long does it take to assemble that information? Does it take 90 days? Absolutely, it does not. How long does so, it take? So the information that I got to our president and subsequently to you all was a matter of two days. The bond, two days? Two days. The, the subsequent bond information that you have uh, was actually a matter of an additional two days. And so to that extent, uh, we have been very forthcoming and saying, we, listen, people continue to come up here and tell you all that they have filed open records requests, et cetera, et cetera. They file them in the wrong place. And so to that extent, they filed them to, in, in many instances, our county commission. I have said first and foremost, I am here. And I absolutely appreciate you and, and uh, Councilman Lewis and certainly all of you all, uh, the recognition that the sheriffs is a sheriffs, 159 throughout the state and Fulton County being the largest is absolutely worth us going through this, trying to figure out how we can better treat our community. And so to that extent, uh, you're absolutely right. It does not take 90 days. It is a, a, a stall tactic for whatever the reason is because and I've said this uh, repeatedly, both privately and publicly, right? We'll share the information. We want to make sure that people's lives are not in danger when we do it. But we'll share the information as a repository because no one else can tell our story better than we can. And to have a third party go create a committee to create another committee to then, if there are best practices that come out in the 90 days, I still want to know what they are. I still want to have them. But it does not mean that we stop and do not move individuals to a safer and more humane environment. How many people do you have sleeping on the floor today? 473. 473. And that's gone up since we passed the ordinance two months ago? <laughs> Actually, it went up. And last year, last week, it peaked at 526. 526 people sleeping on the floor a in mile Florida and a half Vice. from here. African-American sheriff. African-American mayor, majority African-American council has a majority of African-Americans sleeping on the floor for information that you can provide inside of five days. That's correct? Correct. I withdraw. Thank you, Councilman Rabon. Uh, just as a point of clarification, because I was um, uh, the information uh, in my office, it was delivered today 
Um, I have not seen it yet because I was actually in chambers. Just to clarify for everybody, I have not seen the information. I understand that it's in my office. So the that's additional the information, correct. The, yes, the bond information. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right, with that, we'll move on with public comment. Um, first up is Brother Anthony Muhammad. You'll have two minutes. Yes. Yes. I am that I am a niggas, king of king, committed, indigenous, antiquity, spiritual being. I command the ancestor. I command the ancestors' spiritual energies to teach my soul consciousness every day. I am not a believer in the Roman Catholic Church religion, Christianity. In your Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, not one person, not one human person was born from a woman womb canal. Now I recognize, as you all have been talking for the last six months, about the condition of the jail. It should have been resolved the first day it came to you that we had people sleeping on the floor. But yet we keep holding, not give out information, Mr. Bond. We have the majority number of people in jail in the United States of America. 80% of them look like you and me. Right here in Georgia, the fourth largest institution of prisoners anywhere in the United States. And the majority of those look like me. If we want to do something for somebody, you're going to speak some truth, recognize that you have a spiritual will to know wrong over right. The sheriff say transparency. I love the word transparency. It's honesty and, and openness. The council members should never have to ask for information. We should be no rent to them and gave it to them, evaluated and made the decision. But what do we do? We want to keep doing what you've been doing for the last 20 some years. You know, I've been coming out here about 11 of them. And any time the public want to speak about the issues, you want to find a way to cut us off, make it short. But I say this, the time is up. You have five of you council members don't be here no more. Because they were here 20 years when speaking up for their district, and you got some new ones in the day. And I applaud that. But don't let it be at no concerns that you got poor people on the street. And that majority don't look like you. And what are you going to do about that, Brother Bond? Time has expired. I appreciate you. I didn't greet you as I come. But I will say, a shed, a shed, and a shed. Assalamu alaikum, may I make you out hotel. Thank you. Next will be Henry Jordan, followed by Mia and Baby Waffles and Roberta Douglas. And again, in advance, if I mispronounce your name, please uh, clarify for the record, and I apologize in advance. I'm sorry. Give now to the Spirit of God, everyone that's here. And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Matthew 10, chapter 28, verse. Jesus reminded them that it was more important to fear him who has authority over the soul as well as over the body, and who has authority to cast them into hell. Jesus has authority to cast you into hell, James Griff. God will kill in order for some to live that seek him. When I say unto the wicked, Thou shalt surely die, and thou give him not warning, or speak to warn the wicked from his wicked way to, to save his life. The same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thine hand. Ezekiel 3, chapter 18, verse. Jesus said, warn my people, prepare against the plot of Satan is the reason he created the income. The Lord said to fight to save your souls because you desire for me to work on a job. I had a dream when you find out that I'm telling you the truth, then you will be pushing me to help you. But if I work a job, then I will be too tired to help you. At that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent, and hast revealed them unto babes. Matthew 11, chapter 25, verse. A knowledge of the Father is bestowed to whomever the Son decides, chooses, resolve to reveal it. God says to fight against your unjust laws. Jesus told me, don't glory in how I speak before you because it's his spirit. Because you practice injustice and ye shall receive injustice. And I said to them, hear me ye Levites, sanctify now yourselves and sanctify the house of the Lord God of your fathers and care for the filthiness out of the holy place. 2 Corinthians 29, chapter 5, verse. 
So the rededication in Hezekiah's time, time has expired. Also, I heard what that sheriff said about stealing money. Y'all let them steal money from me. And they in jail. The person stealing money from me is not in jail. So it's unjust laws. Thank you. Next will be Mia and Baby Waffles, followed by Roberta Douglas, and then Catherine Maddox. Hey, guys. All right, so I had a whole thing to say, but honestly, you kind of pissed me off a little bit, so I'm just going to move on to that. Mr. Bond, please do not disrespect Liliana like that. Liliana is the only council person that has ever given a shit about what me and my daughter need. Council member Liliana is the only person that has actually reached out to me and my group. Please do not disrespect them like that when you say, I've been on the council longer. Doesn't matter how long you've been on council if you don't want to listen to us. Guess what? I'm 19. I haven't had a chance to be on council for 30 years or even run. Who cares how long you've been on if you're not going to listen to the people? Liliana, thank you. You are the only council member who I feel like I can reach out to personally. And I have to shout out to Jason Dozier. We also talked to you. Hi. So anyways, thank you, Liliana. Please do not listen to the bullshit coming from these people's mouths when they disrespect you for how long you've been on council. I don't care. People should not care how long you've been on here. You come out to your community and you listen. So please do not disrespect these people for coming onto council later than you have. We don't get the chance to come onto council because we have to work our asses off to make a living right now. I don't get a chance to come out and try to learn how to be on council. This is what I get to do. We take off work to come do this. Let the public speak when they want to speak because we don't get paid to sit here. We have to get, we have to lose money to come sit here and talk to you guys. It is ridiculous that it's even an option to push back public comment when people are taking off of work, when they can barely afford to live as it is. People come off of their jobs to come talk to you. Moving public comment, now my friend can't make it to work today because they sat through that bullshit. All right, that's it. I'm just... Councilmember Bond. Oh, can you stay up? Okay, I'll stay up there. Also, I'm sorry. Thank you for your comment. And that I, I apologize to Miss uh, Liliana. I told her that I was not rolling my eyes at her or trying to disrespect their time. But the reality is, is that there are issues and things that predate her, the class that she came in with for service. But it was not meant as a disrespect. And I do listen to the public often. I am the only elected official here that has never voted to restrict public comment. And that goes back to 1994. I think the public comment is important. And I sit through it every time that I'm here in the meeting. And I want to make sure that you know that. And so I don't want to disrespect Miss Liliana. I have known her through my cousin for many, many years. My cousin was her college roommate. So you've got a pretty little baby there. I don't want you, you to stand there and hold it. But I do want you to know that I take public comment extremely seriously, and I listen every time. Am I allowed to respond to that? Briefly. Okay. <laughs> oh, don't worry. I don't have anything too mean to say. But um, my point was not that you don't listen. My point is that we schedule out a very specific time of our day that gets moved off with y'all's photo ops every day anyways. And so we pick a very specific time to come here, which is based off of what you guys tell us. So when you are here, there are people that have taken off work for this amount of time. They don't have time for another whole thing that you guys get paid for. We don't. So that's it. Not going to take up anyone else's time. Councilor you. Bakhtiari. Uh, I mean, thank you, but I, and I do appreciate that, but I also, as much as it appears, I actually um, adore Councilmember Bond. We disagree on many, many things, but he's actually taught me a lot, and he's just far better at coming off, far calmer than I am, and um, I'm still learning, but yeah, we, I really appreciate you, and we'll continue meeting, but also I just want everyone to know, like, I have the deepest respect for that human, so thank you. Roberta Douglas. Uh, due to uh, yield of time, you'll have four minutes. Thank you. That was very sweet. <laughs> I'm Roberta Myers Douglas, Vice President of State Strategy and Reentry for the Legal Action Center, a national nonprofit law and policy organization that is committed to fighting discrimination, 
building health equity, and restoring opportunity for people with arrest and conviction records, substance use disorders, and HIV or AIDS. The Legal Action Center, as well as the rest of the nation, has been very interested in what appeared to be a great example in Atlanta of collaborative work between community and elected officials to adopt effective, equitable, and humane solutions for public safety. Solutions that did not involve holding on to or expanding the city's carceral geography. Therefore, when you all adopted legislation that would do just that without an open, in-depth discussion about the financial costs or risks that may come with the agreement to lease Atlanta City Detention Center to Fulton County, we felt it important to examine the data, whatever was publicly available to us. You should have received a copy of the report, this report that, I, that we did, we released over the weekend. It should be in your boxes. I have hard copies here for each of you also. Just putting together some of the current costs, some probable costs um, that could particularly come with this. Thank you. Um, probable costs associated with this agreement. In short, across some of the scenarios where we consider conservative estimates based on the stipulations of the IGA, the analysis consistently shows that the city will not be making as much money from this agreement as it currently pays to operate and maintain ACDC. And our calculations do not consider the increased civil liability risks the city will take on in association with this transaction. By continuing to operate and maintain rather than close the detention center, center, the city incurs both direct costs and opportunity costs every year. At one point, there was talk about what the city could yield by selling the land and the building to a private owner. And the possibility is that it's an estimated one-time amount of 50 to $100 million and an estimated $527,000 in property taxes each year. The 2020 Reimagining ACDC Task Force developed four options for repurposing ACDC. Given the potential savings associated with no longer operating ACDC as a detention center, the city could break even on three of the four re repurposing options the task force recommended in as little as two to six years. In addition to that, really looking to create an opportunity to respond and address the long-standing social issues that are affecting the city today. Really looking to see how we can build capacity with our human services organizations and our health care system. Please talk about that some more. Um, there's other things that we could be doing. I urge the council to go back and conduct a full analysis and review of the short and long-term financial implications of maintaining the Atlantic City Detention Center as a functioning jail and this lease agreement really reversing a lot of work that went into thinking about the best way to effectively move the city forward in its work around public safety. And I had eight seconds left. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Catherine, Catherine Maddox, then Alma Lott, then Bishop John Lewis. I'm not talking about bodies on the floor today with you because there have been bodies on the floors of those jails since the 90s. And if solving overcrowding was a sincere priority for this body, instead of using that narrative as a tool for the sheriff to gift himself another jail, then council would have entered into a much more meaningful dialogue with Movement Policy Council for the Southern Center, Mr. Franklin, when he presented you with results of his examination of Fulton County jail bookings, which showed that only the only reason that 600 of those people are currently detained is because they do not have the means to pay the bond that were granted them by a judge. And instead of you meeting those facts with practical action, some of you chose to meet them with propaganda and to conflate offenses so minor that a judge saw fit to release people accused of them back into society with murder and rape, a comparison which would be laughable where the consequences not so very serious. 
But however insincere you choose to be, you will not find me so. Because everyone who has read the lease understands that it wouldn't matter if you gave Labat a thousand jails, because no matter where you house people, when they go into acute psychiatric crisis, and they will, because instead of opening a center for afflicted people to heal, you choose to prop up a system which instead locks them up in cages until they unravel from the inhumane conditions inside them. And when they do, they get taken to Rice Street and thrown naked into a room with a hole in the ground, and per section 6.5 nine of this agreement that isn't changing and that's the real crisis which you are unprepared to talk about because you have turned your back on the solution you once held in the palm of your hands and I don't know what else to tell you uh, next will be Amalot followed by Bishop John Lewis and Fallon McClure I'm, I'm going to make a comment about one Atlanta. I want, um, first I want to talk to our counselor. We need, this situation is getting better. Crime is getting worse. And y'all know about it and it's, it's a shame to us. Y'all just sit back on house. We know y'all have made some deals and a couple of bribes going on. Mm. But, um, and still the courts, we come here and talk to y'all and try to get an understanding with you all, what y'all is still setting us back about this housing thing. And another thing, y'all never address what is affordable. Affordable can mean a business or anything. We want low-income housing affordability. Since y'all want to put affordable in there for the uneducated, what y'all call them, but step by step. So. When y'all start addressing the communities and stuff like that, or we're gonna have to start getting court papers and see what's going on and pull out some of this data that's going on in this city hall. When y'all are selling people out, we know you have sold us out already, but we're trying to get some understanding with it. What's the way we're gonna go? And so the thing is, when y'all make these little backdoor deals, when y'all had the people in front line, while y'all making deals with the developers, that only hardens people. Y'all the one these crimes, y'all the reason why these crimes are in these communities. And y'all are the reason why these police are taking so long to get to the citizens. It's not that they are not doing their job, it's that they taking so long to get to us because they fixing up murder cases. So when we address y'all, we're serious about this. It, I think it's time to go time to court. Time has expired. That's what I think. Thank you. Next will be Bishop John Lewis. Uh, due to yielded time, you'll have up to 10 minutes. Uh, following Bishop Lewis will be uh, Fallon McClure and Ben Line. <laughs> Greetings to our Honorable Council President and our esteemed uh, City Council. I come before you today to uh, speak uh, specifically as it regards the uh, special use permit application for the Dome, for Dome Atlanta. I became aware of the Dom Atlanta project upon assuming the position as chair of the Vine City Civic Association some time ago. And when I became chair of VCCA, there was an existing community benefits agreement between VCCA and Dom Atlanta. Having no prior knowledge of the Dome Atlanta project or the Community Benefits Agreement, I inquired from the members of the Vine City Board and membership about this project and CBA and discovered that the entire board and membership was at that time in 
full support of the Dome Atlanta project. Some of the community representatives who originally supported the Dome Atlanta project have now come out in opposition of the Dome Atlanta special use permit. Let me state unequivocally that Dome Atlanta has fulfilled all of its contractual obligations to the Vine City Civic Association under the terms of the CBA, which was mentioned at the outset of my conversation, including a $1 ticket surcharge to benefit, to benefit VCCA outlined in the CBA, the funds from the $1 ticket surcharge contributed to VCCA by Dome Atlanta have been utilized to support VCCA programs and activities and to support other community initiatives and activities, including initiatives of community representatives who now oppose the Dome Atlanta Special Use Permit application. Dome Atlanta has gone beyond, above and beyond its obligations outlined in the CPA provided and has provided literally thousands of additional dollars to provide COVID testing for our community, for our community summer uh, program for we have a Wednesday and Friday feeding program where we literally our doors are open and, we, and we're feeding people in the community thanks to uh, our citywide uh, council person and others uh, a lot of things are happening because we have the space to do it the amount of money that we were we have operated the Vine City Civic Association with a full-time office and a location uh, for three or four years with a budget of $75,000 and the rent alone is $24,000 a year. Now you do the math. But we have, been, we have been able to do that because of such entities as uh, Dome uh, Atlanta. Since closing the facility, in September 2021 uh, to address issues raised by uh, the City of Atlanta Office of Buildings, Dorm Atlanta has continued to work with BCA and the general community to address concerns about the operations of Dorm Atlanta. Dorm Atlanta has presented a revised operations plan to the committee or to the community to address this was not something that was done lately, uh, but they presented uh, a community, this uh, revised operation plan to the community some time ago. Uh, the pertinent components of this revised uh, uh, operations plan has been incorporated uh, in an amendment to the CBA between Dome Atlanta and VCCA to ensure the Dome Atlanta fulfills its commitment to be sensitive and responsive to address the community's concerns in its future operations. Let me hasten to say that I realize that there may be concerns of uh, persons about uh, noise mitigation and other issues, but in all fairness, with the dome being closed, there has not been an event to even test the effectiveness of the mitigation. I also want to say, in, uh, as it regards uh, the community and the issues that the community has as it relates to uh, the noise issues, the parking and other, other issues, uh, that I am, as the chairperson of the Vine City Civic Association, are well aware 
of the complaints and so forth that are coming from various uh, members of our community. Bishop Lewis, I apologize for interrupting. I have been advised by council that zoning specific matters cannot be heard at this body. You can speak to neighborhood matters, but you cannot please speak to zoning matters. Well, please forgive me. No, not at all. Please forgive me. Thank you. I just want to say that um, we are uh, really, really um, feel indebted to this group who has literally helped us to keep our doors open. Had it not been for them, we probably would not be standing here today having this conversation with you. And literally, there are hundreds of lives in our community who uh, reap the benefits from the services that are offered by the Vine City Civic Association. In that corner in the back there this, today, there were a number of, uh, of our, our community residents who came out but had to leave because one or two of them have uh, diabetic uh, uh, situations and so forth and had to leave because uh, of, of, of the sensitiveness of their, uh, their, their, their conditions. But there, we have over a list of, we have a, 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 a petition that was circulated uh, and over 50 people in the community uh, that are in support, I mean regular people in our neighborhood and in our community who are in support because this entity, as I've stated before, has been there to help us to continue to do the work that needs to be done in our community. We had, this summer, we were able to uh, have five or six uh, youth that were employed who were able to go around in the community to do work on the homes of of uh, various senior, senior citizens in our community. We, we've been able to get uh, jobs for people. We've been able to, uh, to, to, uh, to offer rent assistance uh, to residents. All of this is uh, documented inf information that we, that we have of the things that we are doing. And I implore you today as members of this committee to respect the wishes of the legal members of the Vine City Civic Association. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Next will be Fallon McClure, followed by Ben Line, and then Ken Rowling. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Fallon McClure, and I'm the Deputy Director for Policy and Advocacy at the ACLU of Georgia. Um, reducing mass incarceration has been a priority of the ACLU and the ACLU of Georgia for many years. We have worked on bail reform and other initiatives in the city of Atlanta to further that priority. As we all know, Atlanta influences everything, and all eyes are on Atlanta as Atlanta has worked to find cost-effective, proven solutions to protect community safety and reduce mass incarceration. This morning, the entire city council were sent a letter signed by more than 60 national and Georgia civil rights organizations encouraging the city to continue to be a national leader in developing innovative criminal justice solutions. As was noted in the letter, in the past few years, Atlanta has made great strides in creating sensible, long-term solutions to community safety and wellness, including reform of its municipal cash bail laws and creation of policing alternatives and diversion initiative which provides alternatives to arrests for people struggling with problematic substance abuse, mental health conditions, and extreme poverty. The city has also developed plans to turn its jail into a center for equity that would instead provide services, reentry programs, and education to community members, leading Atlanta to be celebrated as a model for cities nationwide. We understand the humanitarian crisis that is occurring at the Fulton County Jail. However, we believe the crisis can be resolved through policy change, just as the Atlanta City Detention Center was depopulated through policy change. Leasing more beds to Fulton County does not solve the program, uh, the problem rather, it exacerbates it. And we are always happy to provide more information. Our emails are on that letter that's in your inboxes. Thank you. Thank you. In line followed by Ken Roebling and then Tiffany Roberts.
Good afternoon, Mr. President, members of this august body. Uh, my name is Ben Line. I'm a policy counsel with the ACLU of Georgia. And like many of my friends and colleagues, I'm here to discuss the proposed lease of ACDC by Fulton County. I'm um, here because of the confluence of two events. Uh, first, the Justice Policy Board has impaneled the Jail Pol Population Review Committee, who has met, begun work, and delivered to this body a timeline to which they can interpret the data and provide the information that this body has asked, in fact, demanded in the county or in the city ordinance regarding the intergovernmental agreement. The second event is the actions by members of the Fulton County government to use their own data and say that that satisfies what has been asked for by this body. Uh, however, this is a shot in time data that now has allegedly been updated to include some bond provisions, but we would ask this body to remember that the, policy, the stakeholders and policy members who understand this data are still reviewing it, and I would ask this body to, re, uh, to rely on those subject matter experts to determine if that's all the information they need to give this body the uh, recommendations that it's asked for. Uh, this morning, uh, all council members should have received a letter from ACL National strongly urging this body not to accept any proposal accepting the Sheriff's Office jail data in lieu of the work being done by the Justice Policy Board. Uh, the data that had been provided did not include any bond data, any information regarding uh, why individuals have been released from custody, how often offense is charged, and the average length of detention. While some of this information may have been updated, I would ask this body to allow the Justice Policy Board to determine if that's all the information they need. Uh, we ask this body not to take any further action until that committee's work has been produced, and y'all can review the recommendations to see if that's the most efficient course to take. With my last uh, time, I would like the board, board to know that the Intergovernment Agreement has a renewable clause which goes directly against the ordinance that was passed by this body, and that needs to be addressed before time this body expired. can move forward. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Ken Rowling, followed by Tiffany Roberts, and then Devin Franklin. Good afternoon. Who's ever left here? Uh, I'm here to speak about uh, 22R4355 when it was read into the uh, city's utilities committee. It wasn't really read in. There were six joint ventures in the list that didn't get recognized after Kathy Martin a deputy with the Department of Water Shed uh, praised them. So I'm going to read their names in. Arcadis, BPA, Brindley Peters and Associates Incorporated, Atlanta Water Partners, Jacobs Project Management and Engineering Design Technologies, Inc., CDM Smith, Benchmark Management, LLC, FWR Freeze and Nichols Incorporated, Wade Trim Incorporated, and Williams Russell and Johnson Incorporated, and HR2 Hazen Sawyer, PC, or Sawyer, excuse me, PC, and R2T Incorporated, HDR Engineering Incorporated, and Road Fax. Fox Construction. I'm not a good reader, sorry about that. Each of these is going to get uh, up to $8 million added to their uh, proposals. So, oh, took up more time than I thought. Okay, that's it. I just wanted to read those in. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next is Tiffany Roberts. Due to yield of time, you'll have eight minutes followed by Devin Franklin and then Dewan Robinson. Good afternoon, um, especially to those of you who have decided to listen to public comment. My name is Tiffany Roberts. I am uh, offering this public comment as the public policy director of the Southern Center for Human Rights. Um, as many of you know, for decades, we have advocated for an end to the criminalization of race and poverty in the Deep South. 
in Georgia, Alabama, and uh, Louisiana um, is where we do the bulk of our work. Um, when I was last before you, I asked you not to authorize the lease of ACDC beds to Fulton County, in part because the language of the IGA was essentially a blank check for Fulton County, especially the Fulton County Sheriff. We again lift up the memo which we gave to each of you in August, which outlines many of the provisions that leave Atlanta vulnerable and in danger of perpetuating further overcrowding and abuses by Fulton County at its de detention facilities. And I want to stress here, it, one of the reasons is because the IGA does not define capacity. It does not define overcrowding. And at a meeting um, or panel I shared with Sheriff Labatt last week, the county did not even represent that it was going to decommission the South Fulton Annex. Atlanta has so little authority under this agreement, and now the county seeks to take your legislated effort at a collaborative review, which is not just a point in time snapshot, which also uh, the jail policy board intends to do a longitudinal analysis of trends and data. Um, the sheriff would like for you to strip that power, which is what really one of the only powers that the city has at this point because of the language of the IGA. We implore you to hold fast and to reject that. At minimum, as part of the Communities Over Cages Alliance, we asked you to take the data seriously, uh, due in part to our concerns about the integrity of the representations made to you by members of Fulton County government. Um, and I'll say, Every time those data points were represented to you, we at Southern Center submitted open records requests. And contrary to what the sheriff said, because we have litigated many, many open records requests, we in fact did not submit the open records requests to the wrong body. Fulton County has a centralized portal where you choose the person to whom uh, the, the records request is going, and then it is routed that way. We sent an open records request to Commissioner Natalie Hall because she came before you and represented to you that certain data was in her possession. I have emailed to each of you a copy of that request and a copy of the correspondence from the county wherein the custodian of records represented that they did not believe that Natalie Hall or Commissioner Hall was in possession of that data and that they could not identify the agency with, within Fulton County who briefed her on those supposed numbers. I want to move on to a quote. I say to hell with that. If you need those spaces over there, just go over and take them over and let them tell you you can't get in there. You know that jail better than anyone. That, my friends, is not testimony that was made before the January 6th commission about the overtaking of a government facility. Those are the words of Fulton County Commission Chair Rob Pitts from his seat at a Board of Commissioners meeting, encouraging the sheriff to forcefully take over the Atlanta City Detention Center, with which by all accounts you all have been, uh, have exercised a great deal of civility uh, in during these uh, negotiations. This is the definition of lawlessness. It is alarming. One wonders what the county has to hide that people at the helm will behave this way over a, a review in time that does not significantly delay the transfer of people from the Rice Street Jail. The letter of your IGA says that the 350 some odd people in the South Fulton Annex must be transferred first. Okay, so that means that if you give him the authority today, people will still be sleeping on the bed, on the floor tomorrow, even a month after the first transfers. Last week, the sheriff represented that there were 526 people in boats. Today, it's 470 something. I, where I, you would wonder how that number changed so quickly, and if it can change so quickly, how can we do more of that, mm. right? How can we do more of that? Because he's told us basically that it's possible. If you eliminate data review requirements today, people will still sleep on the floor. 176 people by last week's calculations. Are we to say to those folks that humanitarianism stops at them? So when people talk about humanitarianism, I've said this before, this is what we have built our legacy on at Southern Center. And before I, I practiced law um, at Southern Center, I did so as a public defender, I did so as a solo practitioner, bringing 1983 actions against, which means civil rights violations actions, against both the city and the county, and have been successful as a solo practitioner in both regards. 
When asked why, one commissioner was asked on social media why he wasn't interested in reviewing data, and I'll read that tweet verbatim. I take him, meaning the sheriff, at his word. I have known him since high school. He is my fraternity brother and married to my god sister. Cronyism and private relationships are not substitutes for diligence. They are not substitutes for transparency, and they really are beneath the call to this office. We have requested data related to every representation, as I shared with you. Not one, not one of them has been officially fulfilled. Last week, Sheriff Labatt handed me some data during our panel, and now that data apparently has been supplemented with bond data. But per his advice, we also reached out to the county. So this, this send it to the wrong person business, we were told, just send it to me, I'll send you the information. Uh, at around 8 p.m. last week on Friday, I had to let the county know that we were looking at litigation over this issue because they were telling us that bond information was in fact not available through Odyssey, when because we practiced public defense, we knew that that wasn't the case. After I pointed out the possibility of litigation, then the turnaround was, and, and I believe I sent that request to some of you, then the turnaround was, well, it has to be redacted. An independent review is necessary. Checks and balances are a feature of our democracy. Undermining your authority and your decision-making discretion is really troubling, and I think it should foreshadow for you what the term of this lease will look like if Atlanta does not take a very strong position. Fulton County has an, a consultant. They're paying almost a million dollars over two terms to help them with overcrowding and backlog, surely. $499,000 per contract suggests that some of this information should be expediently available. Uh, I want to also read a text, a, an email from a county official in response to requests from the Justice Policy Board. Uh, that email reads, I have been instructed to pull all requests from the Justice Policy Board until further notice. Fulton County is not acting in good faith, and you should ask yourselves why. You have an opportunity now to mitigate the harm this is causing. We are really interested in getting people off the floor, even the ones who will not be off after 2023 hits. And I also just want to say, we are not called to only respect public office. One of my, one of my colleagues at a trial last week said, the highest public office is that of citizen. So I'm really asking that you all respect the call of the citizenry who come before you and believe that we know some things as Time well. Time has expired. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Devin Franklin, then Dewan Robinson, then Amber Connor. Uh, Devin Franklin, you'll have four minutes due to yielded time. <clears throat> Council Parsons, my name is Devin Franklin. I offer my comment to you all today in my role as Movement Policy Counsel for the Southern Center for Human Rights. However, the substance of which I speak to you today pulls heavily on my decades plus experience as a public defender in Fulton County um, and the insight that that experience uh, provides me as it relates to discussion about who is in Fulton County Jail and for what reasons. Before I begin, I want to be abundantly clear. <laughs> Prior to the introduction of the legislation approving the lease of ACDC to Fulton County, and the jail population study review. I was the only person <laughs> who proactively and publicly spoke to the numbers regarding the persons that were in custody in Fulton County Jail, what they were being charged with, and the bonds for which they were being held. Any comments or statements made by Fulton County officials have only been given in response to the data which I initially spoke to you all about. And that's important to understand. The reason for that is that we, the citizenry, has always wanted to tell the stories and have the discussion about the persons detained in Fulton County Jail. And Fulton County has attempted to avoid that conversation until they absolutely were forced to have it. I have never run from the numbers that I gave to you all. I have been consistent, and today I stand on those numbers, 10 toes down. Before this council and before the Public Safety Committee, I gave you snapshot data from a particular date in July that I reviewed painstakingly with a pen and highlighter. 
Um, and I told you all that regardless of what a person was charged with, there were 650 people thereabout who had been given bonds by Fulton County judges, bonds that indicate that no one thought they were too dangerous to be released and that they were only in jail because these bonds were holding them. My review showed that nearly 650 people, indicted and unindicted, were charged with misdemeanors and what Fulton County describes as non-complex felonies. And that is a number that Sheriff Labatt and Commissioner Latinale Hall have repeatedly and publicly misrepresented time and time again, which I don't understand why. <laughs> I have previously been on a um, People's Agenda Zoom call with Sheriff Labatt, and he said this thing, I don't know where these 600 numbers of misdemeanors come from. And I said, Sheriff Labatt, it's misdemeanors and non-complex felonies. And yet today, he still came to you all and misrepresented the data, which I spoke to. During my comments to this council, as well as to Public Safety Subcommittee, I have offered to share my findings with anyone who was interested. I sat down with a reporter from the AJC and let them look at my books. They published part of that stuff in a morning joke, Monday morning article, if you care to go back and look. As my colleague Tiffany Roberts spoke to just before me, we have offered and instructed members of the sheriff's staff on how to run reports to get the bond data. The data that was supplemented to you all today came from the email conversations that Ms. Roberts and I had with uh, Mr. Schultz and Ms. Joyner. I said, if you go to Odyssey and run this report, you can get these numbers. That's why the data was supplemented by Sheriff Labatt. Conversely, Sheriff Labatt has not presented the raw data that supports his analysis and conclusions. Sheriff Labatt has asked you all to ignore these portions of data that he wishes you all not consider. And similarly, Ms. Hall and Fulton County have ignored our public comments, ignored our um, ORs. We ask that you all. Time has expired. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next will be Dewan Robinson, then Amber Connor, then Mike Russell. Uh, Ms. Robinson, four minutes. Do Thank you. Yield time. Um, I was just on a plane recently, and I seen a, a documentary for the third time of Marvin Arrington as we sit in here. Seen all the great work he did. Mr. Bond seen you on that. And I looked today, right? We got eight black city councilmen. Man, I'm born and raised here. I've been to Rice Street. I've done some things, Ms. Liliana. And as a leader, I encourage you guys to go there. Stop asking them for the damn data. Go there yourself. As a leader, let's, I'm not saying you, let's go there. Put the blame where it goes. These lawyers in here, they took an oath. They're not going to point the finger back at the judges and the lawyers. The judges are the ones who are giving the sentence who got the folks in Rice Street. It ain't Labatt fault that they there. He there saying, hey, they here. What can we do to help them here? So if we dare, so if they're not sent us, it's still the police fault who arrested them. Okay, well, the DA ain't entitled, put the pressure on the DA to give them some time or whatever. So I'm not going back and forth with you, sir. Me and you probably not even on opposite sides. I'm just speaking my truth. But we got eight black city councilmen here. We got a weak goddamn mayor sitting over there and a weak damn mayor over there. We got a strong council. Or, or do we have a weak council? What do we have here? Strong mayor, weak council, weak council, strong mayor. What do we have? You think Matt Westmoreland and Dustin and Howard Schultz don't get together to talk about what the white plans are for the city? Y'all black city councilmen can't get together and stop these damn developers for tearing up down and building high rise, pressing folks out? Y'all can't stop that? The same way the mayor that stopped them and said, hey, I'm not going to give permits for them to tear down Wellstar because they want to build high rises. Y'all can't force the mayor to stop the permits for everything else or y'all can't vote on the stop it yourself? Come on, man. We can't keep sitting here being weak and making these damn excuses in the city of Atlanta. Well, my grandfather and everybody else bled for and fought for, and we losing it because of weak folks. Jason Winston, your first time here, you keep siding with the goddamn mayor of them every time. That's weak, man. They can't stop you. They didn't help you get elected. The police didn't even damn endorse the mayor. Y'all didn't even endorse him as a councilman when he ran for mayor. But y'all want to sit here and go with everything with that. Come on, man. That's weak, man. I come down here by myself because friends like me, who raised them born home like me, if they came down here, they want to slap even every last one of y'all for this weak shit you're doing. And I'm being serious, man. That's why I come by myself, man. Because they'll get frustrated with this. Because it's weak. Y'all won't stand up. But when you're out there running for your office, 
you begging and pleading for dollars and votes. But when you get in here, come on, man. In the law department, y'all will get up there and stop them from saying, oh, you can't speak to zoning. But y'all won't look into it when I tell you that a white city councilman built the damn pool with no permit. Y'all didn't look to it yet. Stand up and stop being damn coward. Even when I worked to the law department, y'all been weak and spineless. Won't say nothing because you were scared of Mary Reed, and then you didn't do nothing when damn Keisha was here. How long y'all going to sit quiet? Until somebody go down there and write on y'all for the law review to help put your license at stake. Y'all got to stop being weak down here, man. Come on, man. It's eight black city councilmen. Ain't no way y'all can keep allowing these damn developers in the city to keep building this, pricing these folks out, man. So it is y'all fault. I don't care who's sitting over there, man. Eight black city councilmen. Come on, man. Come on. And I'm going to say 10, because Liliana, you black, and Alice Warren, you black. We got 10. Come on. And Lydia, I respect you. You stand up. Everybody, all y'all, come on, man. It's 10 of y'all. This look. And we can't change this in the city of Atlanta, where I'm born and raised at, like everybody else up here, half of y'all. And y'all sitting up here, and y'all letting this shit go down on your watch. Come on. It's on your watch. We, in the past, we had all city council that we complained about. Then we got new young fresh blood that ain't got no balls. Jason Doge, you done fought for this country. I know you got a heart, man. You can't keep letting this go down, brother. You can't keep letting them pull y'all to the side over there on the second floor, getting y'all to vote with them with this scared shit, man. Stop it, man. Stop it, man, because guess what? Some of us ain't scared to go to jail. I think it's going to take somebody to start going upside some of y'all heads and them say, hey, man, here's what it's going to be, man. Y'all got to stop this weak shit. Next will be Amber Connor, followed by Mike Russell, and then Stephen Muhammad. Uh, Ms. Connor, due to yield of time, you have four minutes. Hi, I've been coming to council for many years now, and I usually come when I'm very passionate about a subject. Um, I'm here to support our sheriff, Sheriff Labatt. He grew up in Atlanta. He attended Douglas High School and Clark Atlanta University. He is well known and well liked by many, many in the community and also officers, EMTs, firemen, and people who have given a damn about Atlanta for many, many years. He has years of experience running the city jail. He is very responsive to those that reach out to him every single time. When I have disagreed with him, he didn't try to hide, he didn't obfuscate. He faced me head on and answered any question I had. If I had to choose between trusting the opinion of our sheriff or trusting the opinion of those that have little to no experience concerning how a jail is run and what, it is, what is needed to properly run a jail, I choose Labatt every time, our sheriff. Crime has become an issue throughout the city and in many cities all across this country. When our sheriff says he needs more beds, I know that we can trust his communication on this topic. He's the expert on this topic. He's not an armchair quarterback or someone who's a Facebook warrior making a decision because their emotions are out of whack. Atlanta does not have a shortage of facilities and buildings that can be converted into diversion centers, rehabilitation centers, and homeless shelters. But it seems that that's always the excuse when there's many areas that no one's putting their money towards to do such ventures. We know as the civil rights capital of the world, and we should be proud of that fact, but we should not be a handing over our power to globalist elites that provide a template for cities all across America to follow in lockstep. These entities have no affinity for Atlanta unless it suits their investment needs and adds Atlanta into a collectiveness that overshadows what makes Atlanta such a special place. Lockstep, reimagine, reset are all monikers of the globalist agenda 2030, the Davos group. Atlanta is not perfect, but we in this city and in this state are perfectly capable of addressing these issues by listening to those elected to do their job well. Atlanta elected Patrick Labatt, and if he requests more bed space and the use of the city jail, 
We do ourselves a great disservice choosing to listen to globalists that speak about incarceration over our own homegrown leadership. I again ask that Atlanta not bow down to the globalist powers that be, but support the constituents that elected Sheriff Labatt. Don't allow the civil rights capital of the world to be captured by global worldly elites who care nothing about Atlanta's civil rights history and our black leaders and our black leadership. Please don't put the desires of people who are trying to buy the world above those in our city who are quite capable of addressing issues. And if I'm going to take any of you seriously, I better start seeing homeless shelters, rehabilitation centers, and mental health facilities instead of using the excuse of, no, we need that in the city jail. It's an excuse, and it's given to you by the Globalist Agenda 2030. So wake up, grow up, and let's be America, and let's worry about Georgians, and let's worry about Atlanta and the civil rights capital of the world. Thank you. Next will be Mike Russell, followed by Stephen Muhammad, and then Kayla. Good afternoon. Uh, for those of you, I know many of you, uh, Mr. Bond, I appreciate you today. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Mike Russell. I'm a U.S. Army veteran, 28 years. Most of that time I spent in public safety and law enforcement. I come here today to support our sheriff. And I find it appalling that in this city, the cradle of the nonviolent civil rights movement, that we have folks sleeping on the floor. I don't understand it. This has been happening for years. And every time we get close to a solution, there has to be another study, another committee, and nothing ever gets done. We've had enough studies. We had enough committees. We need to get those folks off the floor and start training them humanely. People are con conflict our issues here. The sheriff does not determine who goes and who stays in jail. That's the judicial system. That's not, if you think it's wrong, you need to talk to the judges, not to the sheriff. His job is to keep them, as the court has ordered, in a safe and humane way. And he cannot do that right now because our city will not give him the resources to act. It makes no sense to me that we cannot either lease or sell the facility to the county with our county tax dollars and use those funds to do the other things for diversion, for pad and other things. It seems like some people just don't want us to have a jail. And as one who lives in a high crime district in Grove Park, there's a bunch of folks that need to be in jail and need to stay in jail. So I ask you, the city council, to quit stalling. Quit playing politics with people's lives. Because the lives that are affected are not just the ones in the jail. They're the ones that are in my neighborhood and other neighborhoods across this city. We are doing, we are doing the legacy of those who came before us, like Michael Bond's father, a grave disservice by not taking care of these folks in a humane way because they are in jail for a reason. Thank you. Thank you. Next will be Stephen Muhammad, followed by Kayla, followed by Vincent Fort. Mr. Muhammad, I would just remind you that you cannot speak to a zoning matter per my uh, also comment to Bishop. Uh, okay, and but um, I, I don't know in terms of what the uh, schedule said, but there were five people, four of them yielded their time to Bishop Lewis, and one of the persons, Fatima Muhammad, yielded her time to me. So that should be on the sheet. Give me just a moment to check here. Yes, yeah, check the back sheet of five people. It's not noted on the sheet, I apologize. It's Two not minutes. on the sheet? No. All right. Well, I, I came to speak to the dome issue, but I can't. I support the dome. But I'll go, I'll switch gears, and we're, we're talking about the uh, jail. I was on the committee. Mayor Bottoms put me on that committee. And I don't know if there's anyone else in the room that was on that committee. But in that committee, <clears throat> which was driven by the Bloomberg Group, the consulting firm, we talked, and I came on the committee, and when she put me on the committee, I told her, I'm not foreclosing this building. 
I'm for building a center for equity across the street where that plaza is and take the jail <clears throat> and give it to and sell it to Fulton County, take the money and build a center because they are still criminals. Now, when I was on this committee, I got robbed the first time in my life while I was on that committee. It was all on the news, all of that sort of thing. And uh, some of my brothers wanted to go out and deal with us and I'll leave that alone. We'll, we'll just let that go. But on that committee, which was driven by the consulting group, they were using the jail in Brooklyn and New York as the example of what we can do. Well, now that Bro Brooklyn has changed, they are now trying to close that jail in Brooklyn and turn it into condos. Go check the record. That's what's happening. But that was the big example they kept using, the jail in Brooklyn, the jail in Brooklyn on Atlantic Avenue. Well, I know that jail. I bailed people out of that jail when I lived in New York. So anyway, in terms of this, people are committing crimes, and crime is going up, especially during this pandemic. This was pre-pandemic in 2019 when we were having the meetings. So I feel, as I said then, and I stated to Mayor Bottoms, and I state now, sell the jail to Fulton County, build an equity center across the street. When they get out of the jail, they walk across the street, and they can be reformed, rehabilitated, and rehabbed and then they can become a productive citizen in Atlanta. Or you can send it to us. Send them to us and we'll take them because that's the people that we use. Thank you. God bless this committee. Thank this you. Council. <clears throat> Next will be Kayla, followed by Vincent Fort. I came up here today to talk about a different topic, but that can wait till the next meeting that I will be here because I will be here again. Now, it does not matter what you've done since 1999 or what you have done any day in the past because people for the people has been coming here every day every single meeting since July but that doesn't matter it does not matter what we have done in the past what matters is what we currently do and what we do moving forward so once again what you did in the past what you did since 99 it does not matter what you mat what matters is what you did today what you do moving forward and you need to continue to provide for this community and to take care of these people. Now, the sheriff is here and he gets paid salary. Now, he stepped out, but I saw him out in the hallway and instead of being here listening to the public that is addressing this matter that he is here to speak on, him and his crew is out in the hallway and him talking about how they will have to leave, some of them disperse to go back to work, that should have been the priority in the first place instead of just being here to support him. They should be out there protecting this city instead of just sitting here listening to him talk. Now he is getting paid salary to be here and we want to talk about how we should be respecting the fact that he took the time out of his day to be here today. Now I have been out here barely being able to feed myself, barely being able to pay bills and I am currently here today instead of at my hourly job which I was supposed to be at at one o'clock. And instead, I postponed that to three because I thought, I, I thought I'd be able to leave this meeting by then and get there. But instead, y'all took up the entire time that public comment would take to bicker. And so now I'm not getting at work until five o'clock today and being the only closer and losing out on this money that I need to be able to live while he is getting salary to be here. So it should not be in question that we get pushed back for him to talk. Time has expired. Understood. Thank you. The final speaker today is uh, former Senator Vincent Fort. <clears throat> uh, per my previous comments, two minutes. Good afternoon. Earlier, I thought I was at an MPUR meeting. <laughs> but I'm glad to be here, Mr. President, members of the council. Um, uh, I was here two weeks ago to talk about the plan to do away with MPUR. Uh, in the interim, I appeared at the uh, community Development Committee meeting and was told by the chair, uh, Councilmember Dozier, that the administration had, quote unquote, planned to regroup and was putting off um, pro uh, the plan to destroy MPUR. I don't know what regroup means. <laughs> you know, uh, I hope regroup don't mean we gonna do it a little bit later when y'all done falling asleep. Uh, I know how this game is played. I, pre I know there's an ordinance. 
on the uh, agenda today. Uh, I have sent out last Friday a uh, email, an email to y'all, because as I said before, how can y'all let MPUR go down, descend into chaos, and now you're concerned about it? So let's do away with it? That is my point of view. So I gave you three things in that email, and it's all, for those who want to read it, it's posted on my Facebook page, Ford for Atlanta. At the next MPU meeting, all members should be allowed to speak and participate in the meeting. The chair, the chair should not be able to arbitrarily mute participants. The meeting should be conducted not based on whim, but based on what? Robert's Rules of Order, the city charter, and city ordinance. Uh, there are several other things, two other things that I've put in that email. But we're going to find out on Wednesday at that MPU meeting whether you're serious or not. Uh, you could pass resolutions and ordinances, but if it's still another charade of a meeting, we'll know that you're not serious. And I'm kind of offended that you would allow this meeting to be taken over by the chair of the commission and the sheriff. Time has expired. At the expense of the public that was here to give their input. I've never seen anything like it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that concludes the remarks of the public. Um, thank you all for coming. Uh, per the uh, motion, we will now move directly into the report of the Public Safety Committee. Now move to the report of the Public Safety Committee. I call uh, Council Member Amos up to give the report. What? We'll do everything else after that, but public safety has got to come first per, per the change. Thank you. Um, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, yeah, say Vice Chair, standing in for our Chairman um, Dustin Hillis. I think there was a motion to be made. If not, Councilman Bond. Motion to go into Committee of the Hold, to specifically hear from the Sheriff. There's a motion by Mr. Bond to move into Committee of the Hold. It's been seconded by uh, Mr. Wan. Uh, is there any discussion on the motion to move in Committee of the Hold? Seeing none, Madam Deputy Clerk, please open the vote on the motion to move in Committee of the Hold. The vote is open. Will everyone please vote? Will everyone please vote? Yeah, this screen's not responding. vote is closed. 12 yeas, 0 nays. 12 yeas, 0 nays. The motion to move in Committee of the Whole carries. So we're now moving in Committee of the Whole. In order to open up for public comment, uh, via, we can do that via unanimous consent. Is there any objection to taking public comment in uh, Committee of the Whole? Hearing none, we will move to public comment as well as Committee of the Whole. Um, so we are now in Committee of the Whole. As we should call the sheriff. Mr. Bond uh, has suggested that uh, Sheriff Labatt return to the podium for commentary. Sheriff, if you're amenable. Um, I would like to suggest that um, we begin with any and all questions from members of council. 
and then we will move to if council is so inclined to have uh, members of the community uh, comment but I'd like to go ahead and, and have the comments and the questions from council if everyone's amenable to that just as a process perspective so questions uh, or commentary from council members Councilmember Lewis. I'll start by asking the question I heard. Uh, I heard someone ask today, uh, how did it go from last Tuesday, 473 members? I met folks uh, sleeping on the floor to uh, 526 uh, from the CCI event. Well, vice versa, right? So yes. 526 and, people sleeping on the floor to 473 and, people. And, and I'm thinking like people got out of jail? And, and it's a constant influx. Uh, people get out of jail. Judges release people. People make bond, right? And so where we can find uh, jail bed spaces, we classify and, pull, and move people around to get them off the floor. I'm, I'm concerned with uh, incidents uh, in the jail. I got a lot of friends who, uh, I'm extremely concerned with the incidents in the jail. I'm on, I'm on Instagram, I'm seeing a lot of people on, on Instagram who locked up. Uh, I know, uh, I'm just trying to figure out how, uh, how can we make it safer for my folks out on the street? Uh, because it's a lot of stuff that I feel that's coming from the jail because I'm seeing folks on, uh, so the contra I'm thinking about contraband that's in the jail because I'm seeing people on Instagram myself and on Facebook myself so how is it that we can address that? So first of all, thank you. Uh, listen, it, I'm no stranger to each and every one of you. If you had an opportunity to see the Board of Commissioners uh, last Wednesday, uh, week before, we, we took in five wheelbarrows of shanks, over 1,100 shanks, homemade knives for those that don't, don't know what those are. The building is deteriorating by the day. And so when you have a group of individuals who are, again, you have to keep in mind, we're not, people that get arrested aren't not, they're not everyday people, if that makes sense, right? They're not, unlike everyday people. We got electricians that get arrested, right? So you go into a cell and you see a, a, a cell wired to charge a phone, right? We got construction workers that get arrest, arrested. And so you see the building parts pulled daily with shanks this long. All right, so I've been sounding this alarm for 640 days, if not longer. And so hence, we will need a new build, building. We will need a new jail. But our goal is to get people off the floor. And as stated before, the first movement, because I know someone's going to ask, will be to move the females from Union City, not shutter the building, but upgrade the building. All right. That allows us to move staff as well, but it also is at the behest of the administration. So it's not like I came and said, because I would love to move those 473 people off the floor tomorrow, but the staff is not adequate at the detention center as it is now, right? Because of the reduced population over the years, I get it, right? But this allows us to bring our staff and build up to those numbers. But to answer your question directly, we can go in and shut a building down. For, and this is a, a, a lesson learned piece that I hope uh, those that took, a, uh, took the tour remember. When you build a jail, like ACDC, has 1,314 beds. The operating capacity is 1,185, meaning you always keep room to rebuild pods, right? It costs us a quarter of a million dollars to rebuild a pod every time one is caught on fire, right? So to that extent, uh, that's, that's really the motion, and I hope I answered your question. So uh, my issues with the uh, lease agreement is the way that we leave. Right? I see that you plan to come into the jail. I just, <clears throat> the way that you leave the jail, I don't see the plan to actually leave the jail, uh, the detention center. And so I'm, I know that has nothing to do with you because your job is to run the jail, right? And well, it has to have something to do with you. It has to have something to do with you because you came and requested that we lease the jail to you. And so I'm, 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 I don't see the leaving at okay. all. And, and that's a fair question. So let me make sure everybody's aware. 
while I was traveling, Mr. President, I watched the three-hour debate back and forth. So I understand your concern is what the drawdown process is. The drawdown process has been one that includes, as you heard someone speak earlier, includes the courts, right? Includes all of the monies to help figure out how we speed up the process, right? So it's, it's not just housing individuals. We have over 14 programs that are for, whether it be so young, young ladies can get their uh, cosmetology license, right? GED programming, K-9 cellmate programming. We have some of the best programs in the country so that those individuals can partake while they are either waiting on trial or part of their adjudication. So a judge can say, let's start this PAT-3 program again so we can employ people as Councilman Bond mentioned earlier, we, we were able to release individuals. They were city employees. Instead of leaving with $25 in a bus ticket, they left with twenty dollars and $30,000 in the bank and a future, right? It's no secret that 90% of the people coming out of our penal system, our state penal system and our county system, are coming back to the Atlanta metro area. And so what better way to, to draw down that population than give them jobs, right? Not give them, let them earn these jobs. Let them earn their education. But to your point, right, the same way that we are staffing up, we will continue to push. And one of the things that you, you may or may not have seen is we have a jail feasibility study that is due in, in December that talks about a new building, talks about a building for all of us, and that's part of our goal. So, and lastly, I know you, I have no doubt, I, I supported you in your campaign way before I was elected official because I, I, I did not like the way our last sheriff ran our city. I have no doubt that you, run, you can run the jail better than anybody in the country, but your job is to run the jail. And so the politics is going to be involved in this full out because I think, the, like he said, highest ranking elected official in the county, but we handle the politics, right? Mm -hmm. And so to see, to hear the comments from commission, from Chairman Pitts today, his politics, they're totally different from my politics, and your job is to run the jail. And so politicians, I don't see those politicians uh, being a part of your plan to get up out of there in four years, uh, which is so hard for me to support this, this plan because I know you'll run the jail because your job is to run the jail better than anybody else in the country. So if, if you'll allow me. First, I don't speak for the chairman, okay? The comments that were made by the chairman, in my opinion, were made in jest, all right? So we're not going to go and drop off any detainees over at Fulton County. It does not work that way. Quite simply, to your point, I have three constitutional responsibilities. Be the chief law enforcement in the county. Run the courts, protect the courts, and provide a humane environment at, the, at a jail. So we have people housed at Cobb County, I think specifically 218 people today. Cobb County, that will go up to 500 people if they had the staff. And, the pre, and you mentioned the previous sheriff. Previously, and, and I won't, I'm not disparaging any sheriffs, but previously we had people all over the county. Hall County, Gwinnett County, you name it. Attorneys and families alike were traveling hours across the county to see their clients. And I am simply saying less than a mile down the street, we have a facility that we can do both. I've never not said, don't do a study. See, where, you, where I'm weak make me strong. If there's information to be gained and we glean it and make a better system out of it, let's do it. And so to that point, one of the things you've heard several people talk about the numbers and the data. My goal is to have what you want published on the Sheriff's app. You can get it at your local app store and Google Play store, and it'll be right there at your fingertips. All the information, the data, minus the sensitive uh, data that, that we turned over to uh, Mr. President. Council Member Dozier. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Sheriff LeBaugh, for joining us today. I know you have a lot going on. Across, Fulton County is a very big county, and there's a lot of uh, uh, road miles that your team has to cover to try to keep us all safe. And so I appreciate you taking time out with us today. 
Uh, I do want to just address something that was stated earlier during public comment. Um, I don't have a question, but I do have a comment that I do want to, to just kind of share because I think that there's been a lot of concern, there's been a lot of frustration and a lot of uh, misinterpretation around the intent of the amendment that was proffered during our um, meeting a few weeks ago around the request for this jail population review to be done as part of the IGA. And I will say that for me and why I proffered that amendment is because in the spirit of collaboration, I think it's important that all the parties involved understand what we are undertaking. I think it's important that um, It's important to know that this, that wasn't the first time that city council members or the general public have asked for that information. I've asked for it for, for months when we met with the administration about this potential opportunity for a partnership, for lack of a better term. I asked for the information then, and when I joined you for the tour of the Wright Street detention facility, I asked for it in that context as well. Not an email was sent to me, not a text message was sent to me, not a phone call was made, and so I felt that on behalf of the city, uh, for our ability to do the people's work, this body to fully do the people's work, we had to have as much information as possible. It's not to delay the process, it's not to create any sort of, uh, uh, throw any smoke and mirrors or to derail anything, it's so that we have a better understanding of what we're truly working with. As our 40th president, Ronald Reagan, once says, trust but verify. And I want to make sure that the city of Atlanta is doing its due diligence to ensure that any intergovernmental agreement that we're entering to is done with transparency, done with accessibility, and done in a way that is, like I said, fully on the behalf of the people. And so this is all to say that I do want to clarify that the amendment asked for the jail population review to be completed within 90 days of the vote that took place a few weeks ago. It doesn't say that the jail population review, whatever is determined from that, will uh, make the IGA null and void. It doesn't say that it will create any additional loopholes or challenges. It says that the review must be done, it must be presented before city council within 90 days. That's it. The sooner the raw data or whatever information is requested is provided to that committee, the sooner that work can be done. This is all to say that I get that time is of the essence. I understand that many people are sleeping on the floors, as they have been for months and for years in some cases. As we go through this process, to me, if we, we could have had this debate months ago, or years ago with the previous administration. So as we are thinking about, hey, this is taking more time, there's always been a challenge. So the sooner we, have, we would have gotten this done, I think we wouldn't be in this situation that we are here today. So that's the statement I just want to make that I'm not asking for this work to be done because I'm trying to throw a wrench in the process. I'm asking for this work to be done because I think that transparency above all else needs to be how our city government operates, how all of our governments are operating, and I want to make sure that that commitment is, is, is reflected in any legislation that we push forward that is sacrosanct and that we continue to keep that as our guiding light. I yield. Thank you, Councilmember Dozier. Councilmember Bakhtiari. First, Sheriff Labatt, did you want to, I wanted to give a moment to respond if you'd like to. Well, quickly, yeah, yeah. thank you, Councilmember. Um, if you recall, when you took the tour, I was supposed to be out of town that day. And I thought it important enough to, to personally take you and several other members on that tour of the facility. And so your ask then, as I was leaving town, was built into fruition as I came back, right? Our goal is to be transparent, period. And I am simply saying that there's no reason that we cannot do this simultaneously. But I'll tell you what. Since people are dying, right, the next time I have a mother that I have to talk to, I'll invite you to come talk to them with me. Next time I have a deputy that's stabbed, right, because it is a crisis. 
and it is a crisis to your point, and I received that, a crisis that has been dealt with and can kick down the road, right? Dates back, predates Mayor Franklin, right? There was a, a point in time when Mayor Franklin was going to sell the jail to the county. That stalled out. Happened under Mayor Reed. That stalled out. And I am simply saying that there are things that we can do better if we do it together. And so 90 days is like me telling people, don't go vote early voting, right? Don't go vote early voting. It's not that important. Just show up on election day. And election day to have another body. And, and again, I, I, I welcome the study. I'm in a position where often, and I've done it over the years, we invite people in to audit what we do. Because if there's a better way to do it, I want to know what that is. But there is not a better way to stay stuck in the mud and not do things jointly in, in, that, in that vein. And that's my only pain point. If we can continue to move forward, and again, we'll get people out as they come out. But again, uh, so my apologies if you didn't get the information two weeks after I, uh, w I was traveling when you, when you came. But I thought it important to personally give you all that tool. And, and, and I appreciate that. My, my main point is that we should have started this process earlier. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here where we are today. I agree. I agree. Councilman <laughs> Bakhtiari. First, Sheriff Labatt, um, first, thank you. And first, let me apologize for the way I get heated. I think that's something that we sometimes have in common, and I think we're going to make each other better for it. Um, and to the staff that's here today, I failed in the sense that what my job as a public servant is to do is to not just look at things from my own perspectives, but to look at them through all perspectives. So in the moment that I slipped, I failed to see how my approach could be deemed as disrespectful to you. So I apologize for that. My, to, to share some of my reasoning, because Sheriff Lovat, you did a tour of the jail with me and I appreciated that. When you asked me if I had a tour before and I said, no, I've been booked here though. Um, in the past, so you know, I have my experience. That was before you were there. Now, to share my understanding, because I I do not know what it's like to run a jail. I do not know what you all deal with daily after touring. I can I can't even begin to imagine the difficulties that you come across. So, my my questions and the reason I have the questions is because, as you said, these issues far predate us, and it should have been started sooner. And Fulton County, obviously, that the jail. I know that you want to rebuild build a new one, and I understand why. Now, my concerns with all that is because of the, the reason we wanted to do the study, the reason I was hoping to do this study, is because looking at the issues in the past and the lawsuits that have occurred, and looking at the data and to streamline your job, because as you've explained to me, there are, there, as many of you have explained to me, there are judges that haven't heard cases. We can't push them on their caseloads. There's other issues that in, in the indigent population, of course, as you've said, comes from judges. So there's certain things that I need to understand where that data can come from, who I can ask. But my concern was that in taking this on, like what can we do in partnership with Fulton County to do the review to find out where we can help improve efficiencies? If there are people, if you need help with the courts, if there's something we can do, where can we improve? Where can the city also step up to improve for like mobile booking and doing things on our end to improve things, taking a look at the people that are there? Because when, my, when I'm talking to policy matter experts that are saying, hey, there are people here that shouldn't be. So in my mind, if we had the data, it would actually improve everyone's job across the board, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And doing so, I did not realize that it would spark this. So I guess my questions are, Kind of how did we get here because i'm a bit confused because of the data piece so like understanding that um i know that we're a month out of the night a month out from the 90 day p the 90 day review piece and that you needed people in there yesterday i understand the urgency of that so how can i now coming at it from this lens how can we improve how can we define overcrowding um who are we moving like understanding who we're moving from union city what improvements will we made there Th these are some of the questions that i'm, I'm concerned about and seeing how we can work together moving forward. So uh, if I may, first, mm -hmm. I'm here for the long haul. So if you got 30 questions, I, we will take And I, I wanted to know if the administration also sent those to you, because I sent them over to the administration. I, Did you I, ever receive I them? I personally have not gotten them. Then I will work right, on that. But, but does not I'm mean sure. that our teams have not been working together to do that. Uh, let, me, let me take a step back. I appreciate your passion, right? So, you know, I supported you a long time, right? And I say that to say 
uh, even when my team has uh, gotten upset and even as uh, some of our council members, look, I get it. I came over here packed for the long haul. Only thing I needed was a coat, all right? So whatever questions you have, I want to answer. I want to make sure that in that spirit, right, you have what you need to help us work collectively to make these things happen. And so whatever that is, let's, uh, you know, shoot. You can tell me what they are. We can go from there. I will tell you that the jail was originally built 30, some 35 years ago, and the operational capacity, it was full the day it was, was, was open, mm -hmm. right? Federal consent decree has us right around the last, when we were under federal consent decree as a jail predates me, right? Okay. So I inherited this, but around 2,500 beds, right? So we're almost 1,000, if not more, over in that space. But again, you know, it, and, and here's where I get confused and, and I want people to understand. You know how much easier my job would be if I had a thousand less people, right? If the cases were adjudicated, if there was some way to uh, expedite their cases, right? I found out last week, and this is uh, through my own opportunities to learn. So if you got five defendants in a case, right? And correct me if I'm wrong, then if you got five defendants in a case, one of them, the public, public defender, accepts their case, right? and the other four still can't afford an attorney. They then have, they conflict out. So they can only take the case from the public defender's office for one of those defendants. The other four have to be appointed an attorney. That's gonna get reset six months. And then some of our high powered uh, local attorneys, all of which we know, are not gonna take that case because ultimately they get paid what the public defenders get paid. Mm -hmm. That's not a city of Atlanta council problem. That's a Fulton County problem. That's a Fulton County Board of Commissions. They're, they're aware of it now, right? And I won't say they weren't aware of it before, but they're aware of it now. Those kinds of things through this process has allowed me to say, okay, let me help fight for the Public Defender's Office. Let me help fight for those individuals who need to be heard, right? When I came in, and I, and I haven't shared this with some of you, when I came in the office, I wanted to find out how many people had not been to court a second time Right? So we have, a, we have a, a, a wonderful process in place that allows a person to, to come in, get an electronic warrant, and move on. It was over 800 people at the time that hadn't been to court a second time. Right? And so how do we work with our judges to make that problem go away? So imagine if I had 100. Look, my staff would be happy if we had uh, 1,000 less people as well. Mm -hmm. Right? What does that look like? But my, my urgency is simply to help develop, a, uh, be in a place where we can get people off the floor, get them behind doors, right? The newest thing is to, and, and I showed you when you, when, and, and many of the members, right, when they came, the different unique ways that dis, just absolutely destru, destroying the building, right? So to that end, uh, whatever questions you have, I'm, I'm here for you. Would it be okay to ask a couple of them now? Yes, please, okay. please. So my first question was, how do, how do you define overcrowding? I define overcrowding as not having enough beds mm -hmm. for an individual and that many individuals have to sleep on the floor, period, right? Go ahead. And who, who are we moving currently? I know you mentioned some of the women from Union County, but who is being moved exactly from Union County? So the women, all the women. So part of the IGA and part of the negotiation said, mm -hmm. listen, we'll take all the women. We'll take the women if you were predating me. The Southern Center, is, is, I love Tiffany, don't get me wrong. Uh, it, just because we don't agree all the time, we can have a civil conversation. They sued the previous administration and won, right? And because women were not being treated accordingly, right, between them and the GAO and the, the other group, right? So our goal is to move the ladies in, use the staff, right, to whom, by the way, we've already started training as mm -hmm. part of the IGA in direct supervision, and then build our resources from there. We don't have a hiring problem. And I told this to the county last week, we have a retention problem. Mm -hmm. And so while we've hired equally as four, 400 deputies and detention officers, et cetera, we've lost equally as many. And a lot of that you all will wrestle with is, as the police department and the fire department come forth later on in the years as, as you, you know, continue to serve you'll continue to have some of the same issues we're having, which is that retention piece. Understood, and will people after this is done, um, after the, the 
the term of this period, will people be moved back to New Union City? And if so, what improvements will be made? So there? our goal, and that's a great question. Our mm -hmm. goal is, and if you look at the, the agreement, it's a four year agreement, mm -hmm. then it goes up to some absurd $150 a day per person, right? I got it. I, which does nothing but provide our team the motivation to stay engaged with the courts. Our hope is that we won't have to go back to Union City, right? That's our hope. But at the same time, our hope is that we break ground on a new facility. And I get it, hope is not a strategy, I got that, right? That's why we're putting the concrete evidence in place to say, you know, help us put these programs in place. Just don't put your feet in the mud and say we can't do X without Y. We have to be able to do this consecutively. And if anybody wants to wait 90 days, again, we can be patient, we can wait together. But the, the census is not going to affect anybody else. I'll give you a good example, right? Let's say the census come back and, comes back and says that 25 people can be released, right? Whether it's 25 people on the floor at 901 Rice Street or where it's the same 25 people at 254 Peachtree Street, they get released, right? So I encourage the census, I encourage the, the data study, but we need, the, the beds are sitting there. It's not going anywhere. We've got 1,300 beds over there. And we need to be able to treat people humanely. And um, the current, you said, you mentioned the, re the retention issue, um, mm -hmm. which we argue we have across the board. So what is the current deficit? Because my one of my concerns is, is that this, under the IGA, Fulton County will take care of the staffing at ACDC. My concern is with the current deficit, which um, I'll ask you what that, and again, what that number is. Will it, my concern is will further exacerbate the staffing issue. And that, will that, do you foresee City of Atlanta having to help with staffing at ACDC with Fulton County taking over the lease there? So great question. So specifically last week we had 155 vacancies, mm -hmm. all right? Far less than some of the, the city agencies right now. So we're doing a really good job there. Specifically bringing the, the young ladies over from the South Annex will allow us to have staff immediately. And so as we continue to hire, we will train and hire with the, with the goal of opening one unit at a time. It takes about four individuals per cycle, right? So that they're now, in terms of a staffing analysis, there. The goal is never to use the city of Atlanta. As a matter of fact, it's written in the IGA. The city of Atlanta detention officers won't be used on the Fulton County detainees. And um, one of my concerns, I was also listening to you mentioning the um, programs, which sound wonderful. Will that add additional cost to ACDC? No. So the programs we do now, and to include mental health programs, mm -hmm. right, will be available to everybody at ACDC. I actually, will have, go ahead, I'm sorry. No, I was going to say, actually, it'll provide uh, more room and some, and more privacy, to be honest. Okay. Um, I'm going, I have a lot of other additional questions I think that can be, that I'm going to send over. I have a list of 30 or so that kind of touch on the current people that are there that are that might be experiencing mental health issues or it could be in the familiar face faces program or the indigent population situation and some of the others i saw that in the cci town hall that the indigent population you defer to the judge so i will that that's more they're keeping i'll forward those questions over um i my hope is that you can understand that from our perspective my concern is also ensuring that we're doing this in the best way possible, that we're also like taking in the city's interests as well. Because some of the concerns that have been raised, not just by my constituency, but by public, by policy experts in the room, I have to follow up on those. It's not meant to be a sign of disrespect at all. And I will follow up with those questions. And I thank you for taking the time to answer mine now. Um, but I, just like you're not going anywhere, I'm here too, to, to work across all lines and to figure it out. So I'll follow up with more of my questions by email if that's okay with you. That's absolutely fantastic. And I, I, we certainly will be, uh, equally as responsive and is it something we don't uh, address, please let us know that immediately uh, so that we can get you the best information. I will also caution, right, I've, I've heard a couple of times people talk about litigation and the things that we don't want to impose on the city, right? I got sued every day when I was with the City of Atlanta Department of Corrections. I get sued every day now, right? 
doesn't prevent somebody from filing a lawsuit. It is our response to it that, that, that helps us mitigate those circumstances. Mm -hmm. But ACDC was run in a manner that when Fulton County, and so let me tell you, this is a sign of respect more than anything else that we are here. And I say we, and I don't speak for the mayor and his team, but it's a sign of respect because I don't have to be here. And let me tell you why I say that. Because when, when DeKalb County was in emergent need of bed space, we housed 400 detainees. Right? I'm not telling you, I'm not telling you hearsay because the past matters. Mm -hmm. Right? We didn't have to come before council. We didn't have to do an IGA. It was an emergent need. When the emergent need from the U.S. Marshals came about and they shut down a jail in Puerto Rico with some of the most vicious criminals known to man, including gang members from MS-13 and the like, we housed 500 detainees from the U.S. Marshal Services. Right? And so, the building is built with one thing in mind, and that is to be a jail. Can we do other things with it? Absolutely. 471,000 square feet. What well, we can do them simultaneously. And so I offer you that only to say there's no reason we shouldn't be able to move forward, especially as long as we're communicating with each other. With each other. So thank you. But I'm here, though. If you got some more questions, I'm here. Uh, I don't know what. I have my list of questions that I'll send over because I feel like we would, there's still other things we need to get to, but I have a, another list I would like to get to before we get to um, committee next week. Thank you. Councilmember Waits. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Sheriff, I appreciate your presence today and the opportunity to engage in this dialogue. And also thank you for the opportunity to meet privately to have these conversations where we had a very spirited exchange and there's some things we agree on and there's some things that we did not. I share your concerns with respect to overcrowding and it appears based upon the conversation today, the magic number is a thousand individuals. Yes, and so my question to you is this, and I would like to see these individuals to be treated humanely and off the floor and whatever we need to do to accommodate them in a humanitarian way. But it's also my understanding from speaking with advocates and individuals who state that these are accurate numbers that there are a number of individuals, a third, I am told, of people or folks who are incarcerated that are currently awaiting mental competency evaluations there is a court backlog to which these individuals have had no access to legal counsel, and then the others are eligible for PAD services. So my question to you would be this, the thousand number that we are looking for, is it not your opinion as well that we could alleviate a thousand individuals in terms of overcrowding if we were to address three, three pockets of individuals? So that's a lot to unpack. First it of all, um, thank you for taking the time to meet with me as well. Um, and you know as well as I, uh, I do at this point, uh, I'm willing to try anything, right? And so whether it be pad, right? Here's, here's the thing, that's pre-arrest. So the officer's already made a decision. What does that look like? Where can they go? And I am, like a speaker said earlier, I'm a proponent of don't wait for the jail. Let's have the program. Let's put it in existence and let's show some successes. Right. With respect to the mental evaluation, those are the and, and we're doing this right. We are working with Emory. We're working with Grady Hospital. Again, we have more customers than we do have service providers. Right. So I welcome all of those opportunities to figure out how we we do this. I have simply said right. And the third. What was the third? Um, council member. I'm sorry. The court. Right, and so to the court backlog, I, I gave an example of the public defender's office a few moments ago, and there are many people that don't have access to, to legal counsel, and we want to help that. That Again, we're stuck in the middle of this churn and what that looks like. And so, again, the, the judges will remind us all that they're elected officials as well. And so we continue to support the efforts to, to do it, whatever we can. One, and, and I'm actually proud of the, the county commissioners who stepped in and used some ORCA money to hire additional judges to first time ever. I don't know why we didn't do it a long time ago, Councilman Bond, but first time ever we had night court, right, to try and churn through some cases and figure out what that looks like. So nothing's off the table. Nothing's off the table. I am simply saying nothing's off the table, but let's get people off the floor. 
And so that, that's my ask, and so I'm open to all of those. Other comments from council members? Councilmember Boone. Thank you, Sheriff, um, for being here. And let me take this opportunity to thank your entire team for what they do day in and day out um, in the space of the community. Um, recently, they were at Doctors Memorial Park. Um, at every midnight basketball game, we had a trade fair to help young people that were not college bound. They were there and just so many places. So let me say that um, you all are to be commended. I simply want to say that the late Emma Darnell cared about the men on the floor. That was a major, major concern for her. Just because you have done something or accused of something does not mean that you should have to sleep on the floor and be in inhumane conditions and your life being threatened. So I implore this body to look at the human side of this. We need to get the people off the floor. Those in Union City are not on the floor. But the men at Rice Street, they're on the floor. The late Commissioner Emma Darnell did not sleep. She was always worried about the men on the floor and met with the former sheriff on numerous occasions who could not get this accomplished. I definitely believed in folks getting the help they need if they happen to be incarcerated. I remember the, the program that we had here, the PAT 3 program. Was it PAT 2? PAT 3. Right. PAT 3 yeah. program. That, and I look at so many of those young men now, and they say, thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. I, I own a house now. I own a home now. I, I am the head of my household. So everybody, let's get the men off the floor. Let's get them off the floor. They do not deserve to be in inhumane conditions where our staff can't even really manage them at this point. Thank you. Thank you. Can I, Ms. President, point, yes, of, please. point of additional clarification. Uh, we have exceeded our capacity at Union City as well. And so there are women on the floor as well. And so our goal is to, to get them off the floor. But certainly thank you, and thank you for allowing us to be a part of all the community efforts to each of you uh, as we continue to, to fight crime together, as we continue to um, really provide a, a service interruption from this gang to, to capturing our kids program. So thank you all. Councilmember Bakhtiari. I just wanted to make one clarifying point. Well, I have one more question, <laughs> but one clarifying point is um, I want it to be very clear because I understand completely where my councilmen, my colleagues are coming from and that questioning and make it clear to the public that the questioning of this is not to keep people on the floor. That is not at all the intention. And I understand the perspective and respect where they are coming from. Um, I, I'm hoping that as we move forward that the conversation of accountability is not meant to be a conversation of disrespect. Um, just as I expect you to hold me accountable. The questions are not meant to, and I think that one of the things that lends itself to a more polarizing conversation is that when we start asking questions, people get upset. I'm not saying that about you. I'm saying in general. Um, and that's not meant to be the case here at all. So the ask is, from my perspective, it's the more data I have, the more I can assist. Whereas I understand the perspective of the other one is, this is slowing us down when we're in the midst of a crisis. So. I know that we're going to continue a conversation offline, which I'm really looking forward to. I guess my one question is, I know that the first people being, being moved is from Union City. I'm curious if we're talking about the folks that are on the floor, why aren't we prioritizing moving them into ACDC first? We are. The, the, the Union City population? The Union City population, but the, full, the Rice Street population as well. So because the way that the IGA is structured, it receives the Union City population first. Mm -hmm. And then as we continue to staff up, 
So let's say we get in there tomorrow, and you know, Lord willing, uh, we get the young ladies off the floor and out of Union City, and we do a st quick staffing analysis that says we can open two more pods. Well, going to the IGA, right? We still got to wait a month, mm -hmm. right? Or what that looks like does not mean we can't have the conversation. So as I continue to how hire individuals, right? We can take some of our experience. Uh, more seasoned people and have them run the direct supervision piece. It's, it's a stipulation, again, with the mayor's team doing their due diligence, I don't speak for them, that allows them room to breathe as we continue to grow, mm -hmm. right? So it allows us to come back as, a, as two entities, allow us to come back and say, okay, here's where we are, right? This, this is, so we're opening a different unit, right, to get 50 people off the floor. All right, so it is it's staged and it's set up in phases. And, and then let me go really back to something you said earlier. That's why I said I, I appreciate the passion in which and the lens in which you look for, look through. Uh, but to my new council members, right, Here, here's the biggest thing. I believe, right, there's a certain level of credibility that I, that I bring because we have worked for years, years, 31 in particular with the city, Last 10 is the chief. So take this in what I tell you. Mm -hmm. if, I, if I tell you a, a duck can pull a truck, you just hook it up because it's going to pull that truck. I'm going to always give you the best of what we have because we're here to serve. And that's our goal. And we want to make sure we accomplish equally as much. I'm a data person, right? I'm absolutely a data person. And I want to make sure that you have all the data that you need to, to help us through this process, through this crisis. Thank you, and I was curious, because you mentioned the the Union City piece, do we have the numbers? How many people are currently on the floor in Union City? I have it before I leave. Okay, um, and then um, I'll have follow-up questions about, again, just the number of people with severe illnesses um, being transferred to ACDC, because I think what, one of my concerns personally is I know that we've had an uptick in COVID and with HIV and AIDS and having those numbers and understanding how we can better accommodate ACDC if that's going to happen. But I was also concerned that the agreement prohibited that. So I was, these are just the finer details I want to better understand. And so that's a great question, right? Mm -hmm. And so to that extent, it is important to know that our team has done yeoman work mm -hmm. over at the county. So last check, and they'll come up and tell me if we got one or two, we have zero people uh, with monkeypox or COVID. Right? Not that we have not had the exposures. At our peak, we had 340 individuals that had COVID, right? But there was this movement a long time ago to not build cells that were designed for negative pressure rooms so that people weren't repeating those infections. But we do a really good job. And so to that point, the medical teams come as well. But more importantly about the IGA, the chronically ill don't come at all. Mm -hmm. Right? And so that allows us to move those more healthy individuals uh, off the floor into a more humane environment and then even free up medical beds in our own facility, free up additional beds so that we can take care of those that have the chronic illnesses as well. Thank you. And so I, I look forward to hearing the number before you leave today for the people on the floor in Union City, just so we have that. And I was just curious, would... Um, the ju the, if we were the uh, as we continue the conversation, is the Justice Review Board? I don't know if you can speak on behalf of them, but I'd be curious if they'd be open to allowing people from the Georgia Justice Project. They've I know they've offered three full-time employees to assist with data gathering. Is that something the board or Fulton County would be open to? Well, I don't speak for them, mm -hmm. and I can't speak for them because I was not invited to be on the board, invited to participate, wasn't invited to the meeting. So and I will follow up with them I'm on an outside question. looking in, but I wanted to make sure. And that's the reason I, I, I don't want you to feel like I'm inundating you with data, but I have the data. And so why hold on to it? And so I don't want, we can get all kind of professors from Harvard and, and Yale and wherever else they come from, Mo House, just not my house. And understand that we're focusing on getting you the information, and that's our goal. And that's the only thing that we, we're committed to doing and from that perspective. I, want to, I, I know you're a data person. I got it. I received that. I understand that, right? Because it, you heard me say earlier, right? Everybody's entitled to their own opinions, but not their own facts. And I want you to have in your hand, right? If you go through the email that, that uh, President Shipman sent out, Right, that point in time was just that point in time where you can see when you go through some of those misdemeanors, right? 
They're aggravated in nature. I won't tell you the system's not broken. I absolutely will tell you the system is broken. And we're caught in the middle of this churn. I'm just telling you, we have to work together to figure out something. So currently, it's 36 young ladies sleeping on the floor at Union City. 36? 36. After, those, after the 36 off the floor are moved, will we then move on to the people sleeping on the floor in Rice Street? Is that the, is that the order? No, no. So the whole th plan is to move all of the Union City <laughs> females, young ladies, from Union City to... Right. So, and that's a great point. And so uh, Mr. Schultz just reminded me, all of Union City are females, mm -hmm. right? So the plan is to move all of the ladies out of Union City, period. Right, which means those 36 will be off the floor in addition to bed space and programmatic space for the remaining young ladies over at, at Union City. And then, as we continue to open up a unit after unit, mm -hmm. the men will come off the floor. So we didn't preset the, the time frame, right? That's why you hear people say, well, take them till the, till the middle of, you know, Christmas or, or middle right. of New Year to, to get some, start getting people off the floor. We didn't come up with the time frame. If they let me move 700 people tomorrow, that duck I was talking about, I can show you. Hook it up. Let's do it. Thank you. Council Member Waits. To Council Member Boone's point, again, we all share a desire to get individuals off the floor, but I think we also have a fiscal and fiduciary responsibility. And I believe the report that was offered in the amendment will assist us in terms of making sure that that data is correct and to also address some of the issues that I raised earlier with respect to the three populations of individuals that I believe will decrease that number of 1,000 individuals to aid us in getting these folks off the floor. And so it's my hope that we move forward with this particular review. And based upon the information today, I don't believe it has to take 90 days to do that. Thank you. Councilmember Lewis, did you withdraw? Councilmember Bond. Sheriff, I want to thank you again for coming over here. You know, this was a surprise. We didn't know you were coming. And we're glad, I'm glad you were here to make yourself available uh, for the questions of our colleagues. And for our new colleagues that came on, I just want to point out that we did try to do this last year. We did try to have this conversation last year. The previous administration, we actually passed, uh, I think it was unanimous a resolution that if the sheriff and the then mayor didn't come to an agreement that we would get into moving forward. Uh, but the previous administration was recalcitrant. And of course, there were people living on the floor existing in inhumane conditions then. So in respect to everyone's passions, you know, that's why some of us are passionate about moving ahead because we've been dealing with this for years. Uh, Sheriff, I'd, I'd like to, to ask you if you can explain uh, the difference between ACDC as a structure and jail philosophy and that of the existing Fulton County Jail and how for those who are concerned that any incarceration is bad incarceration, that how direct supervision is a more humane alternative to housing people so and I'll, I'll be brief right and let me start by saying this for and you and I know you remember vividly I was when we moved from 236 Peachtree Street to 254 Peachtree Street 236 is much like 901 Rice right Street now it is linear in its structure meaning you crowd 40 50 people in a room you shut the door behind you and you go to the next unit where uh, mostly out of sight is, is where you are. When we began to build and populate ACDC, it was built at, it, at the peak of what modern day jails were, meaning it was direct supervision. You put a person in there, a, a correction officer inside with the detainees, 24 hours, seven days a week. It was their unit. It became, for, for me, it became a, a, a source of pride. 
My unit had to be the cleanest. My unit had to be uh, really the best in the entire facility, period. I did not believe that we could move people off the floor. This was young me. Didn't believe we could move people off the floor, treat them like they're human. Now, these are same individuals that are tearing up 236 Peachtree Street, metal doors, stainless steel toilets, et cetera. But when we get, began to treat them like they were human, we were able to move into a modern facility, and that facility as a whole has wooden doors, has ceramic toilets, et cetera. And you have somebody individually in there that's responsible for making sure on a day-to-day -day basis that our staff is safe, that those that we have the responsibility of care and custody for. In fact, any time the detainees are out of their units, right, these individuals are out of their units, out of their cells, the actual detention officer is up walking around. That's the premise of direct supervision. And in that space, you're allowed to interact and you become auntie them, mama them, lawyer them, all them nims, because you've been there, Councilman Bond, you, you become this humanistic factor that allows people to understand that I can have a conversation. We don't just slam the door behind them like we do now, right? We slam the door, go to the next unit, and we hope that the biggest and the baddest person in that unit does not try to harm somebody. We do a great job of classifying individuals. We can do a better job, let me absolutely be clear. But when, that, when you shut the door behind that individual, like if you got more than one kid, right, and your kid's in the same room, you know they act the way you're supposed to act when you're around, right? You know they're supposed to, when you're around, when mama them around, uncle them around, families around, they act like they're supposed to act. And then equally as important is that when we have, and that's, and that's the piece about direct supervision. Direct supervision is predicated upon treating individuals based on their behavior. Again, I didn't think it was possible. When we moved from one facility to the other, I thought it was a waste of time. But right now, you'll take, it'll need my own SWAT team to come out of a direct supervision process. And that's what we're hoping to get when we, we have to build a new facility. All right? We have to treat people like they're human and, and to be very specific. Right? If you can imagine shutting the door behind you when you leave and not knowing everything that's going on in your home with 30 or 40 people in there, as opposed to having somebody that's in charge and running that and helping you get through these processes. And so again, it provides more of a humane environment as we continue to push. And we continue to, I mean, it is one of those things that we certainly can, can focus on. And again, right, at, at times when you may recall, we did this with the numbers of inmates that people thought we couldn't do it. There were times where there were 72 inmates in there and five northeast with me, five northwest with you, and, and we competed. And those people knew that we had their best interests at heart. And so that's our goal is to really move away from this draconian process of just locking people in a cell, helping them. Every, every unit has an outdoor rec unit, right? So you are not in a space where you could just get outdoor rec time when we could afford to shut down a unit, bring extra staff up, and move you to an outdoor rec site. Every unit had a law library or access via computer. Right? So again, an opportunity for us to b provide better services. I hope that well, begins just to the answer. I wanted to follow up on that to give an example. Is for the same time that the original Fulton County Jail is open and operating, measured against the same time that ACDC mm -hmm. in this philosophy of direct supervision has been operating, which building has uh, had more damage? And that's a really great where. That's a really great point. One, one thing with direct supervision, because you have an officer or deputy directly engaging with those that are housed there, every single person that comes in, you have to do an a cell inspection report. If the light's out, we can fix it, right? If the water doesn't work, we can, we can shut it down, we can fix it, right? 
901 Rice Street has been torn to pieces. No fault of anybody in here. But just today, and I'll be glad to send it to you, Mr. President, if you want to send it out. Just today, you might think it was a scene out of Shawshank Redemption. There was a panel, if you can imagine, on these nice, beautiful judges panels you all have right here, that's the width of three different cells. And these are cinder blocks, right? So I won't leave it to your imagination. I will, I will make sure you have it. But enough room for people to crawl between cells cause harm on somebody you know, outside and then crawl back in, right? Needless to say, we just got this over the weekend. You know, I had the most exciting job in the country, let me tell you. So we got this over the weekend, we shut down the sales and we're looking at, but again, how do you repair something like that? And we'll get you uh, that, just that visual itself is to your point, staff on staff assaults are down when you build and, and house and direct supervision. It made on staff assaults a down. Uh, yeah, I said that right. You know, and, and routinely these things dissipate. And so when you treat people like they're human, they respond like they're human. And conversely, if you don't treat them like they're human, they don't respond like they're human. And so we have to move away from, from, from this draconian, you know, year over end. Doesn't say we cannot do at the same time some of the things that, that Councilmember Waits talked about. We absolutely can. But, the, but understanding 31 years of experience come along, comes a long way with how you treat people and importantly, their living conditions and the ability to respond. Look, I can't even get those sales re repaired without either moving people to Cobb, moving them to a different area. That's why it's important to make sure that we have uh, operating capacity that allows us to do that. So I, I hope that's... So waiting for this outside committee to, in turn, you're going to give them the information because it's the only place they can go to get it. And so waiting for us to receive it from them impairs our ability to get people off the floor. Is that a fair statement? It's absolutely fair. Okay. Well, I'm going to close, Mr. President, by, by just making a statement. Um, I remember a day when the city of Atlanta in Fulton County worked hand in hand on a lot of issues. When the population control was good at Fulton County, uh, then Mayor Maynard Jackson, and then County Commission Chair Michael Lomax had worked out an agreement uh, to help to defer uh, the population in Fulton County. Some 20, 25 years later, early 2000s, that agreement was done away with, and we've had the chaos of what to do with uh, our jail and how Fulton County is going to handle their overcrowding. But I'll submit to my colleagues and the public, for those who don't want to be in the jail business, as long as you have a police department, as long as you have a court, it's going to require a jail. And so either we can be a debtor city by leasing space for inmates, or we can do what we've done now, take the economy route and operate our own facility. Fulton County, Atlanta is in 90% of Fulton County. So if we don't think that this is our problem, it is, and we're already paying for the issues that the sheriff has, except for those who live on the far east side of the extreme east side of the city. They're not, they're in DeKalb County. Uh, but 90% of us are. And so we all have a vested interest in resolving this and working with our county partners as quickly as possible. But I'll, I'll also dip over and say, you know, a lot of the issues about the bonds and the releases, the sheriff is just the uh, operator. You know, most of this uh, problems when people have issues is with the courts. And when we had that agreement, the city and the county under Jackson and Lomax, our courts were providing first appearance hearings for uh, the arrestees who were, due, who were there on felony and state charges. And that prevented a lot of people from going to jail or ending up in jail because they got a first appearance, they got a bond within 24 hours, 
they were released. And of course, we we've had a a what what do they call it uh, um, pretrial release program, which is quote unquote bail reform for like 25 years. And our bail reform law is a sham. 80% failure rate for people to show up in court. 80%. That's a failure. Okay. And it needs to be fixed. We need to sit back down, uh, members of the public safety, our president, our mayor, with those at Fulton County on the commission, the sheriff's office, and the courts, and work to see how we can, of course, activists who have great ideas, uh, how we can repair this broken relationship that we've had with Fulton County. Because uh, it did work at one point. And, you know, there's an old African proverb, and I'm going to close with this. When elephants fight, it's the grass that suffers. As we debate and talk, people are sleeping on the floor. And they're, they're on the floor. Nobody should sleep on the floor. And the longer this takes in, in debating and shifting back and forth through a committee that's, you know, I mean, it's not even an official committee of the charter for the city of Atlanta, waiting for them to give us information that we could get, pardon the pun, from the horse's mouth, Mr. Uh, Mr. Sheriff. Uh, you know, we got the information right here. It, at a certain point, it comes a time to act. And, you know, this is a long train. It's been going on a long while. But as I said last year, last May, you know, we need to deal with this now. Now. It is inhumane. The previous administration is gone. They cared more about people on the border than they did people a mile and a half away. And that's why they did that. And it's incorrigible that they did not act. So I, I hope I'm going to have some legislation today to try to move the process. No disrespect to any member of council, but it's time to act. You can get the information via open records request, or hell, the sheriff will just give it to you to know who's in there. Thank you, Thank Sheriff you. Labatt. Thank you. Councilmember Lewis. Thank you, uh, Sheriff. To clear up some things, I know you've mentioned uh, uh, Union City a lot. And I, I've read why we say Union City, but I would like for you to uh, tell us why we're choosing to move folks from, move the ladies, uh, the women from Union City before we move uh, folks from Rice Street. So, great answer. So, great question. So, part of the IGA, and as we went back and forth with the administration, the concern was to make sure we did have the staffing. And so, Years before you and I got elected, the county purchased the Union City Jail, right? which in deference to the mayor in Union City, we call the South Annex. He doesn't want it called Union City Jail. <laughs> he got out of the jail business. Uh, we're moving those young ladies. So we're moving all the services that go along with them, whether it be programmatic services, feeding, medical, et cetera. So we're just simply moving that. And then as we stage and as we staff up, we can provide additional beds to those that are sleeping on the floor. And then point of clarification, uh, when we move nine more young ladies from 901 Rice Street today uh, to Union City or the South Annex, we will have 45 young ladies on, on the floor. So to that extent, we're using an economy of scale. We can move the ladies, get them out of some of the, the um, again, some of the, some of the circumstances that they've been in, right, over to, to ACDC, provide a more humane environment, keep the same staff, staff up. And again, the, the beauty of direct supervision goes back to what Councilman Bond asked is each unit takes about four people to run on a 24-hour cycle, all right? And we do 12 hours, so it's really three and a half, including vacation, sick time, whatever that looks like. So as we hire three or four people, we can assign them there. They can learn accordingly, and then we can open up a 46-unit, I was going to say man, but 46, in this case, man pod, right? Or an 80-man pod 
Just depends. That's the structure of the building that will allow us to then get more people off the floor. And, and I'm under the impression that uh, I was told that the building, you have to rebuild the building or something in Union City? No. So here in lies the opportunity. And that is as we vacate the building, we won't shutter the building. We will provide more modern resources, right? Because I don't want to get to a space where four years comes and go. Councilman Lewis wants these folks out to jail, right? I got it. We have a, a plan B. I always do things with a plan A and plan B, right? right? So it goes back to your question a few moments ago, and that is we can withdraw as quickly as we can come in. I, right? It's the first time I've heard even, even that portion. I, I guess that's why I'm happy we're having this open discussion because uh, we need activists to help to uh, be a part of this portion. I, I've never heard that that uh, four years from now, Councilman Lewis is going to be upset and say it's time for us to go, and we already going to have a space. First time I've heard that. And I want you to hold me accountable for that. I mean, that's how I go. I'm not I'm voting for this stuff uh, okay. because I, I I don't think it's going to be difficult. It's going to be very difficult to hold you accountable to it. Uh, no, so, it, it won't but, be. But I want to I mean, at least make sure we get all the information out there because uh, uh, it's clear that's the easiest vote ever for me, one of the easiest votes for me. Uh, the second question I had was, uh, per the agreement, uh, you can't move uh, mentally ill folks to ACDC. And so uh, where would the mentally ill and the severely ill or the severely ill uh, per, uh, go? So, again, we, we have units that are dedicated for do we have enough? Absolutely not. Right. Six, two percent of the people that come in have had some level of mental capacity evaluation and or concerns. Right. It's, it's not unpopular and it's, it, to, for people to say, because it's the truth, jails have become the mental health institutions of our state, right? So we have to collectively continue to push to open up uh, services in that space. But again, it's something we can do simultaneously. And so to get people off the floor allows us to put those that have mental health concerns really in a space that's more conducive. What does that look like? So. And lastly, I want to say thank you for the PAT-3 program. I didn't know that was the program that my father was a part of that had him have, the only time I've ever known him to have a job was when he was actually in jail. And so I want to say I appreciate you for that program. I want to know how we can max that program out now. Uh, I want to max it out, particularly with, them, with our young folks, our 17, uh, our 17 year olds that you have down there. Thank it you is, again. No, thank you. And, and I certainly appreciate that. It is. It is something that will come with space. And what I mean is where we are now, we can't add more people to it, right? For the ones that were not around when we introduced PAT-3, before we started with city detainees, we partnered with the state, and we got cohorts of 20 individuals at a time. They gave us 1,600 people to choose from that would get out in 18 months or, or less, get out of a state facility, 18 months or less. And we made them city employees. And so they began to work on their retirement while they were city employees. And they were out delivering uh, or they were out collecting trash. They were out learning skills with our watershed management teams. Right? This was groundbreaking. And it, we will continue to get back to that space. Certainly the new build will have that in place right? and diversionary accordingly. But again, that's something that we could even do at ACDC. Thank you. Councilmember Overstreet. Well, actually, um, since we are having this impromptu work session, I, and I, it just came to my attention that, um, you know, people, some of my colleagues weren't familiar with the PAT-3. I was really just getting in line to um, ask you to expound on it a little more because, you know, council is half new. So we should let them know that you, you've done some tremendous work, and this is not about locking up all um, individuals that aren't doing right by the cities. It's, it's about the full wraparound. And um, so I, just, I was really just asking uh, to ask you to expound on PAT-3, because people might think we're talking about you, since it says <laughs> PAT. Well, like, uh, what's the acronym for it? I, I agree. And, and so I have to thank the dynamic team that came up with it. It was preparing adult offenders to transition through training and therapy. And so we partnered with the state. Again, if you had 15 to 18 months left on your sentence, preferably nonviolent sentence, 
you came, the first thing you did, the first thing you did, which should be interesting to uh, Councilmember Batiari, the first thing we did was you had to do community service while you were in jail. And so we took that cohort 20 at a time and cleaned the city. We picked up trash. We removed graffiti. That was their payment to the city. You did. And you did a great job doing it. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. But it was the team that came in and said, listen, in order for us to give and, and, and have these folks earn city jobs, let's, let's give them some community service while they were doing community service. And so we cleaned up tons and tons of trash. Right? I have to go back and pull the statistics. Last count, enough trash to fill up 62 of the largest city dump trucks available. We removed graffiti at the, at, the, at the drop of a phone call or a text message. And so to that end, when they earned that right, they became city employees. They, became, they were able to get on the city pension plan. More importantly, they were able to start paying child support. Right? So we were affecting families and changing lives, and that was greater than we hoped. And so I do absolutely, we want to, we want to get back to that. And, and already the administration knows, because uh, I'm, I'm that kind of guy, uh, we, we own the Pat 3 rights. So we are going to push it from the Fulton County side. We hope that this will certainly impact and have a positive impact on the city as we continue to move forward. Councilmember Waits. Councilmember Waits. Thank you, Mr. President. So there's a lot of conversation surrounding what we do in terms of addressing the mentally ill in terms of Union City. It's my understanding that the memorandum or the agreement have some very specifics concerning that, which is one of the reasons that we are supporting this 90-day review. Councilmember Norwood. When you wanted to make changes in your district with respect to the SPLOS, I supported that because I believe you are the best person to make those decisions concerning your district. Councilmember Bond, when there was a spirited debate regarding ATAG 3, I supported that because I believe, given that you are the original author, you are the best person to make those decisions in terms of the amendments that uh, Councilmember Wan wanted to put forth. So you made the statement regarding it's time to act. We did. This body passed a piece, an amendment, that stated that we will put in place a 90-day review to protect those very individuals that we claim to care about and support today. For that reason, we voted that up and it passed this particular body. So I'm not sure what the act is that we need to do that we haven't already done. We also know that it doesn't take 90 days to complete this review. We're very clear about that. We just simply need the information to get it to the individuals who are going to do this study of some type. So it's my hope that we will stand by what we've already done in this body, which is to support the 90-day review. Sheriff Labatt, I support you. I support your intent. But I believe that this is a policy conversation that needs to be worked out among this particular body. I appreciate the lengthy period of time that you've come and spent and your willingness to go on the record in terms of answering questions. I do not support the city of Atlanta turning that building over to Fulton County by any means but I'm one person, and I will always support the will of this body. And if that is to do so, I will support that and stand behind you 100%. But I do believe that it is reckless and that we break our fiduciary responsibility to not complete that particular study and that review that's been asked and put in place. And I thank you again for your time. Thank you. Councilor Bond. Thank you, Council Member Ways. I'm going to respond because you call me out but um, you made my example for me when you talked about the ATAG situation and you supported me and I, I appreciate it I was the author of that legislation and at the time the maker of the amendment hadn't talked to me about anything in a part of that well the exact same situation happened with this legislation I was the author of the legislation for the IGA, and the person who made that amendment never spoke to me about it, never asked me if I thought it was okay, say, hey, how do you feel about this, which is uh, I've, I've experienced as a custom on being on city council, the kind of deference that you would pay the, you know, the author of a paper. 
So you're making my point for me. It is the time to act. I didn't support that amendment. I didn't vote for that amendment. Wasn't aware that that amendment was going to be made. Uh, and if I had uh, been quicker, would have sought to have been recognized to speak against that amendment for the very reason why we're here today. And so I've got a paper prepared that's going to be introduced uh, to remove that amendment because I believe people ought to be off the floor, you know, immediately. I have worked in corrections. I've actually worked in a worse jail than Fulton County. It is the jail that is now the Gateway Center. It was four times overcrowded when I came to work there in August of 1989. Uh, my, I worked the floors with the current sheriff. Uh, most of the time, I worked the floors by myself. It had four, four floors in the building. The fourth floor, which was the largest floor, and it had a gym in the building, uh, it was packed with men and one officer to patrol it. So when I wasn't in a quad, uh, God only knows what went on when I wasn't there and wasn't present. It was like that on the third floor of the building. Every conceivable space. The room that had the vending machines had people sleeping on the floor, right? Uh, on the third floor. Every conceivable space. Even sometimes on the outside of the building. So I've watched in my life experience people having to exist in the conditions that exist at Fulton County at this very moment. And for me, and we, and we all want to recognize each other's passions, this is my passion. People should not exist on that. I was injured on the job defending not only the sheriff from Bobby Brown. That's it's true. <laughs> I'm trying to bring some levity, but does that actually happen? But a guy that I just told, was told by the corrections to have the kissing bandit. This guy was 6'8". He was huge. He would run around five points. He would grab people, and he would kiss them. I mean, literally, he'd pick them up and kiss them. My knuckles are gone because I had to defend other staff from him. My knuckles are gone again because I had to fight two inmates who were trying to jump on another inmate in intake. In 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 Both of them were HIV. So there there there's tremendous danger not only for the people who are on the floor, sleeping on the boats, but there's tremendous danger for those who work there. And of course, on any given day, 60 to 90% of the cases that are at the Fulton County Jail are cases that come out of the city of Atlanta. The majority of those inmates, nine times out of 10, 50 to 75% of them are city of Atlanta residences. You know, if this had been, I hate to keep talking about back in the day, but if it, if it were back in the day, we wouldn't be here. The mayor would have signed an executive order giving the sheriff access to the facility to help with the overcrowding, because that's what happened with Maynard Jackson and Michael Lomax. If we wouldn't be having this debate. We wouldn't be deferring to, quote unquote, outside experts uh, to, to, to define data that we can get directly from the sheriff. We would just not be doing it. And then we would have a heart and concern, and then we'd use that heart and concern in our, our effort to get people off the floor. Now, I have appeal based on race. I have appeal based on reason. I have appeal based on policy argument. But it is inhumane, and I've been doing it prior to your class, you know, coming on to the city council. So it's not new for me. And so, you know, my passion has been burning slightly longer, uh, I guess, on this issue as it is, you know, delivered here, right? And so I know for the life of me, I can't think why responsible leaders, and I'm just going to say it, responsible leaders in the administration, on the city council, uh, won't cooperate with the sheriff and the commission and give him the space he needs because, as I said, 90% of Atlanta is in Fulton County. And where I was raised and brought up in politics, you cooperated with your sister government to make things happen. And so, you know, I'm, a, I'm astonished that we're still here. I'm astonished that people, you know, and everybody's entitled to their own opinion, 
and I don't want to offend anybody, but I don't understand why other people don't understand what I'm saying. I don't understand because we have the power to change that situation today. We have the, the power to ameliorate that suffering right now. And yet, we don't act. Yet that amendment was offered that you know, basically threw a, a log in front of the train to try to make this happen to, to, to erase human suffering. For the advocates that come down here and say, oh, we don't want uh, more incarceration. We don't want, I mean, how can you say that in the same breath and people sleeping on the floor? There was a guy that came down here a couple of months ago, said there was somebody with Fulton County with a bond for $25. So oh, somebody came to the Public Safety Committee. And I said, in my mind, I'm like, dude, why don't you just pay the $25? If you're serious about ameliorating, you know, or changing the condition of that person. You know, the double, you know it's, for me, the time for the conversation is over. And you really, like I said, you really made my point. If the legislation was kept the way the author of the legislation would want it, we wouldn't have been here, right? We, 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 we would not be here today. The sheriff would be making moves to get the women off the floor down there in a, in a terrible facility down there in Union City. Those 39 women would, 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 would begin to have a place to stay in a bed, and then we'd be further along on Council allowing President, I believe that the council get, member has made his point. Can we please move this along? I didn't interrupt anybody, Mr. President. I don't appreciate that. Councilmember Bakhtiari, with it, we're in committee of the whole. There are no limits. Right, and I don't appreciate that. You know, I, I listen to everybody's opinion. Don't agree with them all the time, but I listen. Right? And so, you know, again, we don't want to devolve what the city council has met up to this point. We don't want to devolve this chamber and the august status and stature that it has. Atlanta is not College Park, okay? It's not Decatur. It's, it's, it, it's not Bug Tussle, like on the Beverly Hills. But it's no place else like this place. And there's a decorum, there's a respect that we as members have to show one another. Because everybody else around the state of Georgia and Southeast looks to us. And we cannot devolve away from that. Now, as I close, Mr. President, I will say that I appreciate you bringing up the issue, uh, Council Member Waits, though we, we disagree. But as I said, you, you've made my point for me. We would not be here if not for that amendment. And it is my right as a legislature, as a member of the legislature, to bring forth legislation to amend the code of ordinances or our list of resolutions and policies, just like every other member. And so at the end of the meeting, I will do that because it personally disturbs me, having worked four and a half years in a correctional environment and watched the atrocities that were there, including people sleeping on the floor for all types of offenses from peeing on the sidewalk to murder. No human being should, if, if we can change that situation, it's my desire, my, in my heart, that we should do so as quickly as possible. The information will still be there, but we can at least ameliorate that suffering. And don't think that they don't watch these meetings on cable 26 in those facilities across the street and over at Rice Street. Those are citizens, and their families are watching these discussions. Their, our constituents have got their people over there at Rice Street, and they wonder, and they've said to me when they drive up to HelloFresh or I see them out at Kroger or wherever, why can't they get these folks off the floor? I watched the meeting. I don't understand. And all I can tell them is what, repeat what colleagues say. But we need to act and I'm imploring the body to do so. I withdraw, Mr. Chair. Councilmember Waits. Mr. President, two things. I will keep my remarks brief for those who've been here all day. Uh, and I do appreciate all of the passion that's been demonstrated here today and the in 
significance and urgency of the conversation. But what I do reject is the notion that, given that we are a freshman class, that somehow we're not committed to this issue. I reject that. I was elected, not respectfully, I didn't mean any disrespect, this is friendly. I was elected in 2012. Not one time have I ever came into this body and said that across the street we've passed triple or even double the amount of pieces of legislation that this body passes because it's not really relevant. The question today is, is whether or not we are impacting or influencing good or bad policy. The reason that I believe that the amendment was offered is because we wanted to make the best out of what some of us believe to have been bad policy. And I don't speak for the author right now, but I do believe it's bad policy. And so for that reason, that particular amendment passed, just as you're going to offer one today. Now, you mentioned Gateway earlier, which closed because we built another facility. You said that several decades ago, individuals were on the floor. I submit to you that once we do this agreement, they will still be on the floor. I submit to you 10 years from now, they will still be on the floor because obviously, each administration has dealt with the same issue because we all know that we're not getting to the root of the issues, which is the cadre of people that I've referenced earlier because there's a bigger issue at play. Now, I don't direct this to you. I think everyone in here needs to take whatever decision they choose to take. But I do think it's important to recognize that all of us were elected by the citizens of Atlanta to be their voice. And I believe that when that amendment was offered, that we were speaking for those individuals who feel that they have not been heard in this conversation. For the folks who've come down here for weeks and weeks and weeks and said, this is what we want to see happen. There are many things that we're going to agree on. This is just not one of them today. And I look forward to hearing uh, the amendment that you will offer. Thank you. Councilmember Norwood. Yes, um, Sheriff, when you talk about PAT3, you say it so quickly. Um, that I would like, you know, to, to repeat, and I think I've got it correct, because I think it is a wonderful acronym. Um, what I've written down is preparing adults through treatment and therapy. And the T, the PAT-3, is the through treatment and, th and therapy. Is that correct? Therapy. Is it an acronym? Treatment, therapy, and training. Thank you. I That's knew I missed one. something. Okay. <laughs> so preparing adults through treatment, therapy, and training. Okay. It really was a great program that you did at the city's detention center. And, um, and it's one of the reasons that I support your move to have that kind of better treatment and training and therapy for your, for your um, clients, inmates, offenders. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Westmoreland. Motion to move out of Committee of the Whole. There's a motion by Councilmember Westmoreland to move out of Committee of the Whole. There's a second by Councilmember Juan. This is actually not debatable. <clears throat> so we'll move directly into a vote. Uh, and it takes an eight vote majority to move out of Committee of the Whole. Madam Deputy Clerk, please open the vote. One moment, please. The vote is open. Will everyone please vote? Will all council members please vote? Twelve yeas, zero nays. Twelve yeas, zero nays. The motion to move out of committee of the whole carries. Uh, we'll now move back to the agenda as it has been amended to the public safety report. Mr. President, I'm proud to say we have no report. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Vice Chair Amos. 
We'll now move back to the agenda. We are at the report of the journal. Madam Deputy Clerk, would you please offer the report of the journal? Thank you, I, Vanessa Walden, Deputy Municipal Clerk, hereby do certify that the action minutes of the September 19th, 2022 City Council meeting are true and correct. If there are no additions or corrections, I'd entertain a motion to adopt the minutes. Moved by Councilmember Juan, seconded by Councilmember Bakhtiari. Is there any discussion? We can do this via unanimous consent. Is there any objection to unanimous consent on the motion to adopt the minutes? Hearing none, Madam Deputy Clerk, please sound the county unanimous consent. 12 yeas, zero nays. 12 yeas, zero nays. The motion to adopt the minutes carries. We'll now move to communications. Council President, I'd like to take items one and two together, please. Without objection, please proceed. 22C5161, a communication from Mayor Andre Dickens appointing Mr. Theotis Pace to serve as a member of the Ex Exploratory Committee to determine an appropriate manner in which to honor the legacy of former Atlanta City Council member Jim Maddox. 22C5162, a communication from Sheila Maddox, representative of the Maddox family, submitting the appointment of Dr. Gerald Durley to serve as a member of the Exploratory Committee to determine an appropriate manner in which to honor the legacy of the former Atlanta City Council member, Jim Maddox. Both items are staff recommendation to accept and file. Let both items follow that course. <laughs> Item number three, 22C5163, a communication from Council President Doug Shipman appointing Ms. Cardin Wyckoff to serve as a member of the Human Relations Commission. This appointment is for the term of three years. Staff recommendation is to refer to Committee on Council. Let it follow that course. <laughs> Last item, 22C5164, a communication from the Mayor Andre Dickens appointing Mr. I'm sorry, Ms. Tarlisha Smith to serve as a Commissioner of Human Resources for the City of Atlanta. Staff recommendation is to refer to Finance Executive Committee and the Committee on Council. Let it follow that course. That concludes communications. Thank you. Is there any con uh, con legislation, uh, vetoed legislation for consideration? No, sir. Is there any unfinished business? No, sir. Thank you. With that, we'll move to our consent agenda section one, which can be found starting on page four of the documentation for today. These are ordinances for second reading. Uh, I will ask first if there are any of these to be removed from the consent agenda by my colleagues, Councilmember Norwood. Yes, um, on page 14, item number 16, it's 22R-4252. 22-R-4252, Councilmember yes. Dozier. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, want to remove item number 15 on page 14 is resolution 22-R-4411. Remove 22-R-4411. Uh, any others, colleagues? Hearing none, I would entertain a motion to adopt the consent agenda section one with those two items removed. Moved by Councilmember Juan, seconded by Councilmember Bakhtiari. Any discussion on the motion to adopt? Madam Deputy Clerk, please open the vote on the motion to adopt the consent agenda section one with the two items as enumerated removed. The vote is now open. Will everyone please vote? vote is now closed. 12 yeas, zero nays. 12 yeas, zero nays. The motion to adopt the consent agenda section one carries. Council member uh, Juan. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, colleagues, there are two items that uh, the administration has asked us to send to the uh, mayor's office for signature post haste. They're both on page number nine. First one is 22-01741. Second one is 22-01743. These are financing papers for police vehicles. I'll make that motion to move to the mayor's office post haste. Second. 
There's a motion by Councilmember Juan, seconded by Councilmember Norwood to move 22-0-1741 and 22-0-1743 post haste. Any discussion? We can do this via unanimous consent without objection. Any objection to moving these two items post haste? Hearing none, Madam Deputy Clerk, please sound the count on unanimous consent. Unanimous consent is 13 yeas, zero nays. 13 yeas, zero nays. The motion to send post haste two items carries. We will now move to the consent agenda section two. It begins on page 25 of the materials. These are items for first reading. The appropriate motion will be to refer, but first I'll ask my colleagues if any of these items need to be removed. Therefore, I'd entertain a, a motion to refer. Moved by Councilmember Bakhtiari, seconded by Councilmember Juan. Any discussion on the motion to refer the consent agenda section two? Hearing none, we'll move to vote. Madam Deputy Clerk, please open the vote on the motion to refer the consent agenda section two. The vote is open. Will everyone please vote? The vote is closed. 13 yeas, zero nays. 13 yeas, zero nays. The motion to refer carries. Uh, since we already had the Public Safety and Legal Administration Committee's report, we'll move to the City Utilities Committee, and Councilmember Winston will be bringing the report today in the absence of Chair Shook. Thank you, Mr. President. Serving as the Vice Vice Chair of CD Utilities today, uh, in the absence of Chair Shook and Vice Chair Hillis, um, I have Resolution 22-R-4336, uh, um, a substitute resolution by CD Utilities Committee authorizing the mayor or his designee to execute the third amendment to agreement EA-S-121-0103, Emergency right away maintenance with Russell Landscape LLC on behalf of the Department of Public Works to add funding for continued right away maintenance services in an amount not to exceed seven hundred fifty thousand dollars and zero cents, and all contracted work to be charged to and paid from various funds, department, and organization and account numbers listed herein and for other purposes. This came out of favorable out of the committee with five yeas and two nays, as amended. This moves forward out of committee 22-R-4336 favorably. It doesn't need a second. Is there any discussion on the motion to adopt? Councilmember Bakhtiari. Just quickly for the record, I believe that um, we did say, I want it again stated for the record that when this is presented again before council, that the contractors are present at full council. I just want it stated again for the record. Thank you. Any other discussion on the motion to adopt? Hearing none, we'll move to a vote. Madam Deputy Clerk, please open the vote on the motion to adopt 22-R-4336 as amended. The vote is open. We got you. Will everyone please vote? Thirteen yeas, zero nays. Thirteen yeas, zero nays. The motion to adopt carries. Thank you, Mr. President. That concludes my report. Thank you, Vice Vice Chair. Yes, Winston. Uh, next up, we'll have the CDHS Committee, Chair Dozier. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I have one item uh, for my report. Uh, this was item 22-R-4411, which was pulled off the consent agenda. Uh, this item has a uh, substitute attached to it. Uh, or, uh, colleagues, you should have received that about maybe 10 minutes ago in your inbox, about 15 minutes ago in your inboxes. And this is essentially is to uh, fix some account strings. So I'll read off the caption as it reads right now, and we will 
uh, move into the next steps. But this is, once again, 22-R-4411, a resolution by the Community Development Human Services Committee authorizing the mayor or his designee on behalf of the Department of, Department of Parks and Recreation to enable a donation in a total amount not to exceed $50,000 and zero cents to Chastain Horse Park a Georgia nonprofit corporation in order to support its mission of empowering riders of all abilities through life-changing relationships with horses from the accounts listed therein and for other purposes. And as mentioned, uh, we do have a substitute that you were emailed. Uh, I would like to motion to bring forth the substitute. Second, oh, sorry. There's a motion to bring forth the substitute for 22-R-4411 by Councilmember Dozier. There's a second by Councilmember Wan. They're very eager. Um, is there any discussion on the motion to bring forth the substitute? Hearing none, we'll move to a vote. Madam Deputy Clerk, please open the vote on the motion to substitute. The vote is open. Will everyone please vote? Will everyone please vote? The vote is closed. 13 yeas, zero nays. 13 yeas, zero nays. The motion to bring forth the substitute carries. Thank you, Mr. President. And uh, just to note that the caption does not change for the substitute, so I'll go ahead and move to adopt as substituted. So motion to adopt 22-R-4411 as substitute. Is there a second? Seconded by Councilmember Wan. Is there any discussion on the motion to adopt? Hearing none, we'll move to a vote. Madam Deputy Clerk, please open the vote on the motion to adopt 22-R-4411 as substituted. The vote is open. Will all members please vote? The vote is closed. 13 yeas, zero nays. 13 yeas, zero nays. The motion to adopt carries. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, just one announcement that I would like to make. Uh, it was alluded to before during public comment about uh, a vigorous citywide discussion that is occurring right now with regards to MPU boundaries. Uh, C the Department, uh, Community Development Human Services Committee will be hosting a work session on NPU redistricting later in the month. Uh, it'll be on October 27th, 11 o'clock a.m. And just due to the uh, amount of passion and uh, energy around this particular item, we will be hosting it here in the city council chamber. So I just wanted to make the public aware about that work session. That concludes my report. Thank you, Chair Dozier. Uh, next, we'll move to the Transportation Committee. Uh, Chair Faroki, who is with us virtually. Thank you, President Shipman. We have uh, five items for plan. One that uh, Councilman Nord has um, pulled off of consent. The first one, uh, I'll leave it to Mr. Johnson to read it in, is 22 See item number one on page 38, 2201731713, anointed by Councilmember Byron Amos, authorizing the conversion of Chapel Street Southwest from a one way street to a two way street and for other purposes. And I believe this item uh, will be, should be filed per the, uh, the sponsor of the paper, so I will move to file it. There's a motion by Councilmember Bakhtiari, seconded. Sorry, who seconded? Seconded by Councilmember Amos to file 22-0-1713. Is there any discussion on the motion to file? Hearing none, we'll move to a vote. Do you think I have like strep throat? Or? Sorry? <laughs> we do sound a lot alike, though. I'll give them that. Oh, I'm sorry. Was it Councilmember Bakhtiari? No. Oh, it's Councilmember Faroki seconded. My apologies. <laughs> No, Councilmember, no, I'm sorry, let's get the record straight. Councilmember Faroki moved and Councilmember Amos seconded. Yes. Uh, I'm sorry. Um, 
Let's move to a vote on the motion to file 22-0-1713. Madam Deputy Clerk, please open the vote. The vote is open. The vote is closed. 13 yeas, zero nays. 13 yeas, zero nays. The motion to file carries. Item number two, page 38. 2201751, an ordinance by Council Member Jason Winston authorizing the mayor to accept and sign a grant agreement with the U.S. Department of Transportation in the amount of $16,460,000 in zero cents for the rebuilding American infrastructure with sustainability and liquidity discretionary grant to amend the fiscal year 2023 budget by adding to anticipations and appropriations in the amount of $16,460,000 in zero cents and for other purposes. This paper was moved forward on condition, favorable condition uh, provided that the Department of Finance provide um, account information. Um, I don't believe that condition has been met yet. Is that right, Mr. Johnson? Uh, yes, Mr. Chair, the conditions have not been met. Has not been met. Correct. Yeah, so I would I'd move to refer it back to committee then. There's a motion by Councilmember Faroki to refer to committee. Uh, there's a second by Councilmember Wan and many others. Uh, is there any discussion on the motion to refer? Mm, Councilmember Wan. So this may be for finance. What ha I mean, f f account strings aren't that hard to find or to have. I mean, uh, and I, I thought there was some time sensitivity on this grant. Yeah, so there's a coordination between finance and office of grants. Sorry, CFO Bala, can you just identify yourself? Thanks. Uh, Mohammed Bala, Chief Financial Officer. So this is going to require us to construct and develop a grants account, um, which is a more tedious process than identifying uh, an account string or an accounting source to accept the money. So that is a, a coordination between Department of Finance as well as the Department of Grants to construct those uh, project accounts to be put in place. There's certain mechanisms that have to be met. We didn't receive all the required documentation and requisite information to create such accounts. Therefore, we are asking this to be tabled so that we can get that information and proceed accordingly. Thank you for the clarification, Mr. CFO. Any other discussion on the motion to refer? Council Member Westmoreland. I do have a question. Um, you just used the words tabled. Is it, I don't want to lose a grant, so it's okay if we send it back or we need to table it? No, I mean, we, does it have to yeah, go back to committee? Refer to committee. Okay. I got lawyers okay. helping me. Does that matter? Very okay. team lawyers. Refer back to committee. Any other discussion on the motion to refer? Hearing none, we'll move to a vote. Madam Deputy Clerk, please open the vote on the motion to refer 22-0-1751 back to committee. The vote is open. Will everyone please vote? The vote is closed, 11 yeas, zero nays. Please reflect Councilmember Lewis as an aye. The corrected vote is 12 <laughs> yeas, zero nays. 12 yeas, zero nays, the motion to refer carries. Item number three, 22R4248, a resolution by Council Member Mary Norwood to clarify the project scope of the 2015 T Splash Project Moores Mill Road at West Wesley Road intersection improvements in order to make the, a three lane intersection and not a four lane intersection and for other purposes. So, this paper that Council Member Norwood has requested to be filed that is different than the paper she pulled off consent, which we'll hear in a second. Uh, I will move to file. 
There's a motion to file coming out of committee 22-R-4248. That doesn't need a second since it's coming out of committee. Any discussion on the motion to file? Hearing none, we'll move to a vote on the motion to file 22-R-4248. Madam Deputy Clerk, please open the vote. The vote is open. Mr. Dozier is an aye. The vote is closed. 13 yeas, zero nays. 13 yeas, zero nays. The motion to file carries. Item number four, 22R4417, an, an, an amended resolution by Transportation Committee authorizing the mayor or his designee to issue task order FC10640A-149 for contract FC10640A, job order contract and services with Astra Road Fox JLC joint venture for downtown <laughs> City Hall vicinity street resurfacing and associated street maintenance activities phase one and two, on behalf of the Department of Inter Enterprise Asset Management and the Atlanta Department of Transportation, an amount not to exceed $6,209,035.88, all contract work which shall be charged to and paid from the account numbers listed herein and for other purposes. So this paper was moved out of committee uh, with no recommendation as amended on, and on condition. The condition was for HLDOT to provide clarity on the funding for this contract and why the legislation was a walk-in. Um, there's still questions about uh, the source of the funding and what it may mean for other 2015 T-SPOS projects. Uh, I will move to refer this back to committee so we can have a deeper discussion about it. Councilmember Faroki, sorry, just to clarify, you're moving to refer back to committee, is that correct? Correct. There's a motion to refer back to committee. Is there a second? Seconded by Councilmember Westmoreland. Uh, is there a discussion on the motion to refer 22-R-4417 to committee? Uh, Councilmember Wan. Mr. Um, President, this oh, city attorney, I just wanted yes. to make it clear that um, the source of funding should be Renew, not the T-SPLOS. It's Renew Atlanta. And so the... Um, that, that was one of the things that needed to be clarified as opposed to T-SPLOS. Thank you. Uh, Council Member one. Yep, so I, I was just gonna, it sounded like there was unreadiness um, in terms of the funding source. Um, and I, I'm, I guess I'm curious because I, I thought that the communication that um, Commissioner Bomar sent us did clarify where it was coming from. Um, and we have the finance folks here. I, I just want us to give it a chance to discuss this if that's the only question, because if we send this back, I think it, the window of this opportunity closes on us. So I just um, don't know if finance wants to just an opportunity to clarify before we refer it back or, or make the decision for it back. But if that's the only question, then we have, we do have, I feel like we have the opportunity to get that answered now. Sure. Um, Mohammed Bala, Chief Financial Officer, and uh, this is uh, a renew 2015 bond funding. There is um, a mechanism that allows us to utilize those funding as paving is an approved uh, project uh, description in those bonds. The bond documents do allow for that. We worked with the Department of Transportation to identify projects that can temporarily be uh, placed on hold to allow for this project to proceed. There was a sense of urgency and a paving schedule that was um, outlined by the Department of Transportation. So we worked with them to identify an appropriate vehicle that can be utilized to, um, to, 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 to get this project um, moving forward. This project initially was in the TSPLOS 2.0 project descriptions, but we're, we're advanced funding it right now with the renewal funding, um, and we'll have to come back with another piece of paper that will uh, replenish the renew from the original project source. 
This keeps everything in the Department of Transportation. It gives us an appropriate vehicle to proceed expeditiously, allows the department to get these projects delivered in a timely manner. The process in which we are doing and coming through with this resolution right now is, from my understanding from the Department of Transportation, is a timing issue, and they need to get the, this project done and completed in time and cannot wait for the TSPLOS 2.0 accounts to um, accrue funding. As you all know, TSPLOS 2.0 accounts uh, started accruing funding in the beginning of this month, so on Saturday. So it will take some time to accrue funding for uh, future projects, but it, it is on that list. This is uh, an approved uh, and appropriate mechanism for us to proceed for these projects to get done. Councilmember Norwood. Yes, my concern is that I went to the administration in June and asked that one project that had, that had bond funding and one project that had TSPAS funding be moved forward because of our, my own district having the second worst condition of streets in the entire city. I was assured by the administration that there was no way that I could move those projects forward, that we did not have the funding in TSPLOST and we had not issued the bonds. So it is surprising to me that we now have money that is available for a different part of the city um, that is looking at, as we get TSPLOST funds, we can, re if, if I heard correctly, that it is advanced funding. And when I was unable to get any advanced funding, um, oh, since June, um, this was a surprise to me when this appeared at the Transportation Committee where I was um, asking for help with a project that is from 2015 that I still have had trouble getting funding for. So um, I have a lot of concerns. Other discussion on the motion to refer? Hearing none, we'll move to a vote. Madam Deputy Clerk, please open the vote on the motion to refer 22-R-4417. The vote is open. The vote is closed. 13 yeas, zero nays. 13 yeas, zero nays. The motion to refer carries. I believe we had one paper pulled off of consent. 22-R-4417. 4252, a resolution by Council Member Dustin Hillis as substituted by City Utilities Committee requesting the mayor or his designee to evaluate and update the list of city arterial streets, city connector streets, and state route streets within the City of Atlanta Public Right-of-Way Manual to request the Atlanta Department of Transportation and the Department of Public, Public Works to coordinate these efforts, which include updating street names, updating limits of streets, and updating mileage of streets that may need to occur due to changes that have occurred since the last update to request this occur by December 31st, 2022, and to request the Department of Public Works to utilize the updated list in regards to right-of-way maintenance scheduling beginning January 2023 and for other purposes. Yes, I'm the one oh, that-, that Hold on, just a second, Councilman, Nor Councilman Faroki. So I defer to Councilman Norwood. She oh, pulled thank it off you. Consent. Councilman okay. Norwood. Um, as I have mentioned to several of y'all, uh, I'm working with the law department and the planning department to come up with a new classification of streets that will be commuter streets, that will be that are streets that have 10 times the amount of traffic of their neighboring streets and five times the degree of deterioration because of the tremendous amount of commuter tra traffic. Um, with this piece of legislation, I'm asking that it be referred back to committee and I will have an amendment um, at the next transportation committee to see if this body wishes to include that. It would be a way for us as the capital city of the state with more of an influx of commuter traffic than any other municipality by far in the state to be able to rebuild, not resurface, but rebuild streets that have been literally destroyed in every part of town where this tremendous amount of commuter traffic comes in. So to do the reclassification and leave this out, um, we won't have that opportunity to get this included, and I'd like for the Transportation Committee to have a moment to decide to include it. So it would be to refer back to committee. 
So Councilmember Norwood, you're making the motion to refer, correct? I am. There's a motion to refer by Councilmember Norwood. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Councilmember Faroki. We'll now move to discussion on the motion to refer. Councilmember Lewis. I will say that uh, Councilmember Dustin Hillis uh, did a lot of research on this paper. I think that uh, he did it right. Uh, I actually liked uh, the piece of paper that he brought to us. So uh, I don't think we should send this back to the committee. I think that uh, adding, when we do go back to the committee, I think it may slow down. This will really slow down the process. And uh, I think it will add stuff, add a hardship to the process that we didn't, that we didn't already know what was coming. I think I like the things that uh, Councilmember Hillis is requesting. And I think it'd be very, very, very difficult uh, to include this. Could, uh, let's go around and then I'll come back to you, Councilman Norway. Okay. Councilman Westmoreland. Sure. So I, I, a little concern here since the it was on consent and the sponsor's not here to speak to the paper being sent back. Um, I believe it, the paper itself speaks to the names and the ages and the lengths, but not the classifications of the papers and of the streets in the city. Um, so I guess that's point one is I don't think it asks for anything to be reclassified. And then two, is it not okay if that's what this paper does to pass it and then to do what you are suggesting? Because it sounds like that needs to happen too, but it's almost on a, in a different piece of legislation since it's seeking to do something different than what Councilmember Hillis's paper is seeking to do is my only concern. And I wish he was here, but he's not. Let me go to Councilmember Norwood before I get to you, Councilmember Wine. Councilmember Norwood, go ahead. Um, the, I, when I mentioned this to the commissioner earlier today, she asked that it be, um, that it be amended and that we amend it not just in, if, if in fact this body wants to do that at the next transportation committee and that we not try to do it on the floor. Um, because she that wanted a good definition, at, but she felt that it was important to have it included if we want to have this category. What this would do is to open up millions of dollars of, of impact fees for rebuilding streets that are now completely torn to shreds. And as I just spoke a few moments ago, I wasn't even able to get two streets that really need to be um, done right now. And I've been working for nine months looking for ways to do it. And this is something that looks like it really might work and help us. And two members of the Impact Fee Advisory Committee are very interested in this concept. And I have, I can never speak for people, but I believe I have their support to make a change to the impact fee study that the city did. Planning department is interested in it. Law department is looking at it. So I wanted to make sure that for this particular piece of legislation going forward to categorize all of our streets, that we don't lose an opportunity to have this one definition in the legislation. It's not to redo the legislation. It's not to say there needs to be something new done. But if we don't even, if we're talking about classifying streets and we don't even say that we have, quote, commuter streets with a definition anywhere in the legislation, it could be months before we could get that classification kind of on board. Two quick questions. One, did you have a chance to speak to Councilman Hillis? No, because he's gone, as you know. Okay. And this only came up this morning. And to the law department, and maybe to Councilmember Norwood, what she's asking to do, can, sh should it be done with a separate piece of legislation since it seeks to do something different than this piece of legislation? And if so, could that be introduced at the end of this meeting? And I'd be happy to sign on. Yes. We would, that, was, that would be our advice, that if she's going to do it, it is different from what's actually in this. And we do have some concerns about putting those two in there as well as what's being requested. So yes, to your, to your question. Can somebody, I don't know, it's your, it's your idea. Can we draft that and I'll sign on as a co-sponsor and we can introduce it at the end of the meeting? I am waiting for planning and law to give me the definition that they feel is best. So I'm working right now with the planning and law department. I think it would be improper for me to, to cobble something together in the next hour. Well, I don't disagree, but we could get the process started and that might speed up other people's participation. I, I hear that. I'll see what I can do. 
Council Member Juan. Thank you. So um, with that context, I'm going to make a substitute motion to approve. Um, and I'll tell you, I, I do think there is a difference with adding a brand new category. And if it's all predicated on the notion of potentially having impact fee funds, I'm all for it. But I do think that concept and that funding conversation needs to pa be packaged together. Um, and not impede the progress of this one. I think this one was really just to address the fact that our, our streets have not been reviewed since 1986. I think to get that process underway does not necessarily, I mean, that's gonna take some time and we had set for the end of the year for it to come back um, with another, that the other paper I think can move concurrently or separately. And I just think that let's, let's keep the two topics separate. Um, especially since one has a potential funding uh, implication of it that hasn't necessarily been confirmed yet, but I don't necessarily want to jump the gun and assume it is without really having that work done. So I make the motion, substitute motion to uh, approve, but then so completely support the, the, the approach of adding the category and then doing the, the quick analysis on the funding opportunities there is. So Council Member Juan, that actually is not an order. You can't, we have a motion to refer, a motion to adopt does not take precedence. So we either have to deal with the motion to refer. That's fine, I'll withdraw oh. and just, I'll say I, I don't support the motion because I'll be putting forward a motion, hopefully you. to adopt. Let, let me make it pretty simple. I will withdraw my motion to refer so we can move on the other that I think you've all made very thoughtful statements about. Okay, there is no, so, so just where we stand, technically there actually is no motion on this, so I would entertain a motion to adopt at this point. Councilmember Juan has made a motion to adopt 22-R-4252, um, thank you. Is there a second? Seconded by Councilmember Winston. Any discussion on the, mo any discussion on the motion to adopt? Hearing none, we'll move to vote. Madam Deputy Clerk, please open the vote on the motion to adopt 22-R-4252. The vote is open. Thank you. Will everyone please stand for the pledge allegiance? The vote is closed. 12 yeas, 0 nays. 12 yeas, 0 nays. The motion to adopt carries. Uh, Councilmember Faroki, any other business from transportation? That concludes the committee's report. Thank you. Uh, next, we'll move to the Finance Exec Committee. Uh, Chair One. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, colleagues, on page 42, we have one item. It's 22 01699, an ordinance by Councilmember Alex Wan authorizing a donation in an amount not to exceed blank to the Atlanta Public Schools APS in support of efforts to raise $50 million in celebration of the 150th anniversary for, of the district and for other purposes. This came out of committee with no recommendation on condition. The condition has not been made uh, met. Uh, that was to have a, a complete substitute for it. Um, I understand from the parliamentarian that with that, the um, automatic default action is that it goes back to committee, um, which is the desired in, uh, um, impact or effect. So with that, there's no action to take. It will go back into committee and we will address it uh, in the next FEC cycle. Um, and then with that, there is one announcement. Uh, the Finance Executive Committee will convene a work session on Thursday, October 13th at 1 p.m. in committee room one with the Fulton County's Assessor's Office to review the process for re residential and commercial property assessments. I invite everybody to please, with any interest in that to please attend. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next we'll move to Committee on Council, Chair Boone. Good afternoon. Please turn to your agenda for the report of the Standing Committee of, on Council. Council President, may I sound items one and two. These communications were found favorable in today's meeting. Without objection, please proceed. Item number 122-C-5144, a communication from Council Members Howard Shook, District 7, Mary Norwood, District 8, and Matt Westmoreland, Post 2 at large, appointing Mr. Michael Golden to serve as a member of the Atlanta Urban Design Commission in the lawyer category. This appointment is for a term of three years. Item number two, 
22-C-5151, a communication from Council Members Howard Shook, District 7, Mary Norwood, District 8, and Matt Westmoreland, Post 2 at large, appointing Mr. Earl Young to serve as a member of the Water and Sewer Appeals Board. This appointment is for a term of three years to begin retroactively on October 1st, 2021, and expire September 30th, 2024. These items were favorable. Motion to adopt. There's a motion to adopt coming out of committee. It doesn't need a second. These two items. Is there any discussion on the motion to adopt? Giving these communications, we can do this via unanimous consent. Any objection? Hearing none, Madam Deputy Clerk, please sign the count on unanimous consent on the motion to adopt. Unanimous consent is 13 yeas, zero nays. 13 yeas, zero nays. The motion to adopt carries. Item number four, 22-0-1700, an ordinance by Council Member Michael Julian Bond, Matt Westmoreland, Keisha Sean Waits, Andrea L. Boone, Jason Winston, Amir Faroki, Byron D. Amos, Jason Dozier, Liliana Batiera, Alex One, Howard Shook, Mary Norwood, Dustin Hillis, Marcy Overstreet and Antonio Lewis as substituted by committee on council adopted by virtue of the authority of the Municipal Home Rule Act of 1965, GAI 1965, P298E2SEQ, OCGA section 36, just 35, 31B as amended as required by further authority of OCGA section 36-35-41 so as to amend section 5-201 of the Charter of the City of Atlanta, Georgia GA1 1996 P4469 ET SEQ as amended by striking in its entirety Appendix 1 there two relating to the boundaries of council districts and inserting in lieu thereof a new Appendix 1 adopting the new official council districts map with related population summary report, a plan components report outlining vote tabulation and districts VIDS and the boundary descriptions of council, council districts one through 12 as required by city of Atlanta charter section 5-202 following the 2020 United States decennial census to repeal conflicting ordinances and for other purposes. This item was found favorable. This legislation is before us for its second read. Reading first adoption, motion to adopt. There's a, was the motion to adopt coming out of committee? Yes. Okay. There's a motion to adopt coming out of committee 22-0-1700. It doesn't need a second since it's favorable out of committee. Is there any discussion on the motion to adopt? Hearing none, we'll move to a vote. Madam Deputy Clerk, please open the vote on the motion to adopt 22-0-1700. The vote is open. Will everyone please vote? The vote is closed. 11 yeas, 2 nays. 11 yeas, two nays, the motion to adopt carries. Motion to refer to committee on council. There's a motion to refer to committee on council, 22-0-1700, correct? Correct. Uh, is there a second? Seconded by council member Juan. Any discussion on the motion to refer? We're being serenaded. Uh, hearing none, uh, Madam Deputy Clerk, please open the vote on the motion to refer, 22-0-1700. The vote is open. Will everyone please vote? <laughs> please reflect, Council Member Lewis is an aye. The vote is closed. 13 yeas, zero nays. 13 yeas, zero nays. The motion to refer carries. Today, the Atlanta City Council would like to wish the Honorable Byron D. Amos of District 3 a happy birthday. We will be celebrating. 
We will be celebrating his golden 50th birthday all month. Happy birthday to the Honorable Byron D. Amos. Thank you, Chair Boone. Uh, final committee today will be the Zoning Committee, Chair Overstreet. Thank you, President Shipman. So the Zoning Committee report today can be found on page 48. We'll start with ordinances for second read. I would like to take items one through five as a block. Without objection, please proceed. Item number one, 22-0-1383, case number Z-22-39. Location is 1158 Philadelphia Street Southwest. The ordinance is to rezone from R4 single family residential to R4 landmark building site, LBS. Single family residential landmark building site, number two. Legislative item number 22-0-1636, case number Z-22-48. The location is 1185 Ira Street, Southwest. The ordinance is to rezone from R4B, single family residential to C1, community business district. Number three, 22-0-1639, case number Z-22-51. The location is 1321, Audubon's Court Southwest. The ordinance is to rezone from PDH, PD, PD, I know. It's the pink puffs. From PDH, what about now? Okay, PDH to PD, um, H. Plan development housing to PDH, plan development housing for a change of conditions. Number four, 22-0-1640. Case number Z-22-52, location 1950, Sylvan Road, Southwest. The ordinance is to rezone from RG2, residential general sector two, to RG3, residential general sector three. Number five, 22-0-1730. Case number MRP-22. MRP 22-03. The location is 30, 2421 Paul Avenue, Northwest. The ordinance is, is to grant a certificate under provisions of the Metropolitan River Protection Act for a single family dwelling with two accessory st structures. Items one through five were favorable, so the motion is to adopt. There's a motion to adopt coming out of committee. It doesn't need a second. 22-0-1383, 1636, 1639, 1640, and 1730. Is there any discussion on the motion to adopt these five items? Hearing none, we'll move to a vote. Madam Deputy Clerk, please open the vote on the motion to adopt these five items. The vote is open. Will everyone please vote? The vote is closed. 12 yeas, zero nays. 12 yeas, zero nays. The motion to adopt carries. Thank you, Mr. President. I would like to take item 6 through 11 as a block. Without objection, please proceed. Okay, number six, legislative item number 22-0-1380, case number Z-22-28, location 220 Pearl Street, also known as 779 Fulton Terrace. The ordinance is to rezone from I-1BL, light industrial beltline overlay, to MRC-3CBL, mixed residential commercial conditional beltline overlay. Number seven, legislative item 22-0-1464, case number Z-22-53, location Cheshire Bridge Road, North, neighborhood commercial district. The ordinance is to amend the regulations to allow parking structures and lot 
lots within the district. Number 822-0-1465. Case number Z-22-54. The location is Cheshire Bridge Road South Neighborhood Commercial District. The ordinance is to amend the regulations to allow parking structures and lots within the district. Number 9, 22-0-1581, case number Z-22-42, location 241 and 253 Boulevard Northeast, 239 and 240 Hollowell, I mean Howell Street Northeast, 487, 491, 495, 499, 505, 509, 515, 519, 523, 533, 539, and 545 Highland Avenue, Northeast. The ordinance is to rezone from C2BL Commercial Service District Beltline Overlay and R5BL to Family Residential Beltline Overlay to MRC3CBL. Mixed Residential Commercial Commercial Conditional Beltline Overlay. Number 10. 22-0-1587. Case number U-22-14. The location 485, 489, 491, 495, 501, and 508 Foundry Street, Northwest, 174, 178, 182, 184, 190, and 192 Northside Drive, Northwest, 480, 486, 490, 496, 502, and 506 Spencer, Spencer Street, Northwest, 185 and 193 Electric Avenue Northwest. The ordinance is for a special use permit for an outdoor amusement enterprise. And number 11, 22-0-1644, case number Z-22-58. The location is 1101 Church Street Northwest. The ordinance is to rezone from R4A, single family residential, to R4BC, single family residential conditional. Items number 6 through 11 were favorable as amended, so the motion is to adopt as amended. There's a motion coming out of the committee to adopt 22-0-1380, 1464, 1465, 1581, 1587, 1644 as amended. Is there any dis it doesn't need a second. It's coming out of committee favorable as amended. Is there any discussion on the motion to adopt these items? Hearing none, we'll move to a vote. Madam Deputy Clerk, please open the vote on the motion to adopt these six items. The vote is open. Will everyone please vote? The vote is closed. 13 yeas, zero nays. 13 yeas, zero nays, the motion to adopt carries. There are no first reads for referrals, so that's the end of my report. Thank you, Chair Overstreet. Uh, that concludes the committee reports. We'll now move to personal papers uh, for immediate consideration. Uh, I know of two. Uh, we'll start with Councilmember Bakhtiari. Thank you, Council President. Um, this is a resolution uh, by myself and uh, Councilmember Faroki. Obviously, Councilmember Faroki is um, sick today, and I wanted to stress, though, that he uh, was in lockstep with me on this legislation. Um, this is Elms ID number 31122, a resolution by Councilmember Zaliana Bakhtiari and Amir Faroki condemning the Islamic Republic of Iran for its violent actions against women, repeated human rights violations against civilians and use of excessive force against protesters and for other purposes. Whereas on September 13, 2022, 22-year-old 22 Masa Amini was arrested by the morality police in, in Tehran, Iran for allegedly breaking rules related to how much hair a woman may expose in public. And Amini was allegedly beaten by officers in the police van after her arrest and died in the hospital on September 16, 2022. Fa Following Amini's death, protests broke out in dozens of Iranian cities, including Tehran, Rasht, Istahan, Kerman, Shiraz, and others. And the Iranian government and security forces have responded to protesters with violence. And on September 27, 2022, watchdog organization Iran Human Rights reported the protester death toll at over 75. The Iranian government has historically wielded violent force against protesters, fighting for issues of justice, human rights, and fair elections. And internet access in Iran has been heavily restricted and monitored since Amini's death. 
Since Amini's death, worldwide protests have been staged in solidarity with the Iranian women in cities across the world, including Atlanta. And since seizing control of the state following the 1979 Iranian revolution, the Islamic Republic of Iran has made wearing a hijab or headscarf compulsory for women. Since 1979, hundreds of women are arrested daily in Iran for allegedly violating hijab rules. And last week, Iranian President Ebrahim Raisi refused an interview with CNN journalist Christian Amanpour at the UN General Assembly in New York when Amanpour refused to wear a hijab. Iranian Foreign Minister Hossan Amira, Amir Dolahian downplayed the significance of a nationwide protest to Western dim diplomats at the UN General Assembly mm -hmm. and the actions and the words of prominent Iranian political figures, Raisi and and, nope, oh, nope, Raisi and Minister Hossein have made clear the Iranian government's stance against Iranians protesting for freedom, justice, and human rights. And the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights has called for an independent and impartial investigation of Masa Amini's death to ensure that her family have access to justice and truth. Now, therefore, be resolved by the Atlanta City Council of the City, <laughs> my bad. Now, therefore, be resolved by the City of the City Council of the City of Atlanta, Georgia, that the Atlanta City Council condemns all violent action taken by the Islamic Republic of Iran against women, protesters, and Iranian civilians. Be it further resolved that Masa Amini and all Iranian women deserve freedom, safety, and human rights and be it finally resolved that the Atlanta City Council stands in solidarity with the people of Iran, the freedom, of digni freedom and dignity of women everywhere, and supports local and global efforts towards advancing human rights for Iranian people. Second. Been a motion to adopt uh, Elms ID 31122 for immediately. There's a second by Councilmember Bond. Is there any discussion on the motion to adopt this resolution? Hearing none, we'll move to a vote. Madam Deputy Clerk, please open the vote on the motion to adopt. The vote is open. The vote is closed. 13 yeas, zero nays. 13 yeas, zero nays. The motion to adopt carries. Uh, one additional item, Councilmember Bond. No. For immediate, no. Okay. Uh, with that, then we'll move to uh, personal papers for referral. Of course, we'll start with the birthday gentleman, Councilmember Amos. Thanks, sir. Um, AMS number ID 30732, a resolution by Councilmember Byron Amos, a resolution authorizing the mayor or his designee to execute a cooperative agreement CP G 122392 for the radi radio isotope identification devices with Flare Detection Incorporated. On behalf of the mayor's Office of Emergency Preparedness, securing the City's program utilizing General Services Administration contract GS 07F 0486V for a term of two years in the amount not to exceed $345,480.00. All equipment shall be charged to and paid from the fund, department, organize, organization, and account number listed and for other purposes. ID 30732, we refer to the Finance Exec Committee. AMS number ID 31129, an ordinance by Council Member Byron D. Amos to amend provisions in Ordinance 21-0-0679, which amend Chapter 150, Traffic and Vehicles, Article 4, Stopping, Standing, and Parking, Division 5, Vine City Permit Parking of the City of Atlanta Code of Ordinance to update certain provisions related to property and street changes and for other purposes. Elms ID 31129, we refer to the Transportation Committee. AMS number ID 31127, a resolution by Council Member Byron D. Amos to request the Atlanta Department of Transportation replace and install neighborhood parking permit signs authorized person to ordinance 21-0-0679 for the Vine City Stadium area permit parking program to request the Atlanta Department of Transportation issue required parking permits to encourage Atlanta parking enforcement in the Vine City Stadium area and for other purposes. ID 31127 will be jointly referred to the Public Safety and the Transportation Committees. 
Ordinance Number 31130, an ordinance by Councilmember Byron D. Amos, to amend Part 16, Chapter 18H of the 1982 Zoning Ordinance of the City of Atlanta, to amend so as to create a new section, 16-18H.004, to create regulations for short-term rentals in the Home Park neighborhood and for other purposes. Elms ID 31130 will be jointly referred to the Zoning Committee and the ZRB. Last one, Mr. President, AMS number 31136, an ordinance by Councilmember Byron Amos imposing a moratorium on the acceptance of any application for special administration permit, administrative permit, or building permit for which a special administrative permit has not been applied for, including land disturbance permits for any property located in a R5 zoning district two family residential within the home park neighborhood for a period not to exceed six months and for other purposes Elmas id 31136 will be reserved, referred to the zoning committee yes, it was. thank you councilmember amos councilmember uh, westmoreland Elms number 31142, an ordinance by Councilman Rout Westmoreland authorizing a donation in an amount not to exceed $1,000 and zero cents from the post to at large carry forward account to the Reynolds Town Neighbor in Need program and for other purposes. Elms ID 31142 will be referred to the Finance Exec. Elms number 31143, an ordinance by Councilman Rout Westmoreland authorizing a donation in an amount not to exceed $10,000 to the Atlanta Out of the Darkness Community Walk and for other purposes. Elms ID 31143 will be referred to the Finance Exec Committee. Elms number 31144, an ordinance by Councilmember Matt Westmoreland authorizing a donation in amount not to exceed $10,000 to the Candler Park Neighborhood Organization and for other purposes. Elms ID 31144, we refer to the Finance Exec Committee. Thank you. Councilmember Waits. Okay, Elms number. 31123. This is a resolution by Council Member Keisha Sean Waits urging the Georgia General Assembly to enact legislation which prohibits the offense of commercial harassment in the state of Georgia to preserve public order through the protection of the residents and visitors to the state and for other purposes. Elms ID 31123 will be referred to the Public Safety Committee. Council Member uh, Bakhtiari. Uh, thank you, Council President. Um, Elms ID number 31124, uh, a resolution by Council Member Liliana Bakhtiari requesting the mayor his designee to make the intersection of the France Street Northeast and Hutchinson Street Northeast and always stop controlled intersection to request the Atlanta Department of Transportation to install stop signs at the intersection and for other purposes. Elms ID 31124, we refer to the Transportation Committee. Elms ID number 31126, a resolution by Councilmember Liliana Bakhtiari, a resolution requesting the mayor his designee to make the intersection of Woodbine Avenue Southeast and Montgomery Street Southeast and always stop controlled intersection to request the Atlanta Department of Transportation to install stop signs at the intersection and for other purposes. Elms ID 31126 will be referred to the Transportation Committee. Elms ID number 31125, a resolution by Councilmember Liliana Baxiari, a resolution requesting the mayor his designee to make the intersection of Wiley Street Southeast and Leslie Street Southeast and always stop controlled intersection to request the Atlanta Department of Transportation to install stop signs at the intersection for other purposes. Elms ID 31125 will be referred to the Transportation Committee. Elms ID number 31131, an ordinance by Councilmember Liliana Baxiari, an ordinance to extend the closing date under the purchase and sale agreement, under the purchase and sale, oh, well. <laughs> under the purchase and sale agreement between Heritage Capital Partners LLC and the City of Atlanta for certain property located in Land Lot 176, District 15. Oh, no, that should say District 5. <laughs> Atlanta, DeKalb County, Georgia, commonly known as 770 Shadow Ridge Drive, Atlanta, DeKalb County Tax Parcel ID 15176020763016 through March 31st, 2023, and in accordance with Section 2 1541 of the City of Atlanta Code of Ordinances and for other purposes. Elms ID 31131, we refer to the Finance Exec Committee. One second. Elms ID 
Elms ID number 31089, an ordinance by Councilmember Liliana Bactiari, an ordinance to waive Chapter 2, Article mm. Division 1, Section 2-910, grant applications of the City of Atlanta Code of Ordinances to ratify the City of Atlanta's grant applications with the Bureau of Governmental, oh, I'm sorry, with the Bureau of Justice at the U.S. Department of Justice for a BGA governmental unit grant to support the operating costs associated with the Center for Diversion and Services to authorize the Chief Financial Officer to accept the award of the grant funding and to amend the FY2023 budget in the amount of $2,980,000 to anticipate and appropriate grant funds from BGA, BJA to authorize the Mayor his designee to enter into any required agreements necessary for the implementation of this award and for other purposes. Elms ID 31089 uh, will be referred to the Finance Exec Committee. Thank you, Thank Mr. You. President. Council Member Wan. Uh, thank you, Council President. Two items, Elms ID 3105, an ordinance by Council Member Alex Wan, supplementing that certain ordinance 22-01561 adopted by the Atlanta City Council on August 1st, 2022, and approved by the Mayor on August 2nd, 2022 to, among other things, provide for, one, the sale of blank City of Atlanta various purpose general obligation bonds, series 2022B, the bonds, two, the naming of a bond registrar and paying agent for said bonds, three, the adoption of a form to which said bonds shall adhere, four, the preparation of a tax digest and the levy of a tax sufficient to pay the principal of and interest on, on said bonds, five, the execution and delivery of said bonds, six, the authorization and approval of the execution and delivery of a bond purchase agreement, seven, the ratification of the distribution of a preliminary official statement, eight, the approval, use, distribution, and execution of an official statement and a continuing disclosure agreement, and nine, uh, for other related purposes. Elms ID 31045 will be referred to the Finance Exec Committee. Elms ID 31047, ordinance by Councilmember Alex Wan, a sale ordinance providing for one, the issuance and sale by the City of Atlanta of its general obligation public improvement bond series 2022A, the series 2022A bonds, consisting of two subseries designated as A, City of Atlanta general obligation public improvement bonds series 2022-A-1 designated and B, City of Atlanta General Obligation Public Improvement Bonds, Series 2022A-2, non-designated. Two, the redemption of the Series 2022A bonds prior to maturity upon certain terms and conditions. Three, the execution and delivery of said Series 2022A bonds. Four, the adoption of the form of said Series 2022A bonds. Five, the levy of a continuing direct annual ad valorem tax without limit to pay the Series 2022A bonds and the interest thereon when due and payable. Six, the creation and maintenance of a project fund. Seven, designating a bond registrar, paying agent, and funds depository. Eight, the authorization and approval of the execution and delivery of a bond purchase agreement. Nine, the ratification of the distribution of a preliminary official statement. Ten, the approval, use, distribution, and execution of an official statement and continuing disclosure agreement. And eleven, for other related purposes. Elms ID 31047 will be referred to the Finance Exec Committee. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Councilmember Boone. Thank you, Mr. President. Elms number 31145, a resolution by Councilmember Andrea Boone to add the Atlanta City Council as an authorized user of the Cooperative Purchasing Agreement, COA 9270PL, for the purchase of office furniture for the Office of Communication Expansion on behalf of the Department of Enterprise Asset Management, utilizing State of Georgia statewide contract. 999-001 SPD 000100 to add funding for the Atlanta City Council in an amount not to exceed $8,000 and zero cents. All contracted work shall be charged to and paid from funding accounts listed herein and for other purposes. Elms ID 31145, we refer to the Finance Exec Committee. Elms number 31116, an ordinance by Councilmember Andrea Boone, an ordinance to waive Chapter 2, Article of the City of Atlanta Code of Ordinances, the Procurement and Real Estate Code, 
to authorize the mayor or his designee to execute an agreement with Fuse Core for the term of one year effective October 24th, 2022 and ending October 23rd, 2023 in an amount not to exceed $80,000 and zero cents for the placement of a sustainability fellow and executive fellow who will assist with the mayor's office of equity, diversion and inclusion, divisions of sustainability and resilience and of LGBTQ affairs for 12 month fellowships, all contracted services to be charged and paid from the accounts listed here and, and for other purposes. That was ID 31116 will be referred to the Finance Exec Committee. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Norwood. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Elms 31134, an ordinance by council members Mary Norwood, Antonio Lewis, Marcy Collier Overstreet, Liliana Battiari, Amir Faroki, Andrea Boone, and Alex Wan, authorizing the chief financial officer to create account numbers within the Oracle financial system for each council district in order to transfer their district discretionary local funds as authorized in the May 24th, 2022 referendum upon their immediate availability and for other purposes. Elms ID 31134, we refer to the Finance Exec Committee. A resolution, uh, Elms 31042, a resolution by Council Member Mary Norwood requesting the mayor or his designee to make the intersection of 28th Street Northwest and Angico Road Northwest an always stop controlled intersection to request the Atlanta Department of Transportation to install stop signs at the intersection and for other purposes. Elms ID 31042 will be referred to the Transportation Committee. Elms uh, 31043, a resolution by Council Member Mary Norwood requesting the mayor or his designee to make the intersection of Tuxedo Road Northwest and Powers Ferry Road Northwest an always stop controlled intersection to request the Atlanta Department of Transportation to install stop signs at the intersection and for other purposes. Elms ID 31043, we refer to the Transportation Committee. Elms 31150, an ordinance by Council Member Mary Norwood to amend Part 3, Land Development Code, Part 15, Land Subdivision Ordinance, Sections 15-07.003 and 15-07.004 0.004 to update the requirements for tree surveys for preliminary plat and final plat data and for other purposes. Elms ID 31150, we refer to the CDHS committee. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Winston. Thank you, Mr. First item, Elms 31059, an ordinance by Councilmember Jason Winston, an ordinance to rezone 1159 Morley Avenue Southeast in the Boulevard Heights neighborhood, neighborhood from R4BL single family residential Beltline overlay to R4BC BL single family residential conditional Beltline overlay to encourage compatibility of new construction with existing residential properties and for other purposes. Elms ID 31059, we jointly refer to zoning and ZRB. Elms 31128, an ordinance by Council Member Jason Winston to declare a, uh, to, to declare a surplus certain real estate located at Avondale Avenue Southeast and Lester Avenue Southeast, Atlanta, Georgia, having tax parcel ID identification numbers 14-0023-0007-0494, 14-0023-0007-0155, and 14-0023-0007-0148, 0023-0007-0130, and lastly, 14-0023-0007-0122, to authorize the chief procurement officer to advertise for sale bids for the sale of said property and for other purposes. Elms ID 31128, we refer to the Finance Exec Committee. Thank you. Council Member Faroki. Yeah, Elms number 31139, an ordinance by Council Member Amir Faroki to rezone multiple multiple properties as more particularly described in this ordinance 
along Ponce Leon Avenue and along North Avenue to add a zoning condition restricting drive through facilities and drive in facilities as allowed by use and for other purposes. Homes ID 31139 will be jointly referred to the zoning committee and the ZRB. Thank you. Councilmember Bond. Thank you, Mr. President. I have a resolution, Elms number 31149, a resolution by Michael J. Bond and Mayor Norwood to establish a Wellstar study group tasked with developing and making recommendations for the use of the location as a center for equity and for other purposes. Elms ID 31149 will be referred to the Community Development Committee. I have Elms number 31133, a resolution by Councilmember Michael J. Bond requesting the Department of Human Resources establish, it says Team Bond on here, but should be Team Atlanta in support of the 2022 Atlanta Kidney Walk and for other purposes. Elms ID 31133 will refer to the Finance Exec Committee. I've got Elms ID 31147, an ordinance by Michael J. Bond, an ordinance to have been section 13 of the ordinance number 22-0-1632 to remove the conditions providing that the intergovernmental agreement between the Fulton County Sheriff and the Fulton County of Georgia and the city of Atlanta authorized there, thereby shall not be effective until the city council shall be in receipt of a jail population overview report as described therein and for other purposes. Elms ID 31147 will be referred to the Public Safety Committee. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember uh, Lewis. Thank you. Sorry to cut you off guard there. Thank you, President. An ordinance by uh, e ELMS 31141, an ordinance by Councilmember Antonio Lewis, uh, co sponsored by Ke uh, Councilmember Keisha Waits, an ordinance to rename Brookline Park to Muskegee Park at Brookline Triangle and for other purposes. Elms ID 31141 will be referred to the CDHS committee. And Elms, Elms 31145, a resolution by Councilmember Antonio Lewis, assigned on by Ke uh, Councilmember Keisha Waits, a uh, Councilmember Matt Westmoreland, Councilmember Bakhtiari, Councilmember Jason Dozier, Councilmember Jason Winston, Councilmember Byron Amos, Councilmember Alex Wan. Councilmember Andrea Boone, Councilmember Marcy Overstreet, Councilmember Michael Julian Bond, Councilmember Alex Wan, and uh, let me make sure I said all the council members except Councilmember North Mary Norwood. Expressing support for 107, especially support for the 117th Congress House Resolution 1382 and Senate Resolution 790 which commemorate the Atlanta race massacre by honoring the victims and reaffirming that the commitment of the United States Congress to combat hatred, injustice, and white supremacy, and for other purposes. Elms ID 31145 will be referred to the Finance Exec Committee. And similar to that one, Council Member uh, Elms ID 31146, uh, a resolution by Council Member Antonio Lewis, co-sponsor Councilmember Byron Amos, co-sponsor Councilmember Jason Dozier, co-sponsor Councilmember Jason Winston, co-sponsor Councilmember Liliana Bakhtiari, co-sponsor Councilmember Keisha Waits, 
Co-sponsor, Councilmember Andrea Boone. Co-sponsor, Councilmember Matt Westmoreland. Co-sponsor, uh, Councilmember Michael Julian Bunn. Co-sponsor, Councilmember Alex Wan. <laughs> Co-sponsor, Councilmember Marcy Overstreet. Co-sponsor, Councilmember Alex... Uh, Everybody said the same one, same time, right? Urging the Georgia General Assembly to pass a resolution acknowledging the atrocities of the Atlanta Race Massacre of 1906 and to honor the victims and to reaffirm the state, reaffirm the state of Georgia's commitment to, the, to combat hatred, injustice, and white supremacy and for other purposes. Thank you. Elms ID 31146 will be referred to the Finance Exec Committee. Thank you. Councilmember Overstreet. Thank you, President Shipman. Let's start with this one. M's ID number 31137, an ordinance by Councilmember Marcy Collier Overstreet, an ordinance to waive section 16-18T.005 to allow retail establishments, eating and drinking establishments, or clinical use gap greater than 8,000 square feet in SPI 16, SA4, Greenbrier Special Public Interest District Sub Area A, Sub Area 4, to allow the construction of a mixed use development and for other purposes. Helms ID 31137 will be jointly referred to the Zoning Committee and the ZRB. Thank you. Helms ID number 31135. A resolution by Councilmember Marcy Collier Overstreet, a resolution urging the Georgia Ascend. Georgia General Assembly to protect communities by enacting legislation to regulate corporate ownership of private homes and reduce the proliferation of investor-owned housing in the city of Atlanta and for other purposes. Homes ID 31135 will be referred to the Finance Exec Committee. Okay, and this is Elms ID number 31118. And it is signed on by Council Member Marcy Collier Overstreet, Liliana Bakhtiari, Amir Faroki, Byron Amos, Andrea Boone, Antonio Lewis, Matt Westmoreland, Michael Bond, Jason Dozier, Keisha Waits, Jason Winston, and Alex Juan. An ordinance to ratify Mayor Andre Dickens's ex executive order imposing a moratorium on the acceptance of any new rezoning application, building permit applications, land disturbances, uh, permit applications, special use permit applications, special administrative permit applications, subdivision applications, replatting applications, or lot consolidation applications for parcels within the area designated herein and for other purposes. Elms ID 31118 will be referred to the Zoning Committee. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, finally, Councilmember Dozier. <laughs> I promise not to read slowly, y'all. Uh, my first item is Elms number 31138. An ordinance by Councilmember Jason Dozier express, <clears throat> expressing the city of Atlanta's intent to abandon the portion of Garnett Street Southwest located between Forsyth Street Southwest and the Garnett Street Martyr Station to allow for the improvement of right of way to be included in the development of adjacent city owned property at 184 Forsyth Street Southwest to improve the public, ac <clears throat> public access to the Garnett Martyr Station to, to increase the amount of affordable housing constructed at the transit oriented site and for other purposes. Elms ID 31138 will be referred to the Transportation Committee. All right, my next item is Elms number 31140, a resolution by council members Jason Dozier, Jason Winston, Byron D. Amos, I might get my order, Amir Faroki, I knew I missed, missed one, Alex Wine, Liliana Bakhtiari, Howard Shook, Mary Norwood, Andrea L. Boone, Marcy Collier Overstreet, Antonio Lewis, Michael Julian Bine, Matt Westmoreland, Keisha Sean Waits, and Dustin Hillis, I think I was missing one. Establishing a Justice 40 Oversight Commission 
to identify environmentally disadvantaged and under-resourced communities in the city of Atlanta to ensure that such communities benefit from opportunities and resources available through the Biden administration's Justice 40 initiative and for other purposes. Elms ID 31140, um, we refer to the CDHS committee. Any other items, colleagues? All right, we'll move with general remarks. Uh, Council Member Juan. Thank you, Council President. Um, and I'm going to take the liberty on behalf of Council Members Waits, Bakhtiari, and Westmoreland and I. Uh, as you can tell from uh, the festivities that have begun in the atrium uh, already, uh, this is Pride Week here in Atlanta. I want to invite everybody to come celebrate with us um, all, yeah, all week long uh, and this weekend. Also want to thank uh, APD and the fire for uh, keeping us all safe this weekend with all of the hundreds of thousands of folks that will be among us. Um, but here's to a happy uh, and safe Pride weekend. Um, party on. Thank you, Councilmember Bond. Just wanted to announce this week's HelloFresh uh, distribution on Wednesday. We'll be down at the Jose Helps headquarters down on uh, uh, down in District 12 on, on, on Forest Hills Drive. Uh, we'll begin at 2 p.m. Uh, sharp. And of course, there's no prerequisite to receive this benefit. If if you don't need it, please uh, refer someone else uh, to it. There's no uh, requirement to receive uh, this benefit. Again, we'll be down at the Jose Helps headquarters down at, on Forest, Forest Hills Drive, starting at 2 p.m. Thank you. Councilmember Lewis. Thank you, Councilmember Bond, for uh, coming to District 12 again on a Wednesday. We, we always appreciate that. I also want to say thank you to uh, Lincoln University Atlanta Alumni Association for uh, taking care of these students from the city of Atlanta. Uh, to send students 700 miles away and still have a connection with them is an amazing thing, uh, similar to uh, our, our former uh, statesman, Jesse Hill Jr., who sent me to Lincoln University and made sure he stayed connected the entire time. So I want to say congratulations to those students. I also want to say congratulations to the band who received a $2,500 check uh, from the Atlanta Alumni Association from the golf tournament. Uh, thank you, uh, President, for giving me this time to speak. Oh, also, shout out Morris Brown. Homecoming this week for Morris Brown. Uh, shout out to the folks over there on the hard reset on your first homecoming back. Councilmember Bakhtiari. Uh, thank you, Council President. Um, real quick, I wanted to uh, thank Council for voting through um, our Council Member Faroki and I's paper for immediate consideration. I wanted to say that please follow us on social media. There is another march coming. We had a march for the past two weekends in Atlanta. This is really important to us because there are so many members of the Iranian community that live in each of our districts. And by standing up and saying something, we're continuing to put our families at risk back in Iran. And so the more support we have to share these stories, the more support you, the more support you'll offer the people in the community that are actually standing up against these atrocities, and it's only building there. This movement's unlike anything I've ever seen. So please, 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 show up to the march if you can, and if not, uh, please share the stories of Iranian members on your social media as much as you can. The more attention, the better. So I just wanted to make that ask. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Dozier. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, it's that time of the quarter again. Uh, District 4 will be hosting our next quarterly town hall meeting <laughs> on Thursday, uh, October the 6th at 6 o'clock p.m. at the Wren's Nest in historic West End. As a reminder, we always do a different topic of discussion at our town hall meetings. And with our town hall being at the Wren's Nest, we'll be uh, having a presentation by the Atlanta Preservation Center to talk about historic preservation. So I hope to see our District 4 community members there. As always, it is MARTA accessible. Uh, the Route 71 comes every 15 minutes, and we will be feeding you because we don't want to Make, we want to make sure we have no barriers to, to entry. And it will be hybrid. So if you don't want to come in person, we'll still take your questions. Thank you. Councilmember Amos. Yes, Council President. Just want to say thank you to all my colleagues and to the staff in the building, and especially to my staff, for helping me kick off this 50th national um, holiday of my birth. 
Um, my birthday is actually this coming Sunday, October the 9th. So stay tuned to any planned shenanigans that may be going on. And believe me, all monetary gifts will go straight to Ole Miss for tuition for my son. So help me out. <laughs> Thank you, Councilman Amos. Any other comments? I would make uh, three brief ones. One, the pink microphones, if you noticed, are uh, in commemoration of Breast Cancer Awareness Month. So uh, we are reminding all of those uh, who uh, suffer from that uh, disease that we stay in solidarity with them. Two, uh, the Braves magic number's down to one. So here is hoping tonight uh, that either the Braves win and or the Mets lose for another division championship. And finally, the Mayor's 5K is on Saturday, fifth runway. You get out and you get to run on one of the fastest, flattest tracks in Atlanta on Saturday morning. I will see you all there. For anyone who's not in shape enough to make the run, Council President Shipman has offered to drag you behind him in a wagon. Yes, that's right. So you can please sign up for that. That will be good fun. Uh, and with that, I will ask the Deputy Clerk to please call the closing rule. Adjourning roll call. Council President Shipman. Present. Council Members Bond. Here. Westmoreland. Waits. Winston. Here. Parochi. Amos. Here. Dozier. Present. Bakhtiari, Juan, Shook, Norwood, Hillis, Boone, Overstreet, and Lewis. Without objection, we will move to adjournment. Any objection? This body stands adjourned.